Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Missing 411 Stories. As a disclaimer, all of these stories have already been read on this channel. What I am doing in this video is taking those three videos and making a compilation of every missing 411 story that we have ever read, so they are all in one place for your listening pleasure. I hope you enjoy it. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true missing 411 stories. So, I've been doing research on missing 411 related cases in my home state of Minnesota, specifically in northern Minnesota. I found a bit of a cluster near the Chippewa National Forest. That's a whole different post that's coming though. And while researching that cluster, I came across this case. Details are listed in the links at the bottom of the post. The case of Peter Archman is very interesting to me. It wasn't near any national forests or parks. Though, there are plots of Minnesota state land all over the area that Peter went missing. The things that really stand out to me on this case are the details that match the 411 profile. He was elderly, slash unlikely to be able to travel long distances on foot. He disappeared near water, and dogs were unable to find a scent. The whole story is just strange to me, especially with no signs of foul play, no history of mental illness and also the fact that the National Guard got involved with the search. I know a lot of people are assuming there was a medical emergency, but the facts just don't make any sense. Has anyone else looked into this case? What are your thoughts? I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It has come to my attention that the news story isn't accessible to a lot of people, so here's the information from the article in the form of quotes. It's strange. Case County Sheriff Tom Birch said, as his department has followed many leads over the years, but still haven't found any trace of Archman or his belongings. This case remains open, and we're trying to figure out what happened to him. We want to bring comfort to the family and give them closure and answers on what happened to them. The day Peter went missing was like any other day on the farm. It was around lunchtime, July 24th, 2009, when Peter got into his vehicle to head to Staples. He was going to pick up some milk and bananas and his wife's medication and drop off a check at the caterers for his granddaughter Simone's wedding, which was scheduled for the next day. Peter's abandoned vehicle, described as a light blue 1995 Chevrolet Caprice wagon, was located in a mud hole off Case County Road 32, as though it was stuck at the end of a minimum maintenance road the next morning. The groceries and medication Peter purchased were still in the vehicle. However, there were no signs of Peter, his walking cane, or his keys. Peter also had very little money on him, only about $30 in his wallet, along with his driver's license and his green card, which all are missing. These items were never found, even after extensive searches for over a month, which included up to 50 cadaver dogs, the Minnesota National Guard, and other agencies assisting the Case County Sheriff's Office in the search. The rest of this article is mostly just personal background information about how Peter met his wife and things that aren't really relevant to the case. There are also many quotes from the family talking about how they still don't understand any of the circumstances, even 12 years later. I was reading the article about the missing hunter being found after 53 years to my friend, and he told me that his father went hunting in the late 60s with a fellow hunter, but when they got back to return home, one of their party was missing. His body was found years and possibly decades later. He can't remember. When the body was found, it looks like he sat down among some rocks with his rifle and just died. My friend thinks this case was in the late 60s or early 70s. 
possibly missing 411 relatable due to it being a hunter. Large open area, found among boulders, possibly near a national park in Utah, etc. Is there a searchable database for 411? A three-year-old boy and his puppy disappeared nearly 40 years ago in Sugarbush Township, Minnesota. Only the dog would return. Terry left his younger brother Kevin alone to play with his toys for less than 30 minutes while he went to make his bed. Terry would go to look for his brother a short time later, and Kevin nor the puppy were anywhere to be found. Kevin had wandered out of the house before, but hadn't made it much further than the bridge about a mile away. The town began to search with the police for him, but couldn't find any clues of where he might have gone. Officers went as far as following leads from psychics and using a plane to fly over the area with a thermoscan device to measure differentials and temperatures. But still, nothing was found. What do you think happened? It blows my mind how a little guy could get so far away without a trace. Last winter, I was visiting with my wife's family in the Adronax and went out to the area where Tom Messick went missing. We parked on the side of the road and hiked down to the pond at the end of the trail, trying to identify the specific rocks where they were seated on during their hunt. I'm a former special operation officer and a paratrooper, so Tom's case really piqued my interest as I had some free time during the holidays. I've read some analysis on this subreddit and wanted to give some environmental factors observations, and my belief of what happened. The first thing to note is that there was no gunshot heard during the time of his disappearance. It was actually incredibly quiet based on reports. Secondly, given the amount of dead leaves on the ground for the majority of the year, I figured that there would be at least some noise. Secondly, given search efforts that covered a very wide area, I assumed that there were few places he could disappear, with the exception of the pond at the end of the trail. To get to the pond, he would have had to walk by some folks that he was out with. As I went out, there were two things that I believe are of use. One, there is a running stream, and it's fairly loud. It runs almost parallel to the walking slash driving trail that they were close to. The stream is on the same side of the trail as the deer drive, and it's certainly loud enough to drown out leaves crunching at 100 yards. Two, there's a medium-sized marsh about 100 meters by 50 meters, along the path to get to their position. If one were to go across the trail and walk a straight line from their position, or follow the trail back, it's easy to fall into. I truly believe that he is in that marsh. I think he wandered off or became disoriented, and after going back to pee or stretch his legs, he got lost in the woods. As he walked away, he fell in, he couldn't get out, and sank. My less favorite theory is that he was killed or died naturally and was removed from the area, which could be a reason that the others who were with him stayed so long. On January 22, 2022, Thomas Tommy Howe, a 24-year-old from Antioch, Illinois, crashed his car into a highway guardrail, then swerved back into traffic and hit a car. The two pulled over into the median, and then he fled the scene, running into the woods. 
This occurred in Libertyville, a wealthy Chicago suburb. Luckily, it doesn't seem like the other driver was hurt. Howe was on his way to lunch with his parents after seeking counseling for his mental health earlier that day. His parents reported to media that he'd been struggling with his mental health due to working from home during COVID-19. He lived with his friend in a downtown Chicago apartment, and he'd recently extended his stay with his parents due to his mental health. Despite all this, his family stressed his productivity. Tommy is an incredibly smart, kind, and hardworking young man, a college graduate, a working, contributing member of society. Before running into the woods, he left his personal cell phone in his vehicle, which his parents later tracked to the lot where the car had been towed, as it was totaled. The only evidence investigators ever found in the coming days was his work cell phone, located in the middle of the woods in Metawa, another wealthy Chicago suburb in proximity of the Libertyville crash site. Just days ago, on Friday, February 11th, his family announced a $10,000 reward for information related to his disappearance. This is the same day a kayaker spotted a house North Face Jacket shoreside on the Des Plaines River near Libertyville and called the police. Due to river conditions, police could not retrieve Howe's body until today, Tuesday, February 15th. Police have not explained why he swerved his car into the median, nor why he then swerved back into traffic and hit someone's car. Upon finding his body in the De Plains River, police have ruled out foul play. I'm from the area, so I've been following this missing persons case closely for the past three weeks. Wishing peace for the family. Corona's been a hell of a time for many folks. It's nothing to be ashamed of, whether you're conventionally contributing to society or not. Please keep well, everyone. Weird folk tales from my grandparents. I'm from Southeast Asia, a small island. Up until recently, the 1990s, it was undeveloped, and people more or less lived near the water with rare communities inland. My grandparents on my dad's side had all these superstitions and stories that I got to experience as I'd stay there in summer months as a kid. And I'm glad to remember some of them. I know it's not much, but I'd like to share. Never pee on mushrooms, even by accident. Other beings live there. In a circle of mushrooms, you should never talk negative or act negative around at all. Always be home before the plants and trees could no longer cast shadows. If it's that time, but your shadow and only yours is cast on the ground, you need to leave the area right away. If you're in a forest at night, for whatever reason, it's better to leave the light off than to turn it on and have other things see you. Never play around cemeteries or places where people have died. Never step on plants around there either. Never have trees too close to your house, at least 20 feet away. Not because of it falling during a storm, but because the things that inhabit the trees would harass you and into your home. If your name is being called and the voice isn't something slash someone you recognize, then run away and don't answer or look towards the source. Happened to my grandma while she was walking home from the field. Had to go up a mountain to get there. She was walking back down to her home near the sea. Always have clear markings between your property and the forest. Had to help my grandma cut jungle growth every now and then. Also had a fence around the property. If for whatever reason you're walking in the forest and everything goes quiet all of a sudden, you had to repeat, I'm allowed to walk here, out loud five times. Always walk on paths made by people, not by other things. My grandparents never explained who the other things were. Apparently, they used to share the island with another group of people, but they died out a long time ago. My grandparents say this was the oldest story they had. They had dark skin, darker than ours, thick hair, and were short of height. My grandparents never described them as evil or having bad intentions. Instead, they were just annoying. A long time ago, they'd steal food, take your chickens, take your plants, etc. They were really good at hiding in the forest, and were good at fishing. Actually, if anything outside ever went missing, I'd often hear people say, oh, they did it. 
referring to them. I was never allowed to go deep in the forest as my grandparents believed they still existed in some pockets on the island, although they kept to themselves now. I'm mostly posting this to see if anyone else has these tales too. As we become more advanced and cities get bigger, a lot of these old tales, some of them probably even older than we think, are being lost in the face of modernness. A way of living that was practiced for thousands of years is slowly being forgotten. As far as I know, the island now has stable electricity, and the internet was starting to be common around five to eight years ago. It's a tourist hotspot now, and properties are developing everywhere. However, the geography makes it so that you can really only build near the water, as the terrain is too steep or hilly in other places. I'm a 17-year-old female who recently found out about this subreddit. I'm not new to Reddit or anything paranormal slash cryptic. I mostly joined because I grew up watching ghost adventures and fact or fiction paranormal files. All total BS, but it goes to show that I've always been aware and interested in this stuff. But after reading others' experiences, I figured I should share some of my own in hopes of getting any advice or answers as to what could be messing with me. I live in Florida, and I've always been aware of many Native American cultures, even though I'm not of that heritage myself. I'm not sure if this is pertinent, but anyways. I timelined and tried to write down everything that I remembered about these experiences to give me a guide when writing this. It started from when I was very young, and the first instance of this happening was when I was living with my grandmother. Her and I were very close. This will play in later. I was wide awake in bed unable to sleep with her to my right. There's no doubt in my mind that she was deeply asleep only a few inches away from me. Every television in the house was off, and the only other person in the house was my grandfather asleep in his room. Then, very clearly and loudly, I hear my grandma call me from the kitchen, almost how you'd be called to dinner. I know it's common to hear your name being called mistakenly, but I did more research on this as a teen, and apparently when you hear your name being called this loud, you're supposed to reject it. I did not. Not knowing this, I just huddled closer to my grandmother and kept my eyes locked on the open door. The second instance was around 13 or 14 when my father took me on a family trip to Las Vegas. We visited some part of the Grand Canyon, and while my family was waiting in line for a skywalk bridge that we had paid for, I wandered around the edge a good distance away from my family and decided to yell my name into the canyon to hear my echo. When it came back to me, it sounded distorted, and almost like my grandmother had yelled my name back. It might not have been my grandmother exactly, but very similar. Nevertheless, just the fact that it was distorted was enough to scare me a little. I don't put much weight into this experience because it might have just been my voice being thrown around the canyon weird. The next one happened when I was 13 or 14 as well. It's the most terrifying one that I've had, and every time I tell this story to people, I start to cry and tear up. This is the closest I've ever been to whatever this is, and proves my point that it's mimicking people that I care about. I was on vacation with my family in Key West and had rented a home. I invited my best friend, who we will call Ash, to stay with us. On the third day, we had decided to skip out on the boating trip and mooch off the house owner's Netflix all day. On about the fifth episode of what we were watching, we decided on a snack refill and a bathroom break. We pause the television and I make my way to the kitchen. I believe that Ash had followed me to the kitchen and leaned on the island while I prepared some chips with my back turned to her. I held a full conversation with whatever that thing was and even looked back at her on her phone. I fully had no doubt in my mind that I was talking and looking at Ash on her phone. She even held it in this specific way that Ash does. I turn my back for a split second to pick up the bowls and suggest we head back to the couch. When I see Ash walk out of the bathroom, which was a solid 30 feet away, my body immediately went cold, and the first thing I asked her was how she got to the bathroom and in and out without me hearing. She then gave me the weirdest look, 
and told me she's been in there the whole time since we got up. This is where I start freaking out and insisting that I had just been talking with her and even physically saw her. She joked about doppelgangers and how maybe she was going to die. I quickly suggested we get out of the house and walk around the neighborhood. She then informed me she had gotten her period while she was in the bathroom, the same time that I was talking to whatever I was talking to. We walked around until my mom called me that she was back in the house. We're still best friends to this day and have been for 11 years. And I asked her about it today before I wrote this. She said she didn't hear me talking with anyone at all. Now, at this point, you guys might think I'm crazy. But for this next one, I have a witness. I felt a little less crazy after it happened with people who freaked out just as much as me. Again, I was on vacation near the Great Smoky Mountains, but just a little west in Sevierville, Tennessee. We had our previous reservations canceled, so we took this little rundown cabin owned by a local woman. Now, we got there late at night, and the moment we all stepped out of the car, the first thing we heard was a man's voice saying, Hey, neighbors, coming from a cabin to the left of ours, that was higher up on the mountain that we were on. We couldn't see the cabin, really, just a road that led further up, so we assumed that he could see us, but we couldn't see him. Probably just some guy on his balcony. My friendly stepdad yelled a hey, and we waved up towards the direction that it came from. Wouldn't have been weird if this didn't happen every time we stepped out of the cabin or car. My family completely wrote it off as some type of hospitality that we're not used to in Miami. Retelling it, my brother and my friends agreed that it was weird. I did hear constant footsteps around the cabin at night, and some outside my window. It was a little raised cabin, probably a story or two off the ground but I didn't give it much thought since wildlife is a thing in the woods. Just something that I thought I should mention, maybe. The thing that really propelled me into researching what the heck was happening was when I was having a photo shoot in the woods behind the cabin and both my brother, sister, and I heard something calling my name deeper into the woods. Since I was with my younger siblings, I went into full big sister protection mode and almost threw them back down the little slope that we had to climb to get to the woods. We were all scared to death from how clear it was, and how we all pinpointed that it was coming from deeper into the woods, and nowhere near the cabin. This was during the day, and we were all so thrown by this that we stayed in for the rest of our trip. We all agreed it was a woman's voice, and the first thing I asked my mom when we got inside was, Did you call me? She had been lounging in a room with my stepdad all day, trusting that I could take care of the younger ones just outside the cabin. She saw how freaked out the kids were, and we didn't really go out that night or for the rest of our trip. I think I reacted this badly to this one mostly because I had kids to take care of, and I can tell that they were terrified out there. Again, the voice sounded like somebody was calling for me, or calling me back somewhere. With no knowledge of what this could be, I had finally decided to look into things when I turned 17. I had no previous knowledge of wendigos or skinwalkers or anything cryptic. Only crappy ghost investigations and Zach Baggins making something out of a scratchy EVP. I'm desperate for answers, because at this point, I'm constantly thinking about it and driving myself into rabbit holes of information and myths and legends. If you read this far, thank you so much. I know my writing and recounting may not be that great, but I was just trying to get everything and all the details in a cohesive place. Please let me know what you think this is. And please, feel free to ask for more information on something, if you think that it would aid in you helping me out. Much love to anybody who can help. Ray Missing Girl in Catskills Mountain, and her story after she was found. Catskill Mountains, New York. There was a family gathering at a relative's home in the woods of the Catskills. The adults were mainly inside, while the children were playing outdoors. While the others did whatever they were doing, Jill, a little girl of five, became fascinated with the butterflies, and no one noticed her chasing after them into the woods. 
Ultimately, the adults checked back in to find that she was lost. Many people searched many hours in vain, and dusk was coming, bringing a great deal of despair with it. Then, suddenly, a besmudged Jill came running happily out of the woods unharmed. What had happened? Once Jill had followed the butterflies for a while, she lost them and realized that she was lost herself. She tried to find her way back to her aunt's house, but only got deeper into the forest. She thought she heard someone calling for her, but it was too far away, and she couldn't get a direction on it. Finally, she came into a small clearing. Feeling very tired, she took a candy bar from her pocket, sat on an old dead tree, and ate a little. She felt lonely and started to cry. She looked up and saw standing at the edge of her clearing two small living dolls with silvery hair to their shoulders. They were dressed in shiny green clothes and had caps. She offered them some of her candy bar, but they didn't respond. Beginning to cry, then she asked them if they knew the way to her aunt's house. They nodded and motioned for her to follow. As dusk came on and the forest darkened, the little dolls became accompanied by small balls of blinking colored light, which illuminated the way. They all seemed to be going faster and faster as they went, and Jill was surprised at how fast she was moving. The dolls then abruptly stopped and pointed to the aunt's house. Jill happily turned to thank them, but they were gone, and she ran back to her parents. My dad isn't technically missing anymore. I'm just trying what I can to find any advice or leads. And this community has members that could possibly know of resources that I don't. I don't even know what park he was in, but maybe someone here could help me narrow it down. Not knowing is hard. My father died in or around Bear Creek, Arkansas in March of 1994. I have his final letter that was written to me a few days before his death, where he describes his campsite near a 60 foot drop and a strange man who approached him a few times. When I was a child, my mother told me that he unalived himself. His family disagrees and thinks foul play was involved. Unfortunately, my father was intensely private and not close with really anyone. Most who knew him are either unknown to me or dead. The only information, which I'm not even sure if it's true, that creates a common thread from what I have heard are a few details that seem to be agreed upon. He fell from a 60-foot drop while in his wheelchair. He was a paraplegic. He climbed back up, of course, using only his hands. He bled out in his tent, and his remains weren't found for about two months. If anyone thinks they can help me find any information on this event, I would be eternally grateful. I've tried many hours of internet sleuthing, but I've never even found an article relating to any bodies found in that area in that time frame. My hope is someone out there knows of information resources that I don't. Or heck, maybe someone will respond who lives or has lived in the area and has some old newspapers or something. I don't know what to expect, really. All I know is the older I get, the more it bothers me that I don't know what happened to him. I've even tried calling police localities in that tri-county area, hoping to find officers that were active at that time that would talk to me. I've had no luck. I'm just hoping for someone smarter and more resourceful than me, who can even find a lead or advice on how to proceed. I know there are some rules against full names. I'll post his known names. I'm not sure what his legal name was at the time of his death. His name was changed a few times in his life. I do know the name that he's been buried under, though. His headstone name was engraved by his adopted mother, though. And I'm not really sure if it was his legal name at the time. If I can't post it, I'd gladly PM this info to someone who thinks they can figure something out. Edit. I wanted to include the name that I think he was going by. William Luther McCord. Thanks for those who read through. The more people I reach, the better chance I have at possibly finding more information.
my uncle, an experienced outdoorsman, went missing and was found under strange circumstances. I'm looking for answers. Hey, all. I found this subreddit and kind of just trying to reach out and test my luck. Missing person. James McGrogan. My uncle was a missing 411 case back in 2014, and nothing makes sense about it. He was an experienced outdoorsman, camped by himself in the Alaskan wilderness, but was found dead a month after he went missing, near Vail, Colorado. Authorities ruled it an accident, said he fell to his death. It came as a shock to my family, and we all haven't been the same since. And I've been finding out stuff that I was never told. He was found wearing no cloak, gloves, or boots, but still had his helmet. He was found 14 miles away from the original trail, and would have had to have make the hike in deep snow. His original search party looked in the area and didn't find him. Once he was found, they said they had looked in that area already. My uncle was no idiot. He had with him all the necessary supplies and rescue gear. So what I'm really getting to is I want some answers. Even if it's just what do you think? This has really messed my family up, and it would be nice to have some peace. Around 10 years ago, I had gone on a short hike in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, around the base of Mount Glastonbury. It was just a short day hike that I planned to find an old railroad bed and check out the remains of the old ghost town there from the 19th century. I had gone before with a group of people, and it was a beautiful hike with water, and culminates with a great view of the area from an old fire tower. Thankfully, I was not completely alone and had brought my dog, B.B., a three-year-old Rottweiler. She was good company for a trip like this, and I was glad to have her along. I parked on an old logging road and found the path to the trail that would take me to the abandoned railroad bed that is now buried deep in the woods. It was a mile or two in, and almost to the railroad bed, when I heard something. It was whistling, the kind someone would use to call a dog. Instantly, B.B. looked up and tried to bolt to the right of the trail where the sound was coming from. Luckily, I had a good hold on her leash and stopped her from running off. She barked in the direction of the whistling, but I got her to set and the whistling stopped. I had a strange feeling. Even though I could not see who was whistling, it felt like it was directed towards BB, and someone had tried to separate me from her. I was not sure what to do, but after a minute or two of no more sounds, I dismissed it as a coincidence and continued on our walk. Not ten steps later, I heard a woman's voice from the other side of the trail. Hello? Come here. We're just off the trail. Then I heard what sounded like a playful laughter of another woman. The tone of the calls was playful, almost seductive. Hello? Come down here. What's your name? I was curious, and even a little intrigued to check it out. The voice was very pleasant, but after a split second I stopped myself from moving. Looking to the left where the voices were coming from, I could almost see a path through the woods, down the ridge, a perfectly straight line. There was no noise, not even the rustling of leaves or chirping of birds. I started to feel lightheaded and confused. BB barked again and I snapped out of it. A feeling of complete dread then overtook me. I reached into my pocket and pulled the Ruger LC9 I had in a pocket holster out and held the pistol to my side and clicked the safety off. As soon as I did that, I began to hear things again. Leaves rustling, sounds of birds tweeting. Looking to the left again, the path that had just been there was gone. After that, I decided to end my hike and we booked it back to the car without incident. The strangest thing was yet to come. When I got back to my car and drove off the mountain and had cell phone service again, my phone had been blown up with missed messages from my girlfriend and brother asking me where I was and why I was not back yet. I checked the time on my phone, and it was 4 p.m. I had started my hike around 8 a.m. I had been gone for eight hours, and could only account for a couple of hours of the time. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened. 
I don't hike anymore either. And I took up golf. There's an area of Quebec that my mom won't go near. Now, we don't go into Canada that often, but we used to have an aunt who lived in Quebec, and she owned a cottage on a small, remote lake. My summers were spent at this college, and a lot of my family would also come up to visit. Behind this cottage was a huge forest that spanned for miles and miles. We used to go on hikes and remark about how untouched it was. You could easily get lost and never come out. One day, my mom, my aunt, two uncles, and myself, age 13, were out on a hike heading towards a raspberry patch that we knew of when we heard a scream like nothing you had ever heard before. It was a human scream from a female, but it was so loud that we all dropped to the ground as if someone was shooting bullets. I don't know why this was the reaction we had, but down we went. All of us stood up, stunned, and looked around. For about two to three minutes, we looked in every direction, assuming it was something near us. The scream was like it was on top of us and all around us at the same time. If you had told me a jet fighter had passed over us 30 feet up, I would have believed you. I remember my mom suggesting we go back. This sound clearly wasn't from any animal, nor was it from a machine. It was human, very human. My uncle suggested we keep going and everyone else kept going in further. By now, two to three minutes had passed, and we were all on edge, but we assumed it had to be something totally explainable. Then it happened, and as God is my witness, I'll never forget what I saw. The screen came back, but this time it was accompanied by something. My aunt saw it first and pointed to it. Then we all saw it. About 50 feet away from us, and probably 30 feet up in the air, was a person gliding through the forest. It looked like someone sitting cross-legged, all in black, with long black hair. We didn't see where they started, but we could see them slash it moving through the treetops, just under the canopy, at what had to be 10 to 15 miles per hour. We watched as it went past, deeper and deeper into the forest. We could see about a football field's length away, and just stood there frozen until they were out of sight. Then we ran. We ran until we were back at the cottage. My mom never went into that forest again. My uncle went out with his rifle the following day but came back empty-handed. The cottage was sold years later, once my aunt had passed away, and nothing was ever seen again. It was not a bird. It was not some pet monkey that escaped. It was a person, 100% a person, and whatever it was just flew through the forest as if it could fly on its own. My aunt went to her grave believing that it was a witch, and if you had told me for certain that that would really answer a lot of things. To give you an idea of how it looked, think the girl from the ring, only in all black. I'll go to my grave wondering what I saw. I hope one day I get an answer. Edit. Since everyone is being so nice to me about this and taking it seriously, and not telling me that I'm full of crap and whatnot, because I'm not, I know what I saw. I'd like to add in some more context to this in the event that someone has experienced anything similar. The lake this cottage was on was sunken into its surroundings. It's almost like you were surrounded by mountains, but those mountains were actually just the main level, and it was the lake that was deeper into the earth. This meant that we went back into the forest. We were almost always walking uphill, a very gradual slope, mind you, but a hill nonetheless. We used to see a lot of weird things in the woods, as you do in any woods, but these were things I've not really seen in any other woods before. Giant boulders the size of a small school bus that had clearly been moved in recent years. Areas with several healthy trees just broken in half, not from being cut, but like they were snapped. And a significant amount of berries, so many berries you could run a grocery store. I've never come across fields and berries like this since that time. We used to joke that there were Sasquatch in the forest. Many years ago, I saw a video of what appeared to be a witch, and quite frankly, it's the closest thing to what we saw that I've come across. Below is a link to the video.
Keep in mind that this is only similar and not dead on. But every time I watch this, I feel 13 years old and back in that forest again. Imagine seeing this only much closer. It was clearly a person setting and it moved faster. Also, this was in the daytime in bright sunlight. Well, as bright as a forest will allow it to be, but still quite bright. I also got the location. This was at Little Lake Brompton, just outside of Sherbrooke, Quebec. On Google Maps, it's called Petit Lac Brompton. To make it easier, I've marked the location, give or take a few hundred feet, where this happened. Please keep in mind that back in the 90s, there were no roads or other houses there. It's been developed somewhat since this time, but not a lot. Thank you for reading. Hi everyone, I wanted to share my mom's story. I'm not good at telling slash writing stories, so pardon me. My mom grew up in Paraguay. For those of you who don't know, there seems to be a lot when I tell this story. Paraguay is a very small third world country. The area where my mom grew up is especially rural in the countryside where most of the poor people are. Her house was across from very thick woods that stretched for miles. One afternoon before it got dark, my grandma and mom were outside. My mom was about seven at the time, when she spotted what she described as a beautiful little white baby chick. She's always loved animals and enjoyed catching them, so she wanted to catch it. It kept running away from her, even though it seemed like she was just about to catch it multiple times. After what seemed like she was running in a circle for minutes, my grandma came out of nowhere and yanked my mom's hair. My mom said at that moment she was broken from a trance, that the sun had already set and she was actually very deep in the woods. My grandma smacked her really hard on the head and told her that El Pombero almost succeeded at taking her. My mom tried to explain to my grandma about the very pretty little chick, but of course it was nowhere to be found. My grandma said my mom seemed to be playing normally, and then all of a sudden just started fast walking towards the woods. My grandma thankfully ran after her and was able to catch up to her. I always think about what would have happened had my grandma not been there to stop it. I'm glad she was there. This happened in Grindstone, Pennsylvania back in the 90s. I was probably about eight years old, and my brother was about five-ish. We lived on a couple of acres in the country, with a farm on one side and your basic farm fencing with thick forests on the other side. With growing up in the sticks, my dad being an avid hunter, us kids were taught to be aware of our surroundings and wild animals and things like that. Also, we were taught not to just wander off without telling an adult and not to trust strangers, the normal safety stuff that kids are taught. Anyways, as a kid, I thought the woods were creepy slash scary. There was no way that I would have went into them by myself. So, I was playing outside with my little brother and he went into the house. There I was by myself, and I heard my mom calling for me. Kimberly, come here. Kimberly, over here. Come on, Kimmy. This was a little weird to me because why would my mom be in the woods right now? I climbed over the fence anyway and started walking towards my mom's voice. Then out of the blue, I felt like I was being watched and got a bad feeling. I started to wonder how my mom got into the woods without going past me. You know, just thoughts like that. So I turned and quickly ran back to the house where I found mom at the kitchen table and my brother playing video games in the living room. I then asked her if she called for me and she said no. And I told her what happened. This led to us kids being told to stay inside and play for the rest of the day. I'm now in my early 30s, and I've asked my mom about this incident, and she swears she never called for me. There's something about this situation that really bothers me to this day.
So I'm posting this from a throwaway simply because I know how people treat people who post weird stuff. Call me a coward if you want. Still, I've been reading about Missing 411 and I wanted to share some things that my grandmother taught me, did, or said in passing that I've never seen anywhere else. First, background. She was born in 1914 or 1916. She lived alone until she was 90 or 92 in a solitary house in the edge of the woods. She was spry and maintained her yard and garden religiously until she had a stroke that killed her. She was Christian and watched preaching every Sunday. Her home was in the lee of a mountain. One, she buried metals at the four corners of her property. I don't remember exactly, but I think it was iron, copper, gold, and silver. The directions, I think, were north iron, south copper, east gold, west silver. Two, she loved trees, but she would not allow trees to grow closer than 10 foot apart on her property. When I asked her why, she said, I like the trees, but I don't want my yard to be the woods. Three, she put lines of salt across the entryways to her home and at the gate into the fence around her property. Four, speaking of which, she maintained a fence around her entire property, about two acres. When I asked why, she said, good fences make good neighbors. There were no neighbors for hundreds of yards. Five, one day I was stacking rocks. She knocked over all the stacks and told me, Never stack three rocks together. If you find them stacked together in the woods, don't touch them. Six. She told me that I should never be in the shadow of a mountain during the blue hour, at sunset, except inside a place that is well kept. Her yard and gardens she defined as well kept. She told me that if I felt uneasy in the woods during the daylight to stand still and say, I will walk here. It is my right. Being in the woods at night, on the other hand, she said, was stupid. Eight. She said not to wear bright colors in the woods, that things can see you, same as people. She also said to not wear camouflage. You're not a tree and you ain't fooling nobody. She herself wore old lady blouses and floral prints, so those were apparently acceptable. Nine, she told me to take berries from the verge in the sunlight, but never eat berries that are in the deeper woods. 10, she told me that if you see white berries, Banaberry or doll's eyes, obviously don't eat them, but also don't go near them. She actually told me to step back several steps if I ever spot them, without turning around, and then turn around and get as far away as possible. I never knew why. 11. She said that if you're walking along the bank of running water, make sure to turn away from the water and walk into the woods a few feet sometimes to stay on track. I'm not clear on what this means. 12. If she found a ring of mushrooms in her yard, she would set a smoky fire in the middle. I don't know the logic behind this. 13. She maintained a margin around her property where she didn't allow any plants besides grass to grow. If vines tried to grow in, she called them feelers and would set a fire in that area to burn them back. 14. Lest it sound like she was at war with nature or something, she also had the greenest thumb of anyone I have ever met. Even in her heavily shaded yard, She grew vegetables in quantities I have never seen before or since. She had six tomato plants one year that produced literally bushels of tomatoes, whereas when I try to grow them, I'm lucky to get three tomatoes off of three plants. So what does this have to do with missing 411? I couldn't help but think all the things that she told me that seem related to the common themes, what to wear, what to do, etc., in mysterious cases. I don't know what knowledge or superstition my grandmother was drawing on. She wasn't Native American. She wasn't a witch that I know of. She wasn't some kind of druid as far as I know. But she definitely had opinions and told me directly what I should and should not do. And I followed them to the T and have always had pretty good experiences in the woods. Edit. I would also thought that I'd add, she lived directly next to the Southern Appalachian Cluster. I've lived in a small town in Kentucky for my entire life, 
And because of that, I've been surrounded by the mountains and the woods for years. My current house is literally nestled into the woods in the middle of nowhere. And thus, outdoor activities have taken up a huge chunk of my time, especially in the summer and fall. I'm in the woods almost daily, hiking to the creeks to fish or the meadows to hunt. And I know the woods and trails around my home like the back of my hand. That said, there is definitely something that calls to you while you're in the woods, especially when you're alone. And I've just now realized it after stumbling upon this sub. Before, I'd just brushed it off. Now, it's hard for me to ignore. My parents began allowing me to hike alone when I was around 13. But I didn't really get into it until about two years later when I was 15. Even then, though, I wasn't allowed to go very far, and I always had to carry a walkie-talkie with me so that I could contact my family if necessary. Later, at 17, I'd be allowed to carry a handgun with me. But that's neither here nor there. There's stories I can tell at that age, too. But this one takes place when I was 15. Before I get into it, I should mention that I have two outside dogs. Max, a black lab, and Bo, a beagle. I've had both since I was very young, and they're very smart, always staying by my side when I'm in the woods. They always listen to me. Until this day. I was hiking a trail that runs up beyond my aunt's house, one that I'd hike day in and day out, just out and about enjoying the woods. It was in October, so the weather was cool, not hot, and I'd been hiking for about an hour. The trail comes out on a spring that runs down from the top of this particular mountain. It hadn't rained lately, so the spring was mostly dry and covered in leaves. I remember looking up the mountain, which I'd never hiked to the top of before, and feeling this strange call. It wasn't really a voice, but it was an urge that I couldn't ignore. Keep in mind that I'm a very timid person, and hiking unfamiliar trails on my own freaks me out to this day. But that day, all my fear had dissipated. All thought left my head. I just climbed, higher and higher. My dogs followed me. I don't even know how to describe the feeling that came over me, but I remember just staring down at my feet and feeling at peace as I climbed. There was a moment when I paused to look out the houses below. I'd never been that high up, remember, and I felt amazed. I took a picture on my phone, and then I looked around me for my dogs. Bo had already run off and Max was following. I called out to them frantically to stop, but they didn't listen. They disappeared. At this point, looking down the mountainside, I was very afraid. Then I looked back uphill and it came over me again. I kept hiking. I couldn't stop. Eventually, I heard my walkie-talkie crackle. Everything was distorted, and I couldn't make any of the words out. I assume now that I was just out of range for it to pick up. But back then, it freaked me out. Whatever had come over me lost its hold on my mind. My dogs were still gone. Panicked, I began running downhill. It's a wonder I didn't get hurt. As I neared the wide section of the spring near the bottom, my walkie-talkie picked back up, and I heard my dogs running downhill behind me. I got home and mostly forgot about it. I just told myself that I had almost been lost and to be more careful. Flash forward many years now, and I still hike. I commented a short version of this second story on another post, but I'll add it back here. At this point, Max is very old and no longer hikes with me, so it's just me and Bo. Last year, I hiked up to a cave behind my house as I've done a million times before. And then I started following a trail that I'd never fully explored just out of curiosity. Bo was ahead of me per usual, but when I called her back, she'd come. We hiked for the better part of 45 minutes, following a pretty simple trail, and then I figured I'd better be heading back, because it'd be getting dark soon. And yet I couldn't stop. I kept telling myself I'd go out just a little bit further, just to see a little more. I remember looking down at my feet, just like before and listening to the silence of the woods around me and feeling at peace. It felt so easy just to keep going deeper and so difficult to turn around. Bo felt the call too, because even after I did break out of it and turn around, only after stumbling upon a root, and then called back to her, she wouldn't stop. I had to catch up with her and physically turn her around and pet her before she'd come with me. I don't know if these stories belong here or not, or if anyone will even read them and take them seriously. 
but they've been on my mind a lot. What if I hadn't stumbled over that route? Or what if my mom hadn't decided to contact me at that moment? How deep would I have hiked? And what waited for me in those woods depths? I don't know what's out there, but I know this. The woods call to us all. This was about three years ago in Big Bend National Park. My friend, my husband, and I were all going on a trip to do some primitive camping. I'm not a hardcore camper, but I've done my share of primitive camping and hiking. So I like to think that I have some wilderness sense. I know what common animals are like having grown up in eight acres of forested land. Coyotes were frequent visitors, so I know how creepy they can sound. That's why I know what we encountered that night was something else. We arrived at Big Bend around 4 p.m., checked in, and set up our tent and campsite. Nine-point draw. It's a pretty desolate location around the entrance to the park. The campsite is about 25 miles to the visitor center and lodge, and about 40 miles from the Rio Grande village. So we were not near any kind of civilization that I know of. We had the idea that we would go for a night hike to a nearby trail after having dinner that night. So in preparation, I decided to scout out the trail from our campsite. The terrain in this part of the camp is totally flat desert with some ground vegetation, so we thought it would be an easy route from our campsite to the trail. The trek from our campsite was not difficult, but as an added precaution, I put up rock piles for us to follow that night. After dinner, we decided to head out around 10 p.m. The first 10 minutes were pretty uneventful. We were all in good spirits. Suddenly, we hear a scuttling noise about 50 feet behind us. Having been used to animal noises at night, we wrote it off as some critter. A few minutes later, we heard the same noise a bit closer and sounding like a bigger animal. There are black bears here, but we weren't in the area they're normally sighted. Like I said, the landscape was wide open and we didn't see anything with our flashlights. We were a bit uneasy but willing to go on. The rock piles had been doing a good job of leading in the right direction. All at once I stopped. I felt absolute terror. It's an indescribable feeling. I see many others in this sub also reference this same feeling. I knew we were in danger. I just didn't know why. I looked to my friend and my husband who both looked as terrified as I felt. There was no sound. No wind. Then, in an instant, the most inhuman scream erupted, seemingly all around us. We all froze for what felt like minutes, but I'm sure it was just seconds. I don't remember making the decision to run back, but the next thing I remember, we were all running. We had made it pretty far out. Even though I thought I was running in the direction of our camp, I remember scanning for the piles of rocks that I had made but not being able to find any and almost turning back thinking that we were heading in the wrong direction. But I had this instinct not to. We made it to a rather large rock that I knew was on our way back to the campsite. I also remember putting a rock pile beside the rock. I went to check if it was there to make sure that we were headed back to our campsite. The rocks were still there, but they had been knocked over. This set off all the alarms and I told my friend and my husband that we had to get back to camp as soon as possible. We made it back a few minutes later. By the time we got back, I was nearly freaked out, and I didn't want to stay. I think my husband was as well, but my friend convinced us that it was just wildlife, so we stayed in the tent that night. I don't know if it was connected, but there was scuttling and footsteps around the tent all night. Either way, I did not sleep. We did not do any more primitive hiking that trip, and opted instead for a campsite in one of the community camps. I've never felt that feeling before or since, and I've been in the woods at night plenty of times. The next day I went out to check if all the rock piles had been knocked down. They had. I don't think an animal would deliberately go around knocking over the markers. That's what really makes me think that it was sentient. I don't know what it was, but I don't want to know. And I'm glad that we made it out. (laughs) 
I love to hike in the deep woods. The less people, the better. I've done it many places, but Shenandoah is one of my favorites. I was doing an eight mile hike deep in the woods on a little used trail because it was a difficult level trail. I spent the entire day hiking and had a small lunch and only saw three people the entire day. On my way back to the Big Meadows Lodge, I started to hear the scariest thing I've ever heard. Small children started to giggle. I was about five or six miles from the road and there are no other trails in the area that could have crossed this. Still, I figured it was a trick of the woods and sounds carry. I walked more, and the giggling followed me through the woods. I never saw anyone or anything, and thought I could identify two or three different voices giggling. Soon afterwards, I started to hear the creak and slam out of an old screen door. I recognized this sound because my father had a cabin in Michigan that had a door that sounded just like this. This went on for about two miles, then it simply stopped. I've not shared this before because I figured most people would think I'm lying or crazy. My wife doesn't even know because she would make sure that I never set foot out in the woods ever again. Once, I did an eight-day solo trip in the high Sierra Nevada mountains, wandering through granite boulders strewn mountain faces. I didn't see anyone for four days up near the high Sierra route. I've hiked the Trinity Alps solo for seven days, but saw plenty of people. I always had a GPS and PLB, and I'm thankful for that. I love the outdoors, love the adventure of the mountains. I took my children on their first backpacking trip this summer when we could, right off of Route 108 near Pinecrest Lake. I'm an NOLS semester graduate, and before a trip, I consider all the risks, weather, and usually overpacked gear, because I don't mind a heavy pack, and I like to be comfortable. I plan my trips month in advance, and obsess over maps and Google Earth for fun. I have a wilderness map collection. I used to lead summer camp backpacking trips in college, I've been a lurker in this subreddit for a few years, but never really got into 411. I just watched the Hunter movie, since it was posted on Amazon Prime, and I can't sleep. I'm thinking of all those times where I felt something, but of course it was nothing, because there's nothing out there but trees, the rocks, and the animals. Maybe a bear. But I felt something out there, and now I wonder what I felt. I'm not sure I'll be able to bring my family back into the woods. I'm sure I will, but... When I do, I think it'll be difficult to relax. I'm worried if I watch the other movie, I won't be able to stop thinking about it. But maybe I'm not supposed to stop thinking about it. A few years ago, I wanted to visit the very first place I backpacked, starting at a trailhead of the Appalachian Trail near Gorman, New Hampshire, that follows a creek named Rattle River south of the Androsagon River. No one wanted to go with me, so I hiked it mostly at night starting at dusk. I just wanted to go to the swimming hole near the lean and was able to take a dunk in the water before heading back. I didn't see anyone, but I kept feeling like there must be some bears nearby. Hiking at night is scary on its own, and I won't be able to do it again, certainly not alone. One time near Hetch Hetchy, my brother had to drop his backpack on the bridge trail near Till Till Creek on our way to the Rancheria Falls. We had the whole family with us, including my child who was one year old at the time. I got them to camp and at dusk left to go get the pack. The whole time I felt on edge, like I was being watched by bears. We had run into bears several times in the area. At Tiltill Creek, I got the feeling that something had been waiting or watching the pack. I got it on and hustled out of there, figuring bears or other critters had been smelling the food. But now I wonder. I like visiting Mono Hot Springs Resort and hiking to the hot springs late at night when you can have them all to yourself. There's been a few times when I've felt like there's something nearby which I suspected was a cougar, bear, or bobcat, but it felt more aware. Looking back, I wonder now. I'm more worried about my kids, letting them wander in the granite, playing on the rocks. It's terrifying. How do you sleep at night?
after watching these documentaries. I've now and then read possible missing 411 cases from here, but never gave them too much thought, even though I found them interesting. Somehow, I thought these cases usually only happen in the United States. However, today I had my finished writing exam, where I had to write about the theme, Human and Nature. I had six different materials, of which I had to choose two of them, to construct my writing around. One of the materials talked about how Finnish people are now known as the Nation of Forests, but we certainly weren't fans of forests hundreds of years ago. The material talked about the fear of forest bears and wolves, but there's also fairies and other supernatural beings. There was one term that caught my eye. It was the term Metsanpetun. Rough translation of this would be to be covered by the forest. The term was explained by this. One, human or animal, in the forest could lose sense of time and place. They'll feel weird as the surrounding forest became unusually quiet. No bird hummings, no noises of life. They may see the forest upside down or do other unexplainable things that no normal human being would do in a forest, as if they were teleported to another dimension. One who has been covered by the forest disappears as if into thin air. No one else can see them, even if they walk past them. Nor can the person who is covered by the forest see others. I thought I'd share this finding. In my exam, I immediately thought of missing 411 cases. I just find it so interesting that even in the 17th century, this phenomenon was known and feared by a nation that practically lived in forests. And to be honest, we Finns still do live in forests, as they cover around 75% of Finland's land area. This is my first post on Reddit. I usually just lurk, but I think it's time to finally share my story. I'm 29 years old, and this happened about 13 or 14 years ago. Back in the day, the soldiers who have been stationed here would go out to train in the woods. We would go there almost every day, checking the shooting ranges for bullets, shells, etc. Whatever we could find. Since I'm half American, I would like to talk to many of the soldiers and often we would trade beer or chocolate for some MREs. In this forest, there used to live a woman. We called her Waldhex. Guess you could translate it to forest witch in English. This woman lived in the woods for 25 years. The last thing I heard about this woman was that she got arrested by the police and is locked up in a mental asylum. We often talked to this lady, and she would talk about random stuff that made no sense at all. She often talked about Witchel Minor, I have no clue what the English translation would be. Maybe some kind of dwarf slash imp, but I'm not too sure. She even showed us the clothing she sewed and crafted for them and said it was some kind of tribute so that she can live peacefully in the forest. Judging by the size of the clothing, they had to be like a foot tall. Anyway, on this particular day, me and two buddies decided to ride our bikes deeper into the woods just to explore and maybe find a new shooting range. In the distance, we saw a person sitting on a log beside the trail. My friend was like, that has to be the witch. Turned out she was right. As we got closer to her, she stood up and blocked our path. She was really angry and asked us what we were doing out there. We've told her that we just wanted to go explore the woods some more. This is about the time I was a little creeped out. She started to say weird things about crab and mention some kind of crab humanoids. At one point, we've had enough of her crazy stories and we just kind of laughed her off. I said to her, well, maybe we meet one of your friends along the way. We hopped back on our bikes and just as I was going to pedal off, she suddenly grabbed my arm. It was a really tight grip that she had on me. With a 
kind of creepy smile, she said, I warned you. I told her to F off and let me go. We kept advancing deeper and deeper into the woods and joking about the things that she said. We maybe did about, I'd say, two more kilometers until the trail was so bad that it became impossible to ride a bike. We have taken a break and decided that we need to turn around. All three of us were just sitting on an old log, and suddenly I got goosebumps, and even my eyes have gotten a little bit watery. I look over to Daniel and notice he has goosebumps too. Mark, my other friend who was with us, said, You guys feel that too? Feels like we're being watched. Daniel's the type of guy who always goofs around and stuff, and I would have bet all my money in that moment that he would say something like, the crab people are stalking us, just to break the tension, but he didn't. Instead, he said with this serious tone, we should get out of here right now. We were riding out of the woods at a really fast pace, and it felt like forever to get out of there. We've never really talked about it, not even after all these years. I have goosebumps writing this part. I was really scared that day. The silence was what freaked me out. You didn't hear a bird, a branch falling off a tree, nothing, just dead silence. Who knows what is out there? I thought this story is fitting for the Missing 411 subreddit. I've been following Missing 411 for a good two years now. I apologize for my English, it's not the best. If you have any questions about the wild hex or anything, I will be around to answer them. Thank you for your time reading. My experience happened back in August of 2014, but it's still very vivid in my mind. I was unaware of the missing 411 phenomena until I stumbled upon this subreddit recently. I was on a youth group camping trip in New Hampshire. We were coming to a close after two days of uneventful camping, and I was tasked with going to tear down the archery range, a temporary makeshift affair we set up for the youth to practice shooting bows and arrows. The archery range was down the hill from the campsite, and then down a slight slope to the left of the trail road to a small oval clearing abutting the woods slash tree line. I walked down to the range by myself and started gathering up the equipment. I had finished making the pile for my first return trip when a very eerie feeling came over me. The sounds from the camp up the hill faded away and it was perfectly quiet and still, not a whisper of a breeze. There was a humming or a vibration in the air that I sensed in me, if that makes sense. For some inexplicable reason, I snapped my head to the right to the view of the tree line and noticed there was an area with thinner brush, kind of like an opening, and I started walking towards it, almost like I was being drawn. As I cleared the tree line and stepped into the woods proper, I could feel the pull to go deeper into the woods, and it became much stronger. Looking ahead, the woods were in deep shadow, with a strange group of four trees about 75 feet away, lit by a shaft of light beaming at an angle from the ground. The light wasn't the normal afternoon yellow sunlight, but a very strange golden color. The light hit the trees in a way that the bases of the trees were glowing in a beckoning way. With the rest of the woods in shadow and the trees lit up, it almost created a weird tunnel vision. The compulsion to go investigate the four trees was now almost overwhelming. The thought of, come see, come quickly, come right now was insistent. My head was pounding, like a headache without the pain. As I was about to take another step forward, another, separate feeling came from the depths of my being, and it started screaming at me to stop immediately. I instantly viscerally knew that despite how enticing this call was if i proceeded forward towards those trees i would be lost to the world that specific impression lost to the world scared me deeply the feeling of this is not right and danger were palpable to me this somehow overrode the compulsion 
I quickly look backwards to the opening, and I could see the bows sitting on the ground, and I think seeing a bit of reality helped me break the hold of the call. I suddenly felt a hollow pit in my stomach, and I started tracing a path slowly backwards towards the opening. I kept my eyes on those tree lines like I was facing down a predator. I didn't want to turn my back on them. I couldn't turn my back on them. Making it back and stepping through the opening to the archery range, my head almost instantly cleared. I could again hear noises from the camp and feel the wind. I looked at where I had just stepped from, and it now felt normal. I immediately grabbed the first load of equipment and headed back to camp. For some reason, I didn't tell anyone at camp what I experienced. On my subsequent trip to get the last load of equipment, absolutely everything was normal, but I stayed the hell away from that opening. What stands out to me is the lost to the world impression. It was so clear and ominous and final. I can't express how truly drawn I was to go deeper into those woods. The feeling to give myself over to it, whatever it was. I do know that something not good would have happened if I hadn't heeded that warning. I know that my experience was very real and very scary. I'm also convinced that I wouldn't have come out if I had kept going that day. This happened around August of this year. I'm not sure what we experienced or if there was anything odd about it, but whatever. It also is a bit of a long post. Sorry about that. So this was a hike up to Half Dome. We had a campground about a 20 minute drive from the trailhead. And the group was composed of me, an 18 year old male, my cousin, a 32 year old male, and my uncle's friend. I'll call him D. There were two girls with us, but they aren't really relevant to the story. My uncle and his friend are both Christian, so there were no substances consumed that could induce the feelings that I'll be talking about. We get to our campsite, set up camp, and go to sleep after eating. We plan to wake up at 4 and start the hike by 4.30. I randomly wake up at 3.30 a.m., like completely wide awake, and look out of my hammock. And I remember feeling this odd feeling as if I was woken up by something. And I remember looking out at the moonlit scene. The moon was very bright for some reason, and thinking to myself, it looks like a dream. I lay back in the hammock but can't go to sleep, and end up waking up my uncle and friend at 3.50. My uncle asks me, were you walking around at night? And I say no, and ask why. He says he woke up for some reason, and could hear someone walking around. Not an animal, but a person. I say, huh, weird and we brush it off. We get to the trailhead around 4.30, and as everyone is unloading from the car, D says that he's going to use the bathroom, which there are a couple of before the trailhead. I walk behind him for some time before falling behind and waiting for my uncle who forgot something in the car. The short, straight road from the parking lot runs directly to a T intersection with the road to the trailhead, and the bathroom is directly across from the intersection through a field a little. Those who have been there know what I'm talking about. We get to the intersection and wait for D to come out of the bathroom. We wait about 10 minutes before I go and check the bathroom. He isn't there. I get back to my uncle and tell him that. He says, hmm, weird. Maybe he went back to the car or something. And we decide to wait a bit more. By 5.10, we begin worrying. My uncle goes to check the car while I wait at the intersection to make sure we don't miss him if he went down the road away from the trailhead. My uncle returns, says he isn't there either. We decide maybe he went up the trailhead without us for some reason, and walk up there in about 10 minutes. He isn't there either. We're both kind of baffled now, because there are no other logical places that he would go. I decide to run back and check the car and bathroom again. I meet him halfway before I get to the intersection. He's sweaty and disheveled, with a weird look in his eyes. I say, where have you been? He says that he went to the bathroom, and when he got back to the intersection that we weren't there and that he just assumed that we went to the trailhead and started walking, and then met me. I say, what do you mean? 
We waited at the intersection for over half an hour and checked the car, bathroom, and trailhead, and you weren't there. He says, well, I don't know. I went to the bathroom. He then asks me where my uncle is. I say at the trailhead. And he asks me again. I tell him again. And note that it was weird that he asked me twice. As we're crossing the bridge to the trailhead, he sees a light off on the riverbank and exclaims, oh, maybe that's him. And I just look at him and keep walking. I thought his behavior was very strange, like he wasn't thinking straight. We finally get on with the hike and it goes by as normal, except that we seem to keep losing things, such as my uncle's small red flashlight, one of the girl's gloves, a water bottle, etc. It's like we just simply forgot about the items and couldn't remember where we could have left them. On the way back, it got dark and we returned on our flashlights. As we near the end of the hike, after the two waterfalls, it begins to seem as if we've been walking for far too long. My uncle also confirms this, asking me, doesn't it seem like it's taken way longer to get back? I say, yeah, I was just thinking that. We keep walking, but it still seems like we weren't making any progress. I've been on that trail many times, and as I was walking, I couldn't spot any familiar landmarks. It was weird. There was this odd feeling in the air, sort of a slight menacing feeling. It's hard to describe. I remember thinking, it feels like the woods are alive. We were marked three more times about how long the hike is taking, and begin to laugh at it because it felt so ridiculous. After a bit, we finally and suddenly find ourselves on the final stretch and make it back to the car. Now, all of this seemed odd at the time, but I just brushed it off. I only realized how weird those events felt after we got home and my aunt asks my uncle, were you camping? And he says, yeah, how'd you know? As we didn't tell them where we were going since it was kind of last minute. She says that she had an odd dream where she sees my uncle in a tent in a forest somewhere and someone is outside of his tent. She says she couldn't see who it was, but knew there was a presence there. She says that she woke up around three and had a strong urge to pray for him, and she did. My uncle kind of looks at me after that like, are you hearing this? I honestly don't know what to make of all this, but I wanted to post it to hear your opinions. I've told this story to several friends, family, and co-workers, partly to tell a weird experience I had in the forest and partly to see if I could get some insight into what I had experienced. I'm also interested in hearing what people who are reading this think what happened. I have photos of the area that I'm hoping to attach to this post. I'm originally from Northwestern Ontario and have been in and out of the forest my whole life. I grew up hunting, fishing, camping, and I've gone on many remote backcountry canoe trips. I've also worked in the forest for a few different jobs. I've always felt very comfortable in the forest and have never had a bad experience. That was until working in the forest near New Liskard, Ontario. I was working as an ecologist in the district of North Bay, Ontario. As an oncologist, I had many different jobs that brought me to the every end of the district. One of those jobs involved conducting inventory on old logging cut blocks. This is something that I've done multiple times over multiple summers in different areas of the province. This particular block was located west of New Liskard, about a 45 minute drive out of town. The area was very rural, with farm fields and the odd farmhouse scattered throughout. While driving the roads, it was common for other vehicles to stop and stare at you. This might have been because we were driving in a marked truck or that we were the only people that the locals didn't recognize. The block we were looking for hadn't been cut since 1995 and was located down this old, rarely used logging road. The two of us were tasked with collecting data on the block. To get to the block, we had to turn off onto this overgrown road that barely fit a truck. The road had many mud pits that nearly sunk our truck at multiple locations. When we couldn't drive any farther, we had to walk the rest of the way back to the block 
which took about a half hour. The work started the same as any other day. While we worked, we talked about office drama, funny experience we've had, and what good movies we've watched recently. As we got further into the block, I started to feel my chest get tighter. As we continued, I started feeling like we were being watched through the trees. These feelings got stronger the further that we traveled into the logging block. I tried to shrug them off until my co-worker suddenly stopped reciting the data that we were collecting, looked at me, and said, I have a terrible feeling about this place. We then discovered that we had both been feeling like we were being watched, and that something wasn't right about this area of the forest. We continued our work with the unsettling feelings persisting. As we continued further into the cut block, keeping our conversation, we suddenly stopped dead in our tracks, dropping the last word that was uttered. We both heard what sounded like two people having a conversation. This we couldn't comprehend, because we were in a remote area, deep down this almost undrivable trail on which we saw no sign of anybody. Then, another hour walk into the bush to get to our location to end the cut block. The forest was too thick to be of any use recreationally, and it wasn't hunting season. What was also troubling was we couldn't make out what was being said. The voices would continue for a few seconds, then disappear as quickly as they started. Once they stopped, we would continue our work, but be stopped in our tracks as the incomprehensible voices would pick up a few minutes later. This pattern continued until we came across trees that had been bent over and snapped. Now, it's not uncommon to find these trees bent and snapped from bears, moose, and even the weather. But what was odd about these trees was their proximity to other trees. We would find a tight cluster of trees with the middle trees snapped and others untouched. The trees were also free of any rub marks or scarring. Then we came across a patch of young poplar trees that was completely surrounded by an almost perfect circle of dense spruce and pine trees. Within the patch, almost all of the poplar trees have been snapped and bent in different directions, but the surrounding evergreens were untouched. Neither of us had ever seen anything like this before, and with the feeling that someone was watching us, we quickly got out of the area. As we moved back out of the block, the voices stopped, and the feelings of dread and being watched drifted away. We both expressed that it felt normal again when we were only about a half hour walk away from where we had the experience. I've shown different foresters the photos looking for an explanation, but never received a clear answer. The best I received was maybe the soil composition is different in that location, but all expressed how they had never seen trees broken like that. I've asked First Nation individuals from different communities and have been told by multiple people that what I experienced was a bad omen that shouldn't be talked about. Now that I type that out, I'm starting to have second thoughts about whether or not this is a good idea. What made me decide to post this on this thread was partly seeing others' weird experiences in the forest shared on this thread, but also learning that two women had disappeared from the new Liskert area. Julie Diane Fortier lived in Elk Lake, Ontario, upriver from the cut block I worked and went missing in 1980 after taking the bus to school. Five years to the day she disappeared, her school bag, running shoes, and coat were found near Haleybury, Ontario Landfill. The landfill is located roughly six kilometers away from where she's supposed to be attending school, and roughly 50 kilometers away from Elk Lake. Another five years pass before her remains are found by a couple along a dirt road outside of Haleybury. Many speculate on what happened to her, but the mystery was never solved. Melanie Ethier went missing and from New Liskert in 1996 when she was on a one kilometer walk home from her friend's house. She was observed walking by multiple people on this one kilometer walk home and seen crossing the Armstrong Street Bridge near her house. The last stretch of her journey involved a poorly lit black road where she disappeared without a trace. To this day, Melanie's whereabouts are unknown. I'm open to ideas on what I experienced in the forest of northern Ontario. My job continues to involve me slogging through remote areas of Canada. To this day, I have never felt the way I did in the forest near New Liskard, Ontario.
my mom became silent and disoriented on a familiar hiking trail and came close to getting lost. I will preface this by saying that my mom died of cancer four years after this incident, so this isn't an urgent medical mystery, just something to think about. I believe it sheds some light on how intelligent people can go missing and become disoriented on familiar trails. To set the scene, this took place at a local, county-run park, with lots of hiking and walking trails in the woods. This park directly connects to a United States National Park, so lots of people will hike along the three-mile connecting trail and walk between the parks. The county park is popular and has plenty of trails in good condition, and thus is well attended, especially in warm weather. These parks are also popular in the region because they're pretty much surrounded by ever-encroaching suburbia, though 100 years ago this was a rural area. I was 13 years old at the time. My mom was 55. This took place about 10 years ago. My mom and I went hiking one summer afternoon on a trail that we knew well. We had both taken it numerous times in the past 8 to 10 years, whether together, alone, or with other people. It was still daylight but the sun had begun to approach the horizon. We had just reached the top of a small slash medium sized hill and were probably not walking too fast at the moment when my mom just stopped walking. She had turned around and was looking to our right where the view was a bunch of tall skinny trees through which one could see the low afternoon sun. Looking at this area while walking would probably have created a strobe effect with the bright sunlight as the many narrow trees passed between the sun and a person's eyes. So there she was, standing still, facing the trees off the side of the trail. She didn't respond to me at all talking to her, waving my hand in front of her, trying to look into her eyes or poking her. This was worrying to 13-year-old me, who still depended on her for a lot. Before long, she sat down on the ground. This was a controlled movement. She didn't just fall, but she still wasn't reacting to me. The seated position she took in the middle of the trail reminded me of how a child would sit, similar to crisscross applesauce. So my 13-year-old mind wondered if she was somehow reverting to childhood. Her eyes remained open the whole time. I managed to get her cell phone. It was either in her hand or pocket, and she didn't react to my attempt to take it, and I called my dad's office. He didn't pick up, as he was likely busy at the time. I decided that if the situation didn't change, I would call him back in about 10 minutes and leave a message on the line that paged his beeper. At this point, I started praying for my mom. After a few minutes, she became responsive again. She knew who I was and didn't panic at the situation. I think she may have been reluctant to get up and get moving, but we started walking again. I couldn't get any clear answers out of her regarding what happened. About five minutes later, we came to the point where the trail that we needed to take to complete our loop and get back to our car was a branch off of the straight trail that we were on. I took this branch, but she just kept going straight. I had to run back after her and make her come with me to the correct trail. She said she didn't know what was the right way and asked me to properly guide her. We had never gone straight on that trail, so she was definitely disoriented. If I hadn't been with her that day, and she frequently went this way by herself, she would have wound up somewhere unfamiliar and I don't know what would have happened if slash when she became fully lucid again. She probably would have called someone on her phone, but that still may not have guaranteed that she would find her way home. We got back to the car and she managed to drive us home. Before long, she was fully lucid and back to normal. And to my knowledge, this kind of situation never occurred again. When I brought it up to her once or twice at points afterwards, she dismissed the situation as just caused by the light coming through the trees. I don't know how she perceived the incident or how she remembered it. The whole experience was rather unsettling for 13-year-old me, who'd never had to help my parents like this before. I realized that this had been somewhat similar to a briefer incident that had occurred at a grocery store within the year before the Woods incident. When we took our full cart out of the store at the end of the shopping trip, she dazedly began pushing it towards the main road rather than the parking lot. I had to get her to turn in the correct direction. She was somewhat disoriented, but she managed to drive home fine. Later, she remarked how she couldn't believe she had been able to drive in that condition. Indeed, she referenced this incident more than the Longer Woods incident. So what happened? I think Reddit's armchair medical experts would call the Woods incident some kind of seizure, 
based on how they interpret other hiking incidents, like another one that I read before, and given how my mom gave the light coming between the trees as an explanation. Maybe it was connected with her eventual cancer. Maybe it was something else. We moved on and didn't talk about this much in the remaining four years of her life. If this story contributes anything to understanding the concept of missing 411, it's this. An intelligent, seemingly mentally normal person who knew the trail well suddenly went silent and stopped reacting to normal stimuli. Then, the person started walking again, but was very disoriented and dazedly took the wrong turn. If I hadn't been there, she could have become permanently lost. This would have been more dangerous in a larger, more remote park, with more dangerous environments and no cell service. There is absolutely a scientific, medical explanation for what happened. Something mundane but unexpected like this could be responsible for many disappearances. My family is from the Caribbean, and my aunt told me about an experience she had as a child. This had to have happened almost 50 years ago when she was around 8 years old. I don't want to write my aunt's real name, so let's call her Jane. So, Jane lived in a small village that was surrounded by forests, sugarcane fields, and rice paddy fields. One day, Jane and her cousins decided to play a game. Jane and her cousins knew this forest extremely well since they played there every day. After a while, they noticed their cousin Jack was missing. They searched everywhere for Jack and called out to him, but he was nowhere to be found. Eventually, after an hour of searching, they decided to send one of their cousins to run and get help. Jane's uncle arrived a little while after and began helping the search for Jack. Another hour passed, and the uncle came upon a thick growth of thorny vines and bushes. He heard shouting coming from nearby. There were so many thorns and vines, and it was so thick that he had used his cutlass, like a machete, to cut through. There was no way anyone, even a child, could get through. That's how thick it was. When he finally cleared a path, he entered a small clearing, and Jack was sitting in the very center. He asked Jack how he got there, and Jack had no memory of what had happened after they started playing the game. He also had zero scratches on him and his clothes were clean with no dirt on them at all. There was no way that he could have gotten in there. My aunt says my family thought it might have been a doin', which in folklore are these fairy-like creatures that have feet that face backwards and try to lure people into the forest. Does anyone know of any missing 411 cases in the Caribbean? I thought this kind of fit it, though I'm still new to this missing 411 topic. A little while ago, I was watching this creepiest missing 411 found alive video. There was this one story about a woman who was lost for two days. When she was running around in the woods, she saw a group of people with backpacks on a hike together. When she saw them, she yelled out for help. But instead of responding, they stood there staring at her. She kept yelling to them, and they wouldn't respond to her but kept staring. When she came closer, they'd move behind a tree, obscuring their faces from her. When she backed up, they'd come out from behind the tree, still staring. Is this a common phenomena? I tried googling this and nothing relevant came up. This didn't happen in a national park. It was in a remote camping area in Maine. So my family owns a cabin with an outhouse about 10 yards up in the woods. The path to the outhouse is lit at night. 
and there's a light inside the outhouse. So one night at about 1 a.m., I wake up needing to go to the bathroom, so I head to the outhouse. Then, just as I'm about to open the door and head back down to the cabin, I get this deep-seated fear. Something telling me, do not open that door. I didn't hear or smell anything. It was just like this voice inside my head whispering, don't open the door. I must have sat there for like 10 minutes until it felt safe to open the door. I never told anyone but my sister. My family is full of skeptics. I've been reading through a lot of the top posts and I had something I wanted to share. My ex-girlfriend's brother disappeared in Yosemite a long time ago and they found his stuff neatly folded and put off to the side. They eventually found him several miles from his stuff, fortunately alive. This was no surprise to me and my exes. He was severely depressed and wanted to unalive himself. He tried to die of exposure, but it was summer and he was not at a high enough elevation to freeze to death. Their parents didn't want to believe that he was unaliving himself or depressed. They simply assumed he was just fine, and it was all some kind of mystery. A lot of these cases of missing people sound very familiar to this case, with the neatly folded things and no trace of them and stuff. He told us that he just wanted everyone to find his stuff easily and leave the world seemingly having his life intact. Sometimes it's not a mystery. Hey everyone, I know this is primarily a United States sub, but I'm from Australia and had a strange experience near my family farm a few years ago that seems very familiar to some that I have read on this sub. So here it goes. I live and work on a farm in Southwest Victoria, Australia, and one of my jobs and hobbies is going hunting for deer to eat and some kangaroos to control their population as they breed incredibly quickly. A few years ago in spring, I was wandering along the boundary of our smaller farm that my granddad, or Nano, an Italian, cleared for farming, and the bush when I saw a path leading into the dense underbrush. I climbed over the rickety old barbed wire perimeter fence and headed down it to a particularly thick part of the bush I knew I hadn't explored thoroughly before. By the way, for my American folks, when I say bush, I mean the forest. When hunting our local species of deer, most sandbar, but we also see hog, fallow, cheetah, and red deer, it's best to move in stops and starts so you fit in with the general bush noise and sound more like a prey animal rather than a predator on the prowl. So here I was taking five steps, stopping to look around me and then taking another five steps, and so on, when I noticed that my last five steps were unusually loud, or rather, everything else had gone quiet. No cows bellowing in the distance, no wind in the gum trees, or the sound of screeching cockatoos passing overhead. Just a dead silence. The hair all over my body stood up. I unslung my rifle from my shoulder and cocked it, thinking maybe I was being stalked by wild dogs. I was wrong. As I looked around, my existential dread mounted, and when I saw him, I thought I was going to pass out. He was off to my left and was kind of a blurry caricature of an old man wearing a red hat and pretty much no other distinctive features. It was hard to see him clearly. It was like I was going through a heat haze, but I knew that he could see me just fine as the dark spots he had for eyes were locked with mine. Standing about 20 meters to the left of the path among the ferns and underbrush, I could not see his hands. That is, until they lifted into view holding an ax. That was, unlike the man-thing, quite solid and clear to view. That movement snapped me out of my shock, and although I was terrified and didn't know what the heck I was looking at, I raised my gun to my shoulder and pointed it at him, and started to back along the path cautiously. 
I passed a tree, which hid him from my view for the tiniest moment, and with that he was gone, and the sound was back. With no warning, I could hear all the usual sounds and see clearly all around me. I was still terrified and pretty much sprinted out of the bush after that. Admittedly, a roo jumped out of the bush not far down the trail and I popped off a shot out of sheer fright, missing it. I got to the edge of the paddock again and legged it to my oot, sped home, and slept with my gun under my bed that night. Nothing exactly like this has happened to me before. Although, I have had some weird encounters in the bush. In the same area, the Kurds River Valley, there has always been rumors of weird happenings among the farmers and locals, including some stories like my own, although differing in the details. I don't know what happened, or what I really saw, but it shook my view of reality, and changed me as it gradually sank in that that was some kind of messed up paranormal activity stuff, and not just someone playing a joke. I didn't talk to people about it immediately, but have since, and my uncle was shocked when I told him, and explained to me that a similar experience happened to him as a child, in the mountains near Mount Hotham, in a little town called Brigitte, that had, at point, hosted a satanic cult. But that's a story for another time. Thanks for reading this, and stay safe in the forest, or bush. I walked from Copel to Louisville Lake on a 12-mile trip for Christmas. I was alone at night. I did it for recreation. I walked over 12 rivers, streams, and a lake. The thing that always gets me is these missing 411 people take off their shoes. When I run a marathon, I never get this feeling. Mile 6 of my suburban walk, I had a strong desire to take off my shoes. I decided that I wouldn't, no matter what but I had that desire for the second half of my 12-mile trek. When I'm walking with others, this barefoot feeling never crosses my mind. Another thing that struck me was I took breaks to rest on the bridges. The lake and stream were attractive. I think some of this missing 411 is human nature, but weird because it's not cultural to the United States. I'm going to try and report this with as little dramatic flair as possible because it seems like people sometimes get carried away with the storytelling when reporting something like this and I want to avoid that if I can. This happened a long time ago and it wasn't in America but for the first time the other day I was discussing it and suddenly realized that it actually involves three of the major factors associated with a lot of the 411 missing cases. A body of water, a dog behaving extremely unusually, and large amounts of granite. I was in my mid-teens at the time, and due to unusual circumstances, my dad had woken me up in the middle of the night to walk the dog with him and to have a chat. It was around 2 a.m. It was a full moon and a very bright night with great visibility. The skies were clear, and we were walking on a granite hill, an extinct volcano, in fact, that has a valley in the middle with a luck and a small lake in it. We had walked around the lock-in before, starting up the side of the valley, towards the ridge, with the dog on a leash. As we began to approach the top of the slope, the dog stopped dead, and point-blank refused to come any further in the direction we were walking. He was literally a dead weight on the leash, and we would have had to bodily drag him to move him even an inch further forward. We realized that he'd tucked his tail between his legs, was visibly shaking, and was in a curled crouch, making himself as small as possible. He was also entirely fixated on something ahead of us that we hadn't noticed or paid attention to beforehand. It appeared to be a straight black line emerging vertically from the ground. I remember thinking at first that it was a plastic tube they used to protect vulnerable saplings from deer, because in the first moments we became aware of it, there were no discernible features whatsoever other than a black vertical bar. As we watched, 
the straight black bar unfurled into the crude shape of a humanoid. I estimate to have been around eight feet tall. Unfurled is the best term that I can think of to describe this process. If you've ever seen a butterfly emerge from a chrysalis, it was something like that. The figure was entirely jet black. There were no visible features or contrast within it to any degree, despite the bright moonlight. And black doesn't cover how dark this thing actually was. It was what I imagine a black hole might look like. And although the figure itself wasn't remotely transparent or insubstantial, the outline was slightly fuzzy or blurred, almost like something that's vibrating extremely quickly or a washing machine on a high spin cycle. It did not have human proportions. It was almost like a child's drawing of a stick man, but with disproportionately long arms and legs. If you're imagining something like a stick insect made out of the material Vanta Black and in the rough shape of a person, you're pretty close to the mark. The head was unusually small, and I remember the top of the head being somewhat flat, although my dad doesn't. In every other respect, our recollections of the event are identical. This happened within probably under a minute, and then it turned and faced us. I'm not going to give a melodramatic description, and in fact, words really can't do it justice. But although it lacked any features whatsoever that might have been identified as eyes or a face, you could feel this thing's attention on you. Instantly, every hair on my body stood erect, and I broke out in goosebumps. I turned to my dad and said, Dad, what the F is that thing? He's one of the most skeptical and level-headed people I know, so what really freaked me out was that his answer was just, I don't know, we need to get out of here, right now. And as a young man, being able to detect genuine fear in my dad's voice was quite unsettling. We immediately began to walk sideways away from the figure, so as to not entirely turn our backs on it. And the minute we began moving away, it was like a spell was broken on the dog who began to literally drag us. The figure followed us for more than five minutes, maintaining the same distance. It walked with large, slow, deliberate strides, and I remember its arms swung in long arcs as it moved. At no point did it show any sign of aggression. It simply followed, maintaining the same distance from us the entire time. It was perfectly and completely silent, there wasn't a sound when it was following us. We were in a highly adrenalized state during this pursuit, and the atmosphere was extremely tense. We exchanged very few words other than whispers like, Is it still following us? And, Don't look at it. It never even crossed our minds to run, which in hindsight seems unusual, given that neither of us even entertained the possibility that this was just another person out for a walk. In the moment, we both had an almost literally overwhelming sense of wrongness about the situation. After about five minutes, I stopped. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, this is completely insane. What the F is going on? What is that effing thing? And when we stopped, it stopped. And again, just turned to stand facing us straight on. Because of the total lack of features, it may as well have been facing directly away from us. But like I said, there was a very definitive physical sense of when this thing's awareness was focused on you. We stood in total silence. The dog continued to try to drag us away. It stood motionless for a minute or two. And then, as we watched, it turned, sank down into the solid ground, and disappeared. Immediately. It felt like some sort of charge in the air had dissipated, and we began power walking back to the car. When we got back, we were still buzzing with adrenaline, and woke everyone up to tell them what we'd seen. And that's the story. I can't really add anything else that wouldn't be just as dramatic flourishes for storytelling purposes. The dog's behavior was extremely uncharacteristic of him. If we had encountered another person under the same circumstances, there's not a doubt in my mind that he would have been barking and straining on his leech to approach them rather than get away. That's partly why we was on a lead, but also because he was a rescue and very prone to chasing animals and disappearing for 20 minutes or so. We were both quite shaken, as neither of us could really come up with 
any plausible rational explanation for what we'd experienced. Occasionally over the years, people have suggested this was a broken specter, where our shadows were being cast by the moonlight on a fog bank or low cloud. But I can't accept this explanation. There just wasn't any fogs or clouds present, and visibility was excellent due to both clear air and the bright moonlight. I have no real theories about what we saw, nor does my dad. Although I still consider myself to be a naturally skeptical person, this completely shattered my ability to dismiss other people's stories of high strangeness and wild theories. Even though those at face value may seem absurd. I can hardly laugh in someone's face when they say that they think Bigfoot is real, but comes from another dimension, for example, or that something otherworldly is taking people in the wilderness. Although obviously I have no reason to believe this was Bigfoot and the incident incurred in Scotland. Years after the fact, and years ago now, I found a thread on a bushcraft forum where people were discussing spooky experiences in the outdoors, and to my amazement, there was a hunter who reported seeing the exact same thing crossing a clearing in the woods from a hunting hide during a full moon in America. I don't have a link because this was a long time ago, but they reported identical details. The small head, the long arms that moved in pendulous arcs when it walked, the slow, deliberate stride, the total blackness and lack of features, and even the fuzzy outline that they described in exactly the same way as if it was vibrating. Make of this what you will. I'm not trying to convince you of anything, and I'm not married to any particular theory about what we saw. I just thought it was worth reporting here when I realized that the hill was mostly composed of granite and connected that with the water in the lake. I want to briefly touch on two of the more obvious explanations for what we experienced and why I struggle to accept them. But first, because it's relevant to one of them, let me mention that there are at least some caves on this hill, and they have been associated with spooky stuff before, although I didn't know this at the time. In 1836, a group of schoolboys found a small entrance to a previously unknown cave on the hill near where this occurred that contained 17 miniature coffins containing what we would describe today as voodoo dolls, and some of them are still on display in the Scottish National Museum today. Now, for the rational explanations. 1. We were hallucinating. The dog's strange behavior was caused by something unrelated, but in the unfamiliar environment and the dark, we entered some kind of adrenalized state where our minds projected a tangible threat onto an unexpected object. Possibly, actually, one of those tubes used to protect trees that I mentioned earlier. And we both hallucinated the same thing. I find this hard to accept because of the specific details we both recalled afterwards. Long arms, small head, vibrating outline, slow, deliberate stride, swinging arms, strong sense of when its attention was focused on you, etc. Despite not actually talking about what we were seeing at the time. And also that the dog was very clearly focused on the same thing as we were, and absolutely terrified. Theory number two. It was exactly what it appeared to be. A very unusually tall, black-skinned individual, emaciated to the verge of death that was vibrating. In this scenario, they would have emerged from a hole in the ground and were shivering from the cold. They then followed us in silence before descending back underground via another hole. I can almost accept this, and that due to adrenaline, our brains interpreted it as being more dramatically strange than it actually was. However, the problem with this theory is that it would be really, really weird. But it does bring us back to the tangible world of things that actually exist. Because although Scotland is something like 98% white, there are still thousands of Scottish people with black skin, and it's possible that some of them are very tall and thin. The only thing that's maybe worth adding is that this event seemed to flick some switch in my head that made me no longer remotely afraid of the dark under any circumstances. You'd think it would have gone the other way, and I'm not LARPing as a vampire or some possessed creature of the night. 
but I worked in a bakery at the time and walked to work along a river in the deep valley in the middle of night. Sometimes it was pitch black, to the extent that you would have to feel your way ahead with your hands. And I'm not ashamed to admit that sometimes I'd get a bit spooked, especially when a fox suddenly screamed right next to you. After this event, never again. I can walk through the deepest, darkest forest, abandoned building, or mine in complete darkness without feeling the slightest trepidation since this incident. And I don't really know why, but it's to the extent that people have commented on it. I don't know how you can do that. Now, not being afraid of the dark is hardly a superpower. But for me, it has always been a markedly less intimidating experience after this encounter, and I really can't rationalize why because it seems like it would make so much more sense for it to have instilled a fear of the dark rather than removed it. And that's all I have to say. In the unlikely event that you've seen the same thing, please let me know. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. But I don't think I've left anything relevant out. This happened in late September in Route Medicine Bowl National Forest in Colorado. I like campgrounds in the off season when it isn't crowded. My girlfriend and I went to our favorite federal campground located about 10 air miles from the previous incident. But you need to cross a mountain in the park range so distance means greater. Campground is only open a few months a year as it's located 10,000 feet Average snowfall at this location is 350 inches, so it's usually snowed in. It's crowded during summer, but rarely anybody around midweek during off-season. There's usually a campground host parked in an RV around to help people with firewood, etc. He's an old man, and I know that he wasn't there. It's the typical federal campground, where you put $12 in an envelope and drop it in a strong box. There are two loops surrounded by campsites with a particular site that is our favorite as it's further off the perimeter and private. Odd when we arrived because we were literally the only people there. No host or other campers anywhere, so we were stoked about having the place to ourselves. We did the usual truck camping setup with a tent, firewood, cooler, books, and other items that we wouldn't carry backpacking. We walked around the campground and didn't see anybody the entire time, which was a little strange but not concerning. We built a fire and sat around enjoying the evening. Gorgeous fall weather with leaves falling and crunching when you walk. Those of you who camp know the sound of a fire and leaves rustling in the wind. It's my favorite season in the woods, and this was an above average night. Eventually, we retired to our tent, and I don't really know what time it was. It was our big truck camping tent, not a small backpacking tent, so we could move around some laying in the tent reading and she falls asleep before me. I should say that there was no way a vehicle could pull into this place and not be heard because it was so peaceful. Listening to the leaves blow and thinking about what a privilege it is to be here. Wide awake and not tired enough to sleep. We got up a few times to check the fire embers. Sometimes, probably after midnight, I'm laying in my sleeping bag reading and I hear something walking around. There are deer, elk, moose, lions, and bears moving around in the fall, so I wasn't immediately alarmed. There are no grizzlies in Colorado since the 1970s. At least, that's what most people think. Some scientists disagree and say there might be a few remaining in the San Juan Mountains. Black bears don't scare me unless they're acting aggressive. Familiar with a bull moose in the area that I've been seeing for years. I stopped reading and listened carefully. I could hear the leaves blowing, but also something walking on the leaves. It was getting closer to the tent when I realized that it was bipedal. Immediate fear was different than what I described in the previous incident where I was shaking, sweating, and fleeting. Remember, my heart racing and running for my life. This time, I froze. 
I couldn't take a breath. Heart beating out of my chest like I'm hiding. I'm trying not to move or make a sound as I hear it walking around the tent. Unmistakably walking on two legs because the dry fallen leaves accentuate every step. Never considering waking my girlfriend. I was terrified in a calm rather than panicked way. Laying there trying not to move. Unable to take a deep breath considering what the fuck is walking around the tent. We all know how different sized people sound walking on dry leaves. 225 pound man sounds different than a little girl. This creature was walking around the tent and it was huge. I could tell from the footsteps and I was petrified. I didn't have a gun, but I did grab a good sized knife and held onto it knowing that it was useless. Now this is where it gets terrifying as if it wasn't enough already. I'm laying there, waiting for this motherfucker to leave. Hoping I hear whatever it is walking away from the tent in the campsite. But no, it gets closer. I hear it walking towards the tent and I'm breathless with fear. Literally waiting for something to grab us. I'm paralyzed with fear as I remember I couldn't move. Getting out of the tent was never an option. Moon was relatively full. So, when it approached, I saw a huge shadow of a creature standing up through the tent fabric. I could hear it breathing on the tent. It was standing directly above, looking at me through the tent. It was without a doubt bipedal. It stood over me for a few minutes, and then I hear it walk away from the campground, back to the utterly vast wilderness. I couldn't sleep. I listened all night until sunrise. I didn't tell my girlfriend right away but started packing up our shit to get the fuck out of there immediately. I looked around and didn't see any footprints, but the leaves were thick on the ground, so they wouldn't be easy to see. Packing up, I noticed still nobody else in the campground. I know it wasn't a deer, an elk, a moose, a lion, or a bear. Could have been a huge man, but where the fuck did he come from? And where did he go? In my heart, I know that it wasn't a man. It didn't want to harm us. I know because I was vulnerable, laying there, and it could have easily killed us. I thought about it, and wonder if this is connected to the previous incident that I described. Was I fleeing from something like this before, but being stalked? What if it has the powers that some of you describe, like interdimensional extraterrestrial with cloaking and mimicking ability? Could this be what is taking people? There are other documented missing 411 cases in the area. One case in particular comes to mind that I'm not sure is covered in a missing 411 book. Same general area where a few years ago, an experienced hunter went missing in September from a group of several men from out of state. He was apparently experienced and familiar with the area. The man goes missing, search and rescue look everywhere for a few days, and the man is found later, dead in a place that they had already searched. There was no clear cause of death. I know one of the search and rescue people, and he said it was really fucking weird since they searched where he was found relatively close to camp. Did this man piss off whatever was watching me? What the fuck is happening? Finally, to help give context to the setting, I'm sure some of you will say it was a human, but this is a vast wilderness and one of the more remote areas of the lower 48. I encourage people to look at a map of Route Medicine Bow National Forest, and the Zikrel Wilderness. This particular campground is isolated. There is an approximately three-quarter mile drive down a dirt road off the main road to the campground, so you hear vehicles approaching. There is nothing but vast, expansive wilderness in the direction from which it came and went. I'm increasingly thinking that this incident is related to the first. Seen some strange things in the woods, but wasn't at any point in fear for my life but twice. I'm 54 and spent most of my life exploring backcountry without anything too frightening happening until about three years ago. It's alright if you don't believe me or offer an opposing point of view. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. Lastly, this wilderness isn't like Georgia or Ohio, where you'll eventually run into civilization if you keep walking in any direction. You could walk for weeks and many miles without seeing anything but backcountry.
I just stumbled on this page while looking for similar experiences to what I just had while backpacking in Yosemite. I had no idea Yosemite was such a hot spot for weird activity, and it's made me more certain that my experience wasn't just my imagination. I'd love to know if you have had anything similar happen, or if you have any possible explanations. Anyway, here's my story. My boyfriend and I were backpacking in Yosemite last week. We were trying to make it to Little Yosemite Valley after having to turn back on our original trail due to ice. We didn't get to Little Yosemite due to our late start and had to illegally camp above Vernal Falls. Here is where the story gets weird. Full disclosure, I did take an edible, a weed gummy, before I went to bed. I usually take one and a half, but only took one, and don't really think this is the reason for what happened. Anyway, shortly after falling asleep, I felt a weird sensation like an electric zap on one temple. I felt it move through my brain and out the other temple, and it jolted me awake so suddenly and harshly. I know it sounds crazy. I was freaked out, but wrote it off as a really strange dream, and started to fall back asleep. As I laid down, I noticed I had a slight feeling of pressure in the back of my eyes. Shortly after I fell back asleep, I was once again abruptly awoken by an electric, zap-type feeling, this time on the back of my thighs. As I was waking, my legs twitched, like you would imagine with some sort of electric surge, and I had a tingling feeling in my thighs. At this point, I was really weirded out, and stayed awake, staring at the ceiling of the tent, trying so hard to make sense of it. As I laid there, my body was slightly twitching, starting at my right ankle, then my leg, then shoulder, all on the right side. I remember having the thought that it feels like I'm a robot that's being worked on, and my mind wandered to the idea of, what if I'm actually in a pod, or a lab somewhere, and the world is all a simulation? Now, that thought probably was just the weed gummy. I thought about waking my boyfriend up but worried I would sound crazy, so I hesitantly let myself fall back asleep, just hoping that it wouldn't happen again. But I was shortly awoken by another zap in my lower abdomen that felt like it caused a sort of contraction. At this point, I was so scared and certain I wasn't dreaming or imagining it, and immediately woke my boyfriend up, terrified, saying I kept feeling like I'm being electrocuted. I told him everything, and he pet my head, told me it was okay, and as he later told me, spent some time praying. Neither of us religious, but he's a lot more spiritual than I am. At this time, I also noticed a weird feeling in my abdomen that hadn't been there before this last shock. I eventually had to pee, but was too scared to leave the tent alone, so I asked him to walk out with me. When I got out, you guys, I could barely walk. I was stumbling around and falling over as if it was totally shit-faced but we hadn't even had a sip of alcohol that day or that night. I'm also an experienced backpacker, so I don't think it would have been overworked muscles, and a weed gummy has never had any impact on my ability to walk. I stumbled my way to a rock to lean on and fell once or twice before managing to prop myself up to pee, then got back to the tent without much issue. Nothing weird happened after that, but the difficulty walking really made me feel like something strange had happened. I felt normal and fine the next day, apart from being thoroughly weirded out. This is going to be a long story. I recently found this subreddit through my mom, and after telling her my story, she pushed me to post it here, and also to email David Polides. I'm hoping to get some insight and new perspective from people with knowledge on this topic as to what exactly happened to my cousin and I. So, when I was 10, I was over at my cousin Gwen's house. She was also 10. It was a hot June day and about 9 a.m. when we decided to go play in the woods. Not abnormal for us. We loved being outside. For context, she lives down a private lane with seven other houses, all inhabited by elderly people. She was the only child, along with her older brother who lived down this lane. 
It's also a really historical area where a train used to come through. And although the tracks are gone, you can see in your yard where they would have been. Her house is also an old factory that soldiers used to stay at during the Civil War. We've had lots of creepy encounters inside that house, but that's a story for another day. Today is about those damn woods. The entrance to the woods is across from the road from her main house, like 20 feet from her driveway. No cars can get into the woods. That will be important later. We have played in these woods so many times, and it's an isolated section where if on a normal day, if you walk 20 minutes in any direction, you're going to hit the road, someone's yard, or a development of McMansions. We follow the usual path into the woods and come across the Y intersection. We had been to this part many times before. We've walked dogs here, went on walks with my aunt, played together, normal stuff. To the left, on the Y intersection, is a stream. You cross, and on the other side of the stream is the path that continues around a bend. To the right of the Y leads you deeper into the woods. We saw footprints of big boots in the mud across the stream and wanted to follow them, so we did. Gwen and I crossed the stream and come around the bend, as we have many times before. But this time, we see a gravel driveway leading up to an old cabin. There's an old woman sweeping the porch, and a man standing 20 feet from us next to an old pickup truck, like from the 50s. The man had a blonde buds cut, He's probably about six foot five and wearing a white wife beater and light blue crop denim shorts and large boots covered in mud. I will never forget his outfit. It was very unusual for me to see a man wearing shorts that short. This was like 2006 or 2007. The woman points at my cousin and I and the man turns around and starts chasing us. We run our way across the stream and then come to a stop at the Y. We didn't even look to see if the man was still chasing us. We felt surprisingly calm and happy for what just happened. Keep in mind, my cousin and I have talked about what happened so many times, and we always ask why we weren't scared about being chased. So, Gwen and I push forward and follow the right trail and go further into the woods. Marching on, the path in the woods turns from a wide, easy walkway to intricate pathways. I mean... It looked like something perfectly measured. The height of the grass, the picker bushes were all neatly kempt. The pathway was narrow. I remember at that point the air had this beautiful golden glow to it, and everything looked so crisp with drops of dew. And I felt so happy, and I was having the best time. I was calm. We found a box turtle on the pathway and carried him with us. This is where it gets really weird for me. And I actually get emotional when I tell this in person, because it's so weird to know that I saw this. The pathway turned into a hallway. I mean like a perfectly squared out hallway with a wall, a ceiling of vines and bark that were pressed together so tightly that you couldn't see through it. Yet, there was still light, a glow, a purple yet golden glow. It looked misty. And the grass was taller here, maybe a little above my ankle, and I remember it felt like silk touching my leg. The hallway opened up into a perfectly square room, once again with covered walls and ceiling and the perfect silky grass. The hallway we came in from was on the left, and there was another hallway leading out the opposite wall on the right, and on the right-hand side of the room was an old pickup truck. I remember it as red, Gwen remembers it as white. It was running. All the lights were on, all the doors were open, and the bed of the truck was also open. The bed of the truck had long wooden planks and black trash bags full of, well, I don't know what was in them. So, like any normal ten-year-old would, we climbed into the bed of the truck with the turtle and played there for a while. I remember watching the turtle scooting across the planks, and Gwen and I were laying on the trash bags as if they were bean bags. It is so odd for me to think that we did that. Both of us were anxious children. I'll just never forget the way that room felt and how it looked. And I didn't think it was off at the time. I mean, it was straight out of Alice in Wonderland or a Dr. Seuss book. Gwen and I get out of the truck with our turtle and exit the room on the other side. Neither of us really remember walking along the trails. Like, we don't remember what we talked about. 
We just remember the big things that happened that day. I do remember at this point we dropped our turtle friend off. The pathways had gone back to normal. Cropped grass, kempt bushes, the golden glow, and dew-covered shrubbery. We came across the wooden sign that is painted in black capital letters, Luke's Trail, and the arrow pointed further down the path. We both remember being really excited and saying things like, we have to find Luke. So we followed the trail, and all of a sudden, we were in a very open patch of woods, like a big circle surrounded by trees and shrubbery, but the earth we were standing on was just dirt, no grass. We had no idea what direction we even came from, and it finally hit us. Where the hell are we? How long have we been in the woods? It felt like everything was spinning, even though I wasn't moving, and everything got so loud, like the birds were screaming. I even heard what I thought were cars driving by, but I couldn't see a road. And then all of a sudden, it was dead silent. Gwen saw a giant bird-like creature fly out of the trees above us. She said it looked like a dinosaur. I didn't see it, but I did see its shadow. And after that, we don't remember anything. All of a sudden, we were walking out of the woods. The sun was setting, walking up to her mom's doorstep. We both reached to grab the door, and in that moment, we looked at each other and started freaking out, screaming. How did we come home? What the hell happened back there? As if all the odd events finally hit us. Like, that was really weird. And why didn't we find it weird? We walked inside crying. We tell my sister and her brother everything that happened through tears. They accused us of lying, of course. My sister believes me. She said she regrets not coming with us that day. Also, when we got back, it was 7 at night. We were gone for 10 hours. I'm a 24-year-old woman and an active hiker. And 20 minutes into every hike, I'm dying for water and a snack. I've gone back with Gwen so many times to find out what the hell happened. We have covered every square inch of that place and nothing. Not a single clue. The weird part? Later that summer back at my house, my sister and my other two cousins, Tyler and Mikey, were playing in the cornfield that surrounded my house. We rented in an extremely rural area and lived at a house at the bottom of a hill. And at the top was the family who we rented from. They were farmers and planted crops all around us. So, we had watched this corn grow. We're running through the cornfield, and all of a sudden we hit an open patch. In the middle of this open spot is an old pickup truck, running, with all the lights on and all the doors open. I don't remember if there was anything in the bed of the truck because I screamed, and we all ran home terrified. I mean, there was no way for that truck to have gotten in there unless a helicopter planted it there. There were no pathways for it to drive in from. So yeah, that's my story. I'd love to hear your input. Sorry, it was so long. I just wanted to be as detailed as I could. Personally, what I think happened was we went through a portal to another dimension, another reality, a spirit world. I don't know, but we went through a portal. I saw the other side. I know I did. And every day, I am so fortunate to have made my way back home. Back in the early 1990s, I was a kid, around 13 years at the time of this incident. And I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot, out in a very rural area in southeastern Arkansas. When I say very rural, I mean it was a series of networked dirt roads to get out to their house. The closest neighbors besides my aunt and uncle who lived about a quarter of a mile up the road was over a mile and a half away. This was very backwoods and isolated from most civilization. The closest town was a 10 mile trip. It's in the middle of farmland and mostly woods. They had lived in this house since my mother was a child and had both grown up just a ways down the road. Anyways, there was a general store roughly three to four miles down the network of dirt roads. 
This was your typical country general store ran by an old lady and her husband. And its only customers really consisted of old people who lived out there in bumfuck Egypt. One day, my grandmother asked me if I wanted to walk to the general store to get her some milk, eggs, and a few other miscellaneous items. So I told her I would. She gave me some money and I headed on my way. It was fairly early in the day and I had plenty of time to get back before dark, which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming about. Things can get mighty creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall. It's a darkness unlike most people who have lived in primarily in cities or towns have ever experienced. Me, being a 13 year old, had poor time management skills. I stopped at the bottom of a hill next to this small wooden bridge you have to cross and messed around at the creek catching crawdads and such and I kind of just messed around the whole way to the store. By the time I left the store, I realized it was quickly approaching dark. This was fall and darkness set upon the land pretty quick early in the day. I didn't want to be walking those lonely, secluded roads through the woods alone at dark, so I hurried as fast as I could, running and sprinting as much as possible. But it wasn't enough. By the time I had made it back to the bottom of the hill near the bridge, it was almost completely dark, and there was an eerie sort of glow brought about by a bright, nearly full moon that was rising. At the top of the hill, the road was perfectly straight and flat, with woods on the left side and a large field on the right. About half a mile up from the top of the hill is my grandparents' house, and you can see it from there. As I top the hill, I can see the faint glow of the lights at their house, and I feel a sense of relief because I was kind of freaking out a little bit, but knowing I was so close and could see the house offered a little bit of comfort. The field on the right was somewhat illuminated by the glow of the moon, and my eyes had adjusted to the darkness rather well at this point. As I walked up the road, I hear something from the left, behind me on the wooded side of the road. It sounded like leaves being rattled. I turn to look and see nothing at first. But then, as my eyes begin to focus, I see something in the ditch. A black, shadowy shape, slowly moving towards me. At first, I thought it was a dog, but then realized it was much too large to be a dog. And then, I realized it wasn't actually walking on four legs. It was crawling, like a person would. I stared for a moment, out of sheer confusement trying to figure out what I was seeing. And then, a jolt of fear shot through me as it dawned on me, that whatever this thing was, it had been trying to sneak up on me. At that exact moment, this thing stood upright out of the ditch on two legs like a person. It had the shape of a human, long arms, legs, and was proportioned as such. It stood roughly seven to eight feet in height, and was completely covered in black or maybe brown dark hair. Its face was dark in color, and I can't recall seeing much in the way of features due to it being night. It was no bear for certain, or any other kind of animal I've ever seen for that manner. I immediately dropped the bag of stuff I had been carrying, and bolted as fast as my legs could take me towards my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing slash guttural growling kind of sound behind me, and heard this thing's footsteps running behind me on the gravel as it gave chase. I did not turn around and was certain that it would grab me at any moment. I then heard it crash off into the woods and let out an earth-shattering and ungodly scream unlike anything I had ever heard before or since. I'm positive this thing could have easily caught me had it wanted to, but for some reason, it let me go. By the time I reached my grandparents, my heart felt as if it would explode from the combination of the adrenaline rush I had from being scared beyond any other type of fear that I had ever felt before or since and full-on sprinting as hard and as fast as possible for about a half straight mile. I flew into the house, and in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, I tried to explain to my grandparents what had just happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but did believe something had scared me and acted rather weird about the whole thing. She tried to convince me that it was just a dog or some other animal. The next morning, I woke up and found my grandpa sitting outside whittling wood underneath the shade tree in the front yard, as he often liked to do. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He was a very rational man, down to earth, and had grown up in and hunted that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of it, mapped it into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in those woods, what noise they made, where to find them, how to catch them, etc. 
I had only been hunting with him for a couple years, but had been going out into those woods with him since a pretty young age on walks and such. He had passed a lot of his knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what happened to me that night, and told him that I knew what I saw. It wasn't my overactive imagination. I wasn't making it up, and it definitely wasn't a dog. He knew that I wasn't just some dumb 13-year-old kid, and he said that I knew the things he'd taught me. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eyes, and said, I know what you saw. I've seen it before, too. There's things out in them woods that people just don't understand, and that a person ought not to go fooling with. I remember those words clearly to this day, because it gave me affirmation, but at the same time made me realize that whatever I had seen was very real in existence, and beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods, there are some cliffs, and at the bottom of those cliffs is a cave. He told me that the cave is where the creature lived. He had once stumbled upon it a long time ago when he was hunting. He said he was standing on the top of the cliff looking at it, when a creature fitting the same description emerged and began screaming wildly at him and throwing rocks. He said he took a shot at it, missed, and then this thing gave chase to him. But my grandpa was on top of the cliff, so in order to get to him, this thing had to go around a pretty good distance and then up, which he said it quickly began to do. So he hightailed it out of there in a hurry. He said the whole way back home, he felt as if it were being watched and kept hearing twigs snap behind him. And he was certain that it was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turned and looked back at the woods from where he'd came and saw it peeking out at him from behind a tree. Later that night, he said that he and my grandmother awoke in the early morning hours to large rocks being thrown at the house and ungodly howling noises from outside, and this thing trying to get into the house. He said he could hear it walking around on the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low, deep, garbled voice. But it didn't sound like a language, just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, the thing went back to throwing some more rocks and howling, so my grandpa grabbed his shotgun and fired it out the front door a few times into the wilderness in the direction of the howling and said he heard it run back into the woods. He didn't know if he'd hit it or not. He said that was the last that he'd ever seen or heard from it, but over the years, an occasional farmer's cow would be mutilated, or someone's hunting dog would go unexplainably missing, or someone would have a story about some strange creature that they'd seen. He also said it scared my grandmother beyond words, and she absolutely has refused to ever talk about it or even acknowledge that it happened, which explains her acting weird about it when I told her what happened to me. I know it's a pretty far-fetched story, and you can believe it or not, it makes no difference to me. I know what I saw, and my grandpa knew what I saw, and neither of us had ever felt the need to convince anyone else of it. In fact, until today, I've never actually spoken of it to anyone other than my grandpa, and he passed away around 10 years ago. Hey everyone, I'm relatively new to this sub, but very recently, I had an experience which could be linked to the missing 411 topic. I probably wouldn't share it, as it's really nothing spectacular and obviously not happening in the United States, but I've read about the German connection, and somehow caught my interest, and made me decide to share it with you. Maybe you can tell me if this is something that might fit into this sub or not. First of all, I have to make clear that I lived my first 20 years of life on the countryside of southwest Germany, near the French border, basically in the middle of the Black Forest. That means that I literally grew up in the woods, and I know the local forest very well. I've played there with friends as a little kid, spent hours over hours hiking, pick up mushrooms with my dad, or took the dog out for long walks. I even crossed the paths as a teenager drunk on my way home from parties. Never in my life have I felt scared or uncomfortable being there. Neither have I heard of any disappeared person there or anywhere else in Germany. Fast forward to 
the 35-year-old me as a father of two girls, now living near one of the biggest cities in northwest of Germany. I went for a little walk in the late afternoon with my daughters in the near forest. As it's near the city, it's quite visited, as it's not very unspoilt with wide artificial trails, and you usually meet a lot of people there enjoying the nature as a distraction from the city life, especially now amid the pandemic. When we arrived there, it was already late, but far away from dusk time. I had my stroller with me and a little kid bike for the older one, and we had been a mile away from the parking area at the most. We've passed a few other people when we were all alone all of a sudden. I can't remember if it was quiet or if I heard any sounds like birds, but almost instantly I felt so intimidated and in danger like never before. I tried to cool down and not try to panic in front of my children, but the fact that I felt exposed there alone with them made me really uncomfortable. I took my older one on my arm and tried to manage our way back to the parking lot as fast as I could. I constantly looked to the side in expectation of anything jumping out at us. It was in the time when it became really dark, but not in the time that I expected it to change. By that, I mean it became pitch black in like two minutes. This is almost something that I've never seen before. I can only assume that black clouds started to cover the sky rapidly, but that wouldn't explain the instant darkness. The moment we entered the parking area, I felt relieved and had time to breathe. I packed the car sat the kids in the seats and drove home. I haven't been at that exact point yet, but I don't feel very keen to go back there again either. Before you think I had a panic attack, no, this was completely different. And I have had panic attacks before in my life. But well, as I haven't heard any voices or felt somehow attracted to going deeper in the woods, it's very unspectacular, as I mentioned from the beginning. Decades ago, my wife and I stopped at a state park in South Texas. It wasn't far away from State Highway 35 or I-59. Too long ago to remember, probably between Victoria and Corpus Christi. My wife stayed at the car getting our lunch ready, and I walked down a small creek enjoying nature. As I walked, the creek was on my left and the brush line was on my right. I stopped and stood there for a minute, with my back to the brush line, just watching the water flow by, when suddenly... I heard a loud snort behind me. Startled, I whipped around expecting to see that a cow or a horse had quietly meandered up right behind me. But there was nothing there. Whatever made that snorting sound had to have been big. It was loud, but I was too ignorant to have been scared. Instead, I just walked back to our car. I didn't even tell my wife about it. And I've wondered about it ever since. Hey everyone, long time skeptic here, first time poster. Not sure what to think about all this. Yesterday I was hiking off a trail on top of a steep ridge that I had to take an absolute abandoned slash possible animal trail to get to and discovered a leather boot. It had probably been there for a while based on how the leather had curled, as in at least a few months or maybe years. It was a nice looking boot otherwise, kind of like an Iron Ranger but with tread. Normally, I'd think someone dropped their gear, that sucks, and put it by a trail sign for someone to find. But it's very difficult to get up to this ridge even with the hiking boots on. I can't imagine hiking down barefoot. The trail is super steep, loose, unmaintained, overgrown, and not on any maps. It's in a canyon very close to a major city, and you can see the city from the top. But the plant growth is very thick, and it gets snow six months out of the year. The boot looked like it was deliberately placed under a small tree, i.e. not like it fell there. And, well, it's a boot. It's not the kind of thing to normally fall off a pack. It gave me a strange feeling and 
watching Mr. Ballin on YouTube talk about the missing 411 cases after I got home didn't help. The canyon slash ridge are on the USFS land, but are maintained by a private contractor. I wouldn't even know who to contact, or if I even should contact anyone. People do go missing here. We have a lot of mountain lions and black bears. I hike with my dog, a skilled hunting dog, and she's alerted me a few times when we've been followed by something. I frequently see signs of mountain lion kills, particularly in the spring after the snow melts and the trails reopen. In two trees in particular, I've seen some strange stuff though. Deer legs impaled on the main trunk at head height, but the trees are 15 feet tall. On my hike yesterday, I saw USFS trail slash game cams mounted to two of the trees, so I know that I'm not the only person with questions. What would you do in this situation? When I was a kid, maybe from ages 6 to 10, I used to spend the summer with my grandparents' sister in rural Tennessee. I called her Auntie John. Most of my family live in rural areas, but Auntie John's old place was like an hour from the nearest grocery store, on an unpaved road. Well, water, you get the picture. She taught me a lot about the woods. Fishing, catching crawdads, how to cook a chicken of the woods, or as other people would call it, a morel mushroom. She passed in 2012, but whenever I do these things, I think of her. My mom isn't the best, and my auntie was kind of my female role model. She wasn't really a religious person, but I remember some superstitions that she passed on to me. One was that you should never give your real name to a stranger who asks. You need to give a nickname. Like if my name were Catherine, I'd say it was Katie. Two. There are certain roads in her area that you should never walk on at night because there are entities who will steal your breath. Three, you should have at least the length of two persons lying down, so maybe 10 to 12 feet between your house and any trees on your property. Four, and this one is the most relevant to my story, never sleep with a door open. And if you have the window open, put some acorns on the windowsill. Okay, whatever. Now onto the story that I came to share. My cousin Jace was visiting, and we told my auntie we wanted to sleep in one of the outbuildings. It was basically like a shed. We took our blankets and stuff out there. My cousin's Pokemon cards, some snacks. We probably fell asleep around midnight, and we forgot to shut the door. I woke up in the pitch dark. I was itchy from mosquito bites, so I thought that was why I woke up. But then I heard my cousin breathing weird, and he grabbed my wrist. I felt something walk into the shed even though I couldn't see or hear it. It was like a gut feeling. There was a lot of old dust and spider webs on the ceiling, and suddenly, it crumbled down onto our blankets, like something had brushed the ceiling. I was about to piss myself, but Jace grabbed his lighter that we'd been using with a citronella candle and lit it. He said really loudly, this is our place, go away. Once he lit the lighter, we could see that nobody was there but us. Also, the door wasn't completely open, so only a very thin, small person could have slid through without creaking the hinges. We didn't sleep at all after that, and we locked the door tight. We didn't tell Auntie John what happened, because we didn't want to get our asses torn. So that's my story. I'm not sure what happened, but it was crazy. I talked to Jace about it a few years ago, and his memory is the same, except he was awoken by me laughing in my sleep. Then the weird stuff started happening. I do think something supernatural happened. An animal couldn't reach the ceiling to knock the dust down. And a person couldn't get through the door without making noise. Anyone have any thoughts? Just a quick note, below is the experience I had two days ago. 
I'm going back to the site right now. So if I disappear, people will have the details. I was in the woods trying to record footage for my channel on YouTube, Doug Shoe Bushcraft. I got some work done, but there were prop planes and helicopters flying overhead. I didn't want a lot of that in the audio, because it can ruin the relaxing atmosphere. So in the late afternoon, I started hiking back. I made it to a logging road near my truck. There was a beautiful spot by a creek, so I stopped to video record. I heard and felt stomping, and something larger than a moose. I didn't see anything stomping. I'm saying that it sounded and felt that way, like when an angry moose stomps. But this was something heavier. But what could be heavier than a moose? It seems impossible for New Hampshire. The camera was acting up. When I got back home and played back the video footage, there was weird static on it. I thought I might have some video footage of the creek. I wasn't sure, but in any case, I was giving up on it. I started walking back to my truck, which wasn't far from there. I heard more stomping. Then I heard crashing. Something apparently breaking branches or saplings. I started video recording, saying something was in there. I heard a helicopter approaching. It flew right over the spot of the stomping and crashing and directly over me. Then I hear a lot of crashing, like something huge running fast right towards me. I start walking backward, then turn and run to my truck. I get into the truck, make a U-turn, and drive away as fast as I thought I could without getting stuck or breaking my truck. I couldn't see anything following me. Playing back the video, I can't hear the stomping. That was expected. I also couldn't hear the crashing. I thought I'd be able to, but it was some distance away over the lip of a small ridge. I don't know if the audio can be enhanced or not. I'm going back now. There are marshy and muddy areas there. I'm hoping for footprints. I'll see if there is any other evidence. This didn't feel natural. I don't know how to explain it. I believe there are spiritual creatures that can cause fear and other powerful emotions. I think that's what this was. But we'll see. Update. I walked in, and over the lip of the ridge, there were hundreds of saplings that had been knocked down. Some old and some new breaks. I found a tree that had been knocked down over recently. I can know this because it had pinned down saplings with green leaves. Near that was a quartz crystal boulder dug out of the ground, and a smaller quartz crystal rock. There were well-defined trails stomped down. The effect of all those saplings being knocked down made for a very open woods for New Hampshire. In most wild areas, there's a lot of brush. I heard stomping in another area. I walked up on a ridge, continuing in the direction from which I had heard noise two days ago. This time, the noise was in the opposite direction, down in a marsh. The trip was cut short by a storm that came out of nowhere. Rain, high winds, and felt like a thunderstorm was coming in. I noted trees which looked like they had been hit by lightning. I decided it was too dangerous and headed back. My partner and I are avid hikers. Last July, we went on a trip and decided to camp at this spot we love, just west of Shenandoah. It's quiet, off the beaten path, and offers absolutely spectacular views of both Shenandoah and portions of George Washington National Forest to the west. The first day and evening of the trip itself were nice and uneventful, though we didn't sleep super well because of the humidity. The next morning, we decided to go for a hike in a portion of Jefferson Forest we'd never been to before. It's comprised of ATV trails and about a dozen campsites, but has a trail that leads to an old fire tower we'd always wanted to check out. It was about a 45 minute drive from our campsite, mostly on back roads. When we got there, the first thing that stuck out to us was how empty the campsites were. We actually didn't camp there the night before because we'd heard that the site is usually packed and we knew we wouldn't arrive early enough in the weekend to get a spot. There were only two spots taken, and one was a desecrated tent and a bunch of garbage. It looked like someone had been in there for a while, but it was deserted when we arrived, and the other 
there was a young woman, I'm guessing in her late teens, setting up a small backpacking tent. There was a truck and one other smaller car in the parking area. We parked and started getting our gear together, and the woman approached us to ask if we knew where the trailhead was. I told her that we'd read that it branched off about 100 yards into one of the ATV tracks, but we weren't 100% sure which. Since I was getting such weird vibes from the place, I kind of hoped she'd stick around and go with us to find it, but she just thanked us and took off in the general direction of the trail. We set off and walked up and down a few of the ATV trails until we found the walking path. We saw two ATVs shoot by us at one point, but otherwise didn't encounter anyone else including the woman from earlier. It took us about an hour to get to the top of the mountain where the fire tower was. It's an old metal structure, and you have to climb a narrow set of stairs to get to the top of it. We got up, looked around, took some pictures, and started heading down. Honestly, the view was kind of a letdown. About halfway down, very suddenly, everything stopped. The birds, the bugs, it was dead silent. And I don't know quite how to put it this into words, but it felt like the ancientness of the forest was contorting and crushing us. I felt trapped and cornered in spite of the expanse around us. My partner and I looked at each other and wordlessly started to book it out of there. We started back to the car, but the feeling only followed us. As we were rounding one of the switchbacks, we heard this unearthly shriek, like a cross between a metal on metal and a choir screaming off key and we saw something. I just got a glimpse of it before we blacked out. I don't know how to describe it other than it looked huge, despite clearly not taking up much physical space, and moved in writhes and flashes. It didn't have a collar. It just felt like evil and emptiness. I probably only perceived it for half a second before my memory just completely gave way. When we came to, we were sitting in the car, and two hours had passed double the length of time that it took us to get up there. I don't know if we lost consciousness or just somehow blocked those hours out. I later learned the exact same thing happened to my partner. Both of the cars were next to us in the parking lot, and there were still just the two tents at the campsite. The woman wasn't in hers, and it looked exactly the same as she'd left it. I think about her all the time, and have spent a ton of time trying to figure out if someone went missing around the time of our trip. It took a few months for my partner and I to talk about that day. Some of the stories I've seen posted on this sub have made me so much less alone. We still love to hike, but honestly haven't been able to in the Appalachian Forest since this happened. I'm curious if others have had other experiences like this one. I am on a volunteer search and rescue team in Montana. I wanted to write this to talk about a few missing person cases that I have personally helped with the search and rescue operations. I have lived in the Bitterroot Valley my entire life and have spent a large part of it exploring our local forest lands. We often have people go missing and most of the time we end up finding them. But there are a few cases that stick out in my mind as odd. The first of these cases is Jim Mann. Mann was heading to Bozeman, Montana to meet up with a friend. Only he never arrived. Mann was known to frequent the Como Lake and painted Rock's Reservoir areas quite frequently, so he spent a lot of time searching those areas, as we suspected he might have been there before disappearing. I personally spent most of my time around the Painted Rocks area helping with the search. Both areas have bodies of water with small creeks and also many rock slides surrounding them. The weirdest part about this is even with the scale we searched and the amount of areas we searched, we never found a single thing. Man had left his phone in his home and simply disappeared. As far as I know, there are still zero leads on what might have happened to him. The second case I can think of also happened in the Bitterroot Valley. I'm gonna leave the names out of this one because I respect the family's privacy they have asked for as the case has officially been ruled a suicide, even though his body was never located. 
I personally have met this individual as he would often come to my grocery store that I worked part-time at. Essentially, he went out into the woods in late October to do some hunting. After night had passed, the family reported him missing as they were worried because he did have some mobility issues. After about three days of searching, we had found nothing at all, and finally, word came down that they had found his vehicle. The odd thing about this is that the vehicle was found parked in a pullout along the road and was sitting there with its door wide open. We eventually learned that it sat there running until it eventually completely ran out of gas. Around a day or two later, his hunting rifle was found, with the spent casing still loaded in the chamber, meaning that his rifle had been fired. Forensics took samples of the dirt to look for blood. The immediate conclusion was that he had committed suicide, and his body was dragged off by an animal. This is also the official story that they eventually went with. The biggest problem with this story is that there was never any blood found in the soil around the area his rifle was found. The family accepted that it was a suicide, even though they alleged that he had no mental health issues and never indicated that he was suicidal. Either way, this is one of those few search and rescue operations I have been a part of that really left me wondering what really happened. I hope you all enjoyed my personal experiences. Please keep in mind that I never officially worked for any actual agencies and was simply a volunteer on these incidents. Just remember to be safe when you go out exploring, and to always prepare for the worst case scenario. A few years ago, I was on a trail run after a good snow. I decided to run in the opposite direction than I usually go, which took me to a section of the trail that I'd never seen before. The trail runs along a river, through a small yet busy suburban town, through farmland, and through woods. Sometimes, the trail snakes up to the top of the levee, and then back down towards the river. It's beautiful. On this section, the trail runs directly along the river at the base of the levee, then turns left and up onto the levee above the farmland, and then it swerves right and down into some woods with tons of skinny trees before it swerves left and follows along the river again. While the trees are packed in, you can pretty much see all the way through them when you're actually standing there inside the woods. There was a small clearing at the spot where the trail starts to bend left, with a random bench facing the river. This struck me as beautiful, so I stopped for a few minutes to admire the view and snapped a picture before running on. On my way back, I glanced at the spot again and decided I wanted to take a picture of this spot every season. I made the trek in the spring, a few times in the summer, and then twice in the fall. I wasn't happy with the original fall picture, so I went back a week later when the leaf collars looked a little better. The second fall trip was the last time that I've ever gone. Everything was normal as I ran up to the clearing and pulled out my phone near the bench. I tried to frame the picture so that it would be the same shot, and then everything felt wrong. My heart started pounding. It was the worst fear I've ever felt. I started fumbling around with my phone trying to put it back in my armband. It felt like someone was in the woods, behind me, just watching me. But they weren't just watching me. I was being sized up, thought about, possibly chosen. It was dangerous. It felt like whoever was watching me wanted to hurt me. I turned around and scanned the entire area surrounding me, waiting to see some drug-addicted murderer pop out of some camouflaged area. Like I said, you could see clear through the trees, and the trees are skinny, so anything bigger than a squirrel would easily be seen. No one was there. In fact, everything was dead quiet. I stood there, staring and scanning, waiting to see anything, because my feeling felt so strong. I don't know why, but I strongly felt that if I just booked it, this person or thing would be triggered, but I needed to leave right then. I tried to swallow every ounce of terror that I felt, pretend like everything was normal, and I ran at a medium pace back towards the levee. Once I was in the open on the levee, I took off. 
But here's the weirder part. I felt like I wasn't out of danger yet. My spine kept tingling like something was behind me, and I needed to keep pushing forward as fast as I could. I know this sounds crazy, but I didn't feel like it was a person anymore, and it could pop up at any moment and snatch me. I kept thinking it wanted to snatch me. It wasn't until I was another two miles away that I felt like I was out of its zone and I was safe. It took me a long time to calm down after I got in my car and went home, and I truly felt like I was in real danger. I know this might seem stupid, but this sound bugs me since the day that I've heard it back in May. I can swear that I've never heard anything like this before. So I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve since it's not like a park. It's wild and no human activity is allowed except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month because that's the habitat of a very rare bird. I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog, but still, it was a super sunny day and the place is not dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river, and if you avoid to get super close, you'll have zero problems with it. Everything was great until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear very strange noises coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now. It was super weird since I've read on the infos of the reserves that whenever they make monitoring operations or anything else, they deny access. Plus, I'm pretty sure that I was the only one person there. This place has only one entrance, and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. Zero cars except for mine, and not a soul out there that I saw. And the closest structure is around 25 kilometers away. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Nothing ever happened like this before. My dog, a lab, heard many noises, even louder, but never got this nervous. So, the sound. I'll try to make you understand how it was. This is the best way I can describe it. Like a loud metallic bang. Like when you hit a large metallic can with a stick immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing to start. Kind of like an old tractor, to give you an idea. It occurred three to four times per minute and lasted seven or eight seconds at a time. This noise made me and my dog very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And I've heard, in my life, much scarier sounds, like thunder striking the ground very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out, so I decided to pack everything up and head back to the car to leave the area ASAP. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close, no matter how far I parked my car. Around an hour of hike from the spot that I started to hear that noise, from the spot to the car, it always sounded at the exact same distance, like it was following us maintaining 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired too, as soon as I calmed down and barely managed to drive home, trying my best not to fall asleep. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off, so I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what the hell was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask, and the reserves office at the entrance was closed that day. I recorded it and tried to make it listen to my dad, brother, friends. Sadly, I've lost the file since I changed my phone a pair of weeks ago and forgot to make a backup copy of the sound. And one, they were super uneasy while hearing it. Two, nobody ever figured out what was producing that noise. Plus, as said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. May the things be connected? What do you think? Thank you in advance.
the year was 2015, and I had gone camping with three friends. This was like the third time of us ever camping together, and we were at a pay-to-stay campground. We even were staying in a tiny cabin by a big lake, so it wasn't out in the wild. Now back then, I used to get panic attacks sometimes for no reason, and for some reason, despite my immense love for nature, ever since my first camping trip, I would often get a panic attack when camping. I don't know why. Well, that night, I had one, and it was pretty severe to the point where I'd feel like I couldn't breathe if I stayed in the cabin, but I would get scared if I stayed outside. So, I had a lot of back and forth, and my poor friends put up with me. At one point, I had stepped outside with one of them, my significant other at the time, and I was trying to calm down, and also wondering where I could pee. My significant other had a flashlight, and was leading me to a spot in the dirt at the edge of the trees between our two parked cars. He reasoned it was a good distance from the cabin, and yet not in the middle of the woods where some critter would catch me with my pants down. So I agreed. That's when I saw it. I can still remember. I stepped past the first car, and looked between the cars toward the edge of the woods, between the candles in the cabin, and the flashlight. Nearly, but not directly upon the spot where I saw this. I saw something. A creature. It was so strange because it was silent. The creature had the general body shape of a dog, but its colors and features were more like a hyena, kind of gray and dark splotches. It stood perfectly still, peeking out behind the front of the car, so I only saw its torso and head and front legs. The thing I'll never forget was its face. It looked like it was frozen in time with its jaw wide open and revealing sharp, bright teeth. Its eyes were looking right at me, but its nose wasn't wrinkled like a snarl, and there was no growling, no sound. It was the oddest thing, and it sent an instant, deep ball of dread down into my core. After I froze for a long moment, I grabbed my significant other's arm and urgently whispered for him to go back to the cabin and pulled him back. Also, the eyes were glowing, probably reflecting the light. We got in the cabin. The other two friends were asleep, and my significant other didn't see it at all, I don't think. I couldn't sleep at all that night. With my panic attack, and now that sight, I eventually went to sleep in the car. Somehow, that felt safer. I'll try to draw what I saw soon. It wasn't particularly large, but it was so silent and so still, almost like it wasn't breathing. But it was real, and it was there. And somehow, I knew there was something horribly wrong about it. Today I walked my usual route with my dog through some trails in my town. The trails are public, but cut through private property in some areas. This property is owned by an old landlord of mine, and they allow people to explore the area off trail. That being said, I don't usually go off trail, but today I was looking for a down prime branches after Saturday's high winds. I cut through some different scrub woods type areas, and all was normal. At one point, the trail forks. I looked to the left side and went off to the right to check down for pine trees, while more or less making a straight line to the trail that went right at the fork. I had let my dog off leash while we cut down through this area. He stays with an eyesight and wears a bell on his harness. Halfway through, I could no longer hear him, and the trees all of a sudden became thick enough that I could no longer see him either, even though I was sure he was just off to my right. When I turned and faced where I thought he was, it was as if the trees separated and a path parted. It wasn't like a deer or beaver trail where brush was pushed aside. There was no undergrowth, just a seemingly straight path a few feet wide, extending as far as I could see. I got this tunnel vision sensation as I looked down the path. It was as if something wanted me to follow it. I quickly looked away and hurried forward knowing the trail should be right in front of me. Even though I made it back to the trail within a couple minutes, it still seemed as if it took longer than it should have. I had thought I could see the clearing off the trail, 
no more than 15 yards or so ahead. When I got back to the trail, I felt very dizzy and disoriented, like I was in this brain fog that took a bit to shake. My dog came out of the woods a few moments after I did, seemingly unfazed. I felt better after five minutes of continuing down the trail and getting to a more open area. Maybe it was nothing, but I won't be going off trail again in that spot. Also, I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't on an intense hike or anything. Just flat snowmobile walking trails right down the street from my house. Not a large area at all. It was on and off trail the whole time, checking around trees and then going back without issue. It was just in that one spot that I crossed through the woods from one trail to the other, which should have only taken two to three minutes to get to the other side, that things got a little weird. Not wandering through the deep woods or anything. I love reading stories on this sub and I'm glad that I finally had an experience worthy enough to share. This true situation happened this winter. I do live in Europe, in a place with a lot of mountains, and here we do not have many people disappearing, because this is a considerate and very safe place. No serial killers and no big predators beside foxes and wolves. It was 3 a.m. and I was working late, when I watched outside and there was an amazing sky, full moon, not cold, and I love stargazing. So without any preparation, I took my dog, put him in the car, drove up 45 minutes into the mountain route. Then, I parked the car and walked another 20 plus minutes up. All this with a sweater and flip-flops and shorts. Moreover, once I arrived at the parking spot, I noticed I forgot my phone at home, but I did not turn back. I just left the car and started hiking in the middle of the night. The mood was very relaxed and Molly, my dog, was excited of this strange walk, sniffing all around mindlessly and I was amazed by the sky, totally blown away by the constellations and the moon. It was fantastic. I was just walking, staring at the sky. Until that moment, I fell under a spell. Then something in the small group of trees in my direct line of sight spooked me. I saw a light turning on and off rapidly, almost as if someone had accidentally turned on their phone screen. In that moment, the spell broke, and I have a vivid memory of when I felt cold from the wind something I didn't even notice. Then, the fear started crawling down my spine, and the adrenaline kicked in. I took my dog, shortened the leash, and rushed back to the car. My brain went in flight or fight mode, and I was scanning with my eyes that group of trees. While I was jumping down that mountain, I could feel something bad was there. I had no idea what, but I could just feel it. I didn't feel pain to the feet or anything else. I was just rushing my way down. I arrived back at my car, opened the driver's seat, and threw my dog into it. I didn't even wait until he was off the seat when I jumped in and locked the cars. I pressed the start button, moved my dog so I could put my seatbelt on, and I was ready to go. But the new Toyota RAV4 wouldn't start immediately. The system needed to boot. In that moment, I had a brief window of time to consider my actions and the situation. I felt secure because I was in my car. I start to wonder if maybe I was just overreacting, and by the time I went to press the accelerator to go away, the parking signal on my left side flashed yellow, indicating that there was something getting closer, and I instinctively moved my head to the center console and didn't press the accelerator further while the parking sound started beeping, and the camera automatically turned on with 360 degree view. And there it was when I see this figure moving towards my car. In total panic, I pressed the accelerator, and thanks to the hybrid system, the electric vehicle delivered immediate power, and I was flying out of that parking spot in no time. For everyone that is listening right now, I want you to know 
that the story that we are about to read is a part two to the previous story. Here we go. A few months ago, I wrote about what happened to me one night. And today, I'm going to tell you what happened to me and my girlfriend in the same spot a few months after I told you that event. So, after telling my girlfriend about me writing the previous post, she was quite dismissive of the event, telling me that I might have overreacted, and she's not too sure about the whole story. A few weeks later, she came to visit me in town, and as usual, we went to walk the dog, and I took her to my favorite spot. I want to state that after that night, I've been there every other day, and in this same time, nothing has happened that's even remotely weird. We arrive at the parking spot at about 18-ish, while the sun is still shining high. The cars are passing by, and overall, it's a calm and relaxed evening. I was not even thinking about that episode, because we didn't talk about it anymore in any shape or form. We were just enjoying the sweet, warm weather of an early summer evening, and felt like nothing could break that amazing sunny evening. From the parking spot, there are several trails that you can walk, but few of them are more a dirt road between the trees. Because the sun was still high and it was hot outside, we preferred the trail that goes between the trees, rather than the one that I usually walk that is exposed to the sun. At five minutes in, we noticed a car parked near the path. It was not on the path, but parked in a very small area free from trees, which made the car almost invisible if not in proximity of it. But that scene is not unusual. There are a lot of park rangers caring of the place, so I was not immediately surprised. I just noticed that it had a plate from out of state, and it was a minivan with tinted windows. We approached the vehicle, and a man sitting just outside the van was reading a newspaper, and very smiley waved at us, to which I did reply in a friendly way. Nothing was shaking my inner peace. Perfect day, perfect evening. It was not until about ten minutes later that my head starts to work upon the oddities. I started to have chills but I did not want to frighten my girlfriend because it was a nice walk. It was evening. There was the sun and the street is not that far from there, so I didn't say a word. After a while, my girlfriend turned to me and asked me pretty straight, is there another way to go back to the car? And I replied, not without having to hike two hours in a circle. And then I asked her, why? She told me that the guy was very creepy in her opinion and she felt that something was off, especially the tinted windows, and she kind of joked, maybe he has some dead women in there, and now he's going to kill us. I laughed it off, dismissing the hypothesis, but what I was thinking was an out-of-state vehicle wouldn't know about that spot. He would have just parked in the very empty parking lot where my car was, because you have to know that down that dirty road there is a small spot between the trees. How in the world would anyone coming from out of town much less out of state, drive a car into a parking lot, go over it, drive on a dirt road and then park there, just to read your newspaper outside of your minivan with tinted windows. Am I tripping or is this not normal? But what I said to her was, that's normal. He might just be resting there while traveling. The walk back was silent. I was just trying to rationalize everything and I honestly was expecting something to happen. Lucky for us, nothing happened. We passed him again. He waved at us. We walked by and then around the corner. My girlfriend sprinted like I never saw before. Now, I'm not sure what is going on here, but what the hell? First, the timing was almost perfect. Second, that was extremely weird. And before I wrote this, I took my time to think it through if I was PTSDing or something was off. We thought about calling the police, but it felt weird to do so. But now, I feel not in peace with my decisions. Like, I should have saved the minivan plate and just texted the police to check on him. My girlfriend actually memorized part of the plate, but she didn't tell me until we really discussed it later on. On one side, I feel like we overreacted, but on the other side, it could be that there was really someone there in that minivan and we just passed by. I 
I had a strange experience as a child that I never thought much of until I discovered this subreddit. This happened in Kittany State Park in northern New Jersey. I don't believe that area is connected to any missing 411 cases, but I still felt that this story was worth mentioning. I grew up in northern New Jersey and had been to KSP countless times with my family for kayaking, biking, fishing, and hiking. Nothing else strange ever happened aside from this one experience. Some family members were visiting from out of state, and we decided to go hike through the state park trails. It was me, my mom, my sister, my aunt, and two of my cousins. I was around nine or ten at the time. I ventured off the trail a bit to search for salamanders under the rocks, and everyone else continued on the trail just ahead of me. This area wasn't densely wooded at all, and I could clearly see the trail at all times. I was bending down looking at something with my back towards the group, and suddenly, when I stood up to rejoin them, I felt like I was in a dream. It was such a weird feeling. The best I can describe it is, it felt like I no longer existed in this reality, like my feet weren't touching the ground, and everything went silent around me. I had no clue what to make of this, but I didn't feel afraid at all. I made my way back to the trail, and once I did, I could see the group up ahead of me, and the feeling completely disappeared, and everything was normal again. This memory stuck with me through my whole life, and I've never been able to come up with any reasonable explanation for it. I may seem out of my mind. I feel like I am. The first night I heard it was the end of the summer of 2019. I was building my own art studio in the back of this old building. One night, I stepped out onto the back deck to clean up. I was staring off into the woods that ran right up next to the stairs leading up to my studio. I heard something let loose, this immense, deep howling off in the distance. It had such a blood-curdling effect on the air around me that it gave me goosebumps and raised every hair on my body. And shortly after, it went silent. I heard all the dogs in a one or two mile radius barking, yipping and howling in the direction of that roar slash howl. There's no way it was a wolf or any large cat. I've heard videos and sound bites of wild cats and mountain cats making those demonic type sounds. And that wasn't this. This was a roar of a human animal mix. I could hear it in its voice. The area of Ohio I'm in isn't a place where you'd see any large cat or let alone hear one. My first thought was, that's the Wendigo coming to get me. And I don't know why that popped into my head like that. And a countless other number of things that have been happening more and more. Almost like intuition or something in my head. Four weeks prior to the weirdest shit I've ever experienced. I was approached by a man about commissioning three art pieces of something I wasn't familiar with at all. Wendigos. More specifically, a wartime Wendigo, where it's this huge thousand foot tall creature, taller than any building or skyscraper, and it's made out of all of us, body parts sticking out all over it, a face here and there. It was supposed to represent all of our greed, an insatiable desire or rump for more. Sadly, I didn't have the time to work on this piece, so I passed. But it started reminding me of my own monster that's been following me my whole life. I made some drawings of a dream slash night terror I had a week before this man approached me to turn us into the Wendigo. In my dream, it was a tall, emaciated creature with animal-like body features, legs and human-like arms crouching in my kitchen, like a dog would sit looking in my cabinets. What the hell are you doing, dude? I asked it. Chill the fuck out. I'm looking for some chips or something. I'm starving, it replied. I sat up quickly and threw the blanket off of me because I didn't want to say that out loud. It turned to look at me, and the way it looked was indescribable. But I took in every detail I could. It had large black holes where the eyes were supposed to be, and just a jagged slit across the lower side of its face that represented a mouth, no lips, and thousands of rows of jagged teeth curled around its gums with a long tongue sliding out between them. 
It let out a gurgled, squelching scream. Then all of a sudden, black, smoky tendrils shot out where its hair was supposed to be on its head, lingered for a second, and sucked back in towards its body. Then boom, it vanished. I made drawings of it as soon as I woke up, and was trying to put pieces together as to why it was in our kitchen. And the very hair on my body stood on end, because I had an unanswered email still about commissioning some artwork based on it. Fast forward to June 2020. Coronavirus has taken over the world, and I'm sure that I've lost my mind. I forgot all about it, and I'm hanging out with a friend at 3 a.m. after months of not seeing or talking to anyone. We went out to White Castle for a quick bite. She walks out first and hits the bottom step. As I'm walking out and locking the door, I hear something breaking tree limbs, crashing through them. Not fast, but slow, and definitely noticeable. And it was coming up from high, and gradually getting louder as it neared us and as it got lower. It reminded me of an orangutan, or a gorilla the way that it swung from each branch, and I could hear its hands gripping each one and snapping smaller limbs in its way. It was coming in our direction. I tried to shake it off, telling myself I'm crazy until she turned around quick and was looking up high in the trees. She asked me, Do you hear that? I turned white and had felt the air get heavier from the fear that was emaciating from this thing. As I came down the stairs, she's staring into the trees looking upwards. I glanced and I saw branches moving. I yelled at her to get out of here quick pulling her towards the direction of the car. We turned our backs to the woods. Then, we heard a loud thwack, landing just behind me, and all the hairs on my body stood straight up. I felt like it had a log, or a large thick branch in its hand, and smacked the ground with it. I stood, paralyzed with fear. The air was thicker, and different when whatever it was landed directly behind me. I could feel the air of the force of it, and it brought tears to my eyes. It was the weirdest feeling to have ever come over me, and I feel like it's crushing every inch of my body without even touching me, and to hurt so bad. It brought tears to my eyes and made me shake uncontrollably, and the fear it made me feel was too much to bear. Hands down, one of the scariest moments I've ever encountered. I couldn't shake it, so we went to White Castle, and we're both shook down to our core. I'm in disbelief of what we just witnessed. We came back and turned the brights on in our car and let them light up the woods for a good 20 minutes before we felt it was safe to go back inside. The only weapon that I had in sight was a golf club. She told me she saw it, high in the trees, and that it looked almost like an owl-like creature with weird features. But later on, she told me a story about when she was a teenager. She thought she was going to get taken off the back of a motorcycle by a huge owl swooping down towards her, and I told a friend about this a few months later and somehow remembered whatever these things are. They feed off of fear. I don't know where I remember this from, or why these thoughts randomly popped into my head. It's almost like something else is telling me. Since then, there's been a whole lot of weird shit that's been going on. I've put a lot of the pieces together in this story so far, and a few weeks later, Something else happened at a friend's house one night we were playing music. It's something that has made me vow to never step foot in the woods anywhere ever again. I'll save that part of the story for another time. I just wanted some feedback on this story as I've been talking to countless others about their experiences with the woods where they live, and I've read so many posts on here. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories. It's really helped me put this on here. About seven years ago, I went lightweight camping with a friend in a national forest that we were very familiar with. It was night, camp was set, and we were at a camp around the fire. Unexpectedly, it started raining, like Vietnam raining, which was very odd as the whole weekend there was no rain forecast at all. Anyway, we decide to pack up and head back to the truck with this roughly hour or so hike. The rain starts getting worse and fog started to settle. 
That was alarming to me because we were on a ridge and fog usually settles in the valleys, at least in my experience. So my friend and I are pretty creeped out by it. Now I know on the trail there is a very mild split where you can go back to the parking area or do a separate trail that goes on a few miles to an equestrian trail. I've been on both several times. Well, we mixed up in the inclement weather and took the latter. We hiked for 30 minutes or so and the rain stopped. It didn't slow or drizzle, just stopped. Hell, even the trail looked like there was hardly any rain on it. It was still very foggy. Both of us knew we weren't in the right spot and that something wasn't right. It was hair on the back of your neck standing up kind of fucked. We came down a hill and out of the thick fog, somehow, and before us was a dirt road. It had trees lining it, and it went on for as far as your flashlight reached. The temp had to have dropped about 20 degrees. It was fucking insane. And everything about this area, which I knew did not exist, filled me and my buddy full of dread. I can't even explain how absurd and unnatural this place was. The only feeling, for me, I can specifically nail down is that I did not belong there. So, instead of doing what you would normally see in a movie, you know, investigating and then die, we decided to turn around and go home. Uneventful walk back, but when we left that area, it was back to rain, mud, and fog. I know for a fact this place we were at does not exist. Not only from my memory of these trails, but I also got on Google Maps and investigated. Absolutely nothing like what we saw. So what in the world was it? Where were we and how do you explain it? I have no idea. I've been back to hike these trails, albeit in daylight, and I never saw the place again. This experience turned me onto the missing 411. Very interesting books, movies, and YouTube videos about bizarre weather phenomenon mixed with a supernatural eventuality leading to missing persons. Well, that's my initial story. It gets even more weird. Last year, I started dreaming about this place and being there. I don't know, like a calling to it, maybe? I called my buddy, who had moved away at the time, and told him I had to tell him something. He said, Bro, I've been dreaming about that place, too. I in no way hinted at what I was going to say. It was terrifying, and we decided we have to go back. He's moved back now, and we're planning another trip to camp off the trail close to where this place is and we are going to investigate. I decided to take my dogs for a walk today on one of the trails near my house. I told my husband I was heading out and wouldn't be long. Vansittart Woods Environmental Education Center was where I ended up. I got there around 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and away we went. It was an absolutely beautiful day. The trails were totally empty. The perfect walking conditions. I had my two female Alaskan Malamuts with me. This is important later, I promise. We headed down the green trail since it was the shortest way and went by some marsh slash bogs and the girls loved to watch the ducks. The walk was uneventful for the first little bit, just the birds chirping trying to get some birdie loving, the wind in the trees, the usual forest sounds, and then I heard my name. Weird, but it could be someone with a radio on a different trail. Both my dogs were looking in the direction that I heard it coming from. An uneasy feeling starts setting in, but like every rational person, I chalk it up to an overactive imagination and continue on. Then, I hear my name again, a little louder and a little more insistent if you will. Instead of looking towards where the sounds were coming from, I look at my dogs, who are both staring in the direction of my name, and I notice that my older female's hackles were slowly raising. Time to go. She's not happy. I decided to turn around and go back the way we came. We had only gone maybe 10 minutes down the trail, so it was just faster to turn around. The sign at the trailhead said it was a 45 minute loop. I hear my name again. 
We walk faster because now the hackles on both my dogs are up. One is two years old and her daughter is eight months old. Hackles up on a puppy definitely means she's scared. Then I notice that my dogs aren't pulling me. They're Alaskan Malamutes. They're bred to pull. Anytime we walk literally anywhere on a leash, they're pulling. These two dogs are basically beside me. One on the left and one on the right. Kivli now has a low, constant growl like she's warning whatever she can't see to fuck right off. On our way back, the exact same route we came, there was a log in the middle of the trail. I could see my shoe prints in the mud and on my dog's paw prints heading the other direction. Under this log. This log was not there on our way in. It was big enough and awkward enough that we had to go around it. Not far off the trail, just a few steps. I say, come on, Kiv. Come on, Echo. Let's go. They follow reluctantly. We hustle back onto the trail. Then, I hear Echo's name. She looks. Shortly after, I hear Kiv. We're now in a light jog back to our car. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up and everything in my body is screaming, run. Run faster. I hear my name again. This time, angry. The closer we get to the trailhead, the more desperate my name sounds. We are full on running now. When we got to the parking lot, I noticed that I can hear the wind and the birds again. I hadn't realized that I stopped hearing the bird and wind. We piled in the car as fast as I could get them in and didn't look back. Am I crazy? Did I upset something? I didn't take anything. I didn't move anything. I didn't touch anything. Anytime I take my dogs on trails, I'm super careful to respect nature and make sure my dogs do too. We even bring our own sticks for them to carry if they want one, so they don't take anything from the parks. Hi all. I ran into Politis' work a few months ago from a YouTube video that mentioned him and Missing 411. I've yet to read his books, but I've seen his movies and had a deep dive on his YouTube channel to learn some more. A common component from people's experiences seemed to be an inexplicable feeling of foreboding and or of being watched. I had experienced something along those lines when I was hiking in the Alabama hills two years ago. I have never spoken or written about the experience before as I'm honestly still struggling to make sense of it all. I was on my way back to California from two weeks of camping and sightseeing in the Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho area. I wanted to camp in the Alabama hills before driving through Yosemite and back to my home in the Bay Area. However, I spent the night before camping on Antelope Island State Park in Utah, then did some shopping in Salt Lake City before I decided to take Highway 50 through Nevada and then a quick drive through the Great Basin National Park before crossing the border into California. By the time I got to Alabama Hills, it was dark, and I didn't want to mess around with trying to find a campsite in the dark and unfamiliar terrain, and I really wanted a shower, so I decided to get a motel room for the night in Lone Pine, California. The following morning, I was up before the sun, figuring there would be some spectacular sunrise photos to be had from Alabama Hills. After driving around and taking pictures, I thought I would go for a hike to stretch my legs and exercise the dog for a bit before the long drive to Yosemite. There's an arch formation called Mobius Arch that didn't seem like too far of a hike, so that was my intended destination. I had the dog off leash, and we were all well on our way, maybe 200 yards from my truck, when suddenly my dog stops in the middle of the trail and just freezes, staring at something up ahead. I walk up to him and stop, trying to see what he's staring at. The sun was sort of in my eyes and I really couldn't make anything out. Suddenly, my dog got his hackles up and bares his teeth, starts growling and lets loose with a frantic volley of barking. My immediate thought was that there must be a predator, coyotes, maybe a mountain lion, something, so I immediately reach for my pepper spray. Now, my dog is no stranger to nature. I've had him for four years at this point, and he's been in more national parks than almost everybody I know. We've racked up a lot of miles together, 
and I can read his body language very well. I've seen him scared, but I've never seen him get aggressive at anything. He's not a barker by nature. He's a terrier and has a strong prey drive, so he will go after anything that runs from him. Cats, squirrels, birds, etc. But he's also a big scaredy cat and won't generally mess with bigger animals. The day before, we'd just walked past a herd of bison and he didn't utter a peep. So to see him just absolutely frantically aggressive and scared at the same time just baffled me and it immediately started ringing alarm bells. Now, I don't know if I was feeding off my dog's energy, but I suddenly got this very deep sense of foreboding, like something was watching and hunting me. It instantly triggered my fight or flight reflex, mainly flight because I still couldn't see anything. Now, I must say I'm 40 years old. I grew up in the middle of a civil war. I was a bona fide gang member in my teens. I'm a US Army infantry veteran, and I've been working as a security contractor since I separated from the service. In short, I've seen some stuff, and I have some faith in my fighting abilities. This was one of the few times in my life where I was really scared for my life. Legs wobbly, sphincter contracting, can't breathe kind of scared. I transferred my pepper spray to my left and drew my pocket knife and my overhand grip on a right hand. I was kicking myself for leaving my Glock 19 behind in my truck. We were in a standoff for what felt like an eternity, but was probably no longer than a minute. My dog alternating between barking and staring, still with his hackles up, head down and teeth bared. All classic signs of aggression. I tried to coax him forward, but he wasn't budging. I was also reluctant to turn my back, just in case this was a mountain lion, and I didn't want to trigger the attack. So I started retreating, face and body still facing forward. I start stepping backwards. My dog also starts backing up right next to me, still growling, still with his hackles up. We backtrack maybe 20 yards from this rock formation, when my dog suddenly bolts back to the truck. You know that old joke about two guys and a bear, and about just needing to run faster than the other guy? Well, I was that other guy, and the absurdly comical thought that passed through my head was, you little shit, you just left me to get eaten. My dog was gone. I wasn't as fast as him. Injuries in his infantryman and arthritis had done a number on my knees, and I couldn't remember the last time I ran, but I ran after him, downhill, full-on scared for my life, sprinting, and another absurd thought popped into my head. If I trip now and accidentally stab myself with my own knife, my mom is going to laugh at my funeral. Finally, the terrain opens up and I could see my truck, and my dog stopped and looked at me, no longer in an aggressive posture. So I come to a stop and turn around ready to fight whatever it was that was chasing me. Nothing. Not. A. Damn. Thing. I've never told this story to anybody else, because I know it makes me sound like a big pussy but the fear was very real. Even just typing this up and recounting this, I'm getting the shivers and the tingling feeling, and I probably have an elevated blood pressure right now. I have never seen my dog act that way before either, so maybe I was just feeding off his energy and his fear transferred to me. I don't know. I can't explain it, but that was one of the few times in my life when I felt like prey. I don't go unarmed in nature anymore. I do have a license to carry, but very often, when I'm out there in nature, I don't bother to carry a firearm. Prior to this incident, I thought the biggest threat I would encounter were other people. So I usually only carried in urban situations. Not that there's no bad people in the wild, but I figured the odds were in my favor. Not anymore. But you best believe, the next time I go hiking out in that situation, I will definitely be armed to the teeth. I'm new to this, and I can't stop reading and researching. I would like to know if anyone here has experienced anything in Southern California, or if anyone knows of any weird happenings. I have some experiences. I don't think they're that weird, but still. I like to go hiking all the time, 
and most times I go by myself. Don't know if I can now after learning about missing 411. Anyways, before this, I never thought much about it, and I was never scared about any paranormal stuff. I mostly got scared or worried about actual human creeps. Most of my family, friends, and I worried about someone hurting me since I'm a female and petite. Luckily, nothing dangerous has happened to me. I've been reading and noticed the connection between boulders, granite, rocks, and water. I've always been drawn to these, walking to touch the water and jumping from rock to rock. I've only experienced weird feelings during two times, at Etwanda Falls and Ice House Canyon. During Etwanda, I started hiking and far away from the heavily trafficked area. Once I was far, it started getting super quiet and dark. I remember looking down the water stream and seeing I could still keep going. One part of me wanted to keep going, but something told me to turn around and leave. I remember becoming aware of my surroundings after spotting a camouflaged frog. I was jumping around when I almost stepped on one. At this point, I became aware of my surroundings and started looking around, and that's when I noticed that they were everywhere. So, after this, I turned around and started walking fast towards getting close to other people. You know that feeling when you want to get away, but can't go any quicker, and your chest starts feeling heavier and heavier? I was so relieved and happy the moment I saw someone. I've been back there since, and have not experienced anything weird anymore. The other time happened when I was hiking Ice House Canyon around Mount Baldy area in California. This happened during my second time hiking this trail. The first time I hiked the trail was during winter, and around that time, there were a lot of people, and I was able to follow, stay close, and stay safe. Also, the trail was more evident, and just kind of made more sense around that time. The second time was closer to summer, and the path was so different, and it was practically empty, aside from people at the entrance. I had a hard time following the trail at one point. I was sure I was no longer on the right path. Maybe I was. I don't know. I remember being surrounded by rocks and trees, having a good time, but at the same time a little worried. Then, the further I got away from the entrance and the more it became evident that there weren't people around, I started having a weird feeling. I should point out that these feelings never happen. Even when I have been in more isolated trails, I tend to feel happy and at peace, and I'm usually singing. Anyways, I remember thinking that something didn't feel quite right and I should turn around, which I did. I almost didn't though, since my goal is always to make it to the end. When I got to my car and got services, I had messages from my boyfriend. He was upset because he had been trying to get a hold of me and he was starting to get worried. There was a big gap of time between when I started and when I got back to my car. I was gone for over four hours, when in reality, what I hiked should have only been an hour. At tops, too. I have a couple of photos and videos from those days that I can share. I would also like to say that I have experienced a lot of other weird and paranormal stuff outside of forests and national parks. Actually, a lot of my family and I have. From seeing things and hearing people call my name but don't think they belong here. I posted here about being indigenous and having strange experiences in the woods. I had three paranormal experiences in Michigan this summer. Two of them were in Manistee National Forest, and one was on an extremely remote beach of Lake Superior. 1. I was tent camping in Manistee Forest Reserve, in a place I'd been at least a thousand times. I woke up around 3 a.m. feeling super unnerved, and I had a very low, guttural voice making speech-like sounds was rain pouring outside. I did not recognize the language as English or Anishabamawan. It didn't sound like an actual language. I ignored it and went back to sleep. I should mention, this land was private and my great aunt saved it. 
It's filled with ancient cedar trees that should have been harvested. My family takes care of the grove and allows it to be wild. It's surrounded by vacation cabin plots of land with some very disrespectful people. 2. My boyfriend and I were camping on the beach of Lake Superior in an extremely remote region. Our first night, I woke up again around 3 a.m. and watched the sky outside my tent instantaneously be illuminated by a bright light. It went from looking like midnight to mid-morning, like the sun was switched on. It was not the sun or moon. It had more of a fuzzy quality, and again, it was storming outside. There was heavy cloud cover. I was terrified. I heard a soft voice say, You know this. Don't go outside and look at it. Whatever you do, don't look at it. So I did exactly that. Just ignored it and went back to sleep. In the morning, I told my boyfriend I had a scary dream about a light. And he kind of froze up and said he had a dream about a light as well. I asked him if he heard anything. He said he didn't. He just felt like he woke up to see the sky unnaturally bright around 3 a.m. 3. I saw another light. This one over the Manistee Forest Reserve. We were planning on Backcountry Road, and I had a horrible feeling about the location we were in. I told her I didn't want to stay in that location because if it rained, my car would get stuck. I drive a little hybrid through all these adventures. She agreed, and we left and went to a campground. As soon as we pulled out of the logging roads, I saw a light in the sky. It was about twice as close as an airplane, and twice as bright. The collar looked like orange fire with a small black dot in the middle. My friend is indigenous as well, and I pointed it out to her and was like, what the fuck is that? She looked horrified by it, but tried convincing me it was a bush plane or crop duster. This was 10 p.m. on September 11th. I felt uncomfortable talking about it anymore, so we just dropped it and didn't mention it again. I will 100% return to these places, and none of this has scared me from the woods. I was always taught to respect the land, and if something strange happens, to ignore it and continue to be respectful. I honestly feel like, since I've done all the right things, myself, my friends, and my family will all be okay. I feel very confident of this. I'm not sure if this belongs here, but it thought it might be the best place for it since it's strange phenomena in the woods. This happened a while ago, but it just occurred to me that I should post about it. I'm not entirely certain about people mysteriously going missing here, but I do know that there are some other strange rumors. About a year and a half ago, I was hiking slash mushroom foraging with some friends. We were going off trail to see if we could find anything good. Just a bit off trail with a dense evergreen canopy above us. I noticed there was a perfectly circular area in the ground, around five feet in diameter, that was entirely cleared of pine needles, and all of the ground around it was thickly covered. I showed it to my friends. They thought it was strange too, but we didn't think too hard on it and moved on. I was, however, left with a very strange, eerie sensation. A while later, a bit deeper into the woods, we ended up climbing this very steep hill because we can see some cool mushrooms at the top. There's another trail up there. We take the trail and come across a circle burned on the ground with similar logs surrounding it. It wasn't just lightly burned. It was black, charred, probably about 12 feet in diameter. The ground was not hot from the fire, but no debris from the tree had fallen onto the ground which had burned, which was the strangest part of all of this to me. Not a fallen leaf or twig was in either of the circles. They were perfectly cleared and seemingly perfectly circular. Any thoughts or ideas on what might have caused these or put them there? Or does that sound similar to anything else that you've ever encountered?
I used to spend a lot of my summers as a kid down at this caravan park. It was in the new forest near Burnmouth, UK. The forest itself was not like many forests in the UK. It felt very American. That's the only way I can describe it. As a kid, I used to think dinosaurs could have lived there because of the ferns and how the place looks. But it felt very artificial, as if it shouldn't be in this part of the world. The entire forest has an eerie vibe to it, even though it's kind of inviting. Everyone, even my parents, said the place had an odd feeling about it. Anyway, to add more strangeness, the caravan park was down the road from this military testing base. I had always been interested in it as it had big signs saying, keep out. One night, me and a couple of my friends could hear this music playing from what seemed to be the military base. But it wasn't like normal music. It seemed to just be bass and drums, very low and rhythmic. So we all decided we were going to check it out. So we went up to that gate and stood there. I don't know why. They wouldn't just let us in. So I leaned up against the chain link fence and whistled a tune. I don't know why I did that either. I just thought it would be an appropriate act of defiance. But we could still hear the music drifting across the long tarmac road stretching out to us. We got bored and endeavored to find another way to the music, so we moved further down the road to this gate. We figured we would go past the base and maybe find where this music was coming from. So we all hopped the gate and walked towards the sounds. As we walked, we passed a house on our left, then came to a bank of trees. Then a couple of the group feel scared, but we press on. The music is still guiding us forward. We came to a very short fence with a thin strand of barbed wire running across the top, and sitting behind was the military testing road. Just there, behind a fence, any of us could just jump across. So now, we were all goading each other into jumping across the fence. See what would happen. But none of us would. But I felt like someone was going to. I just felt that we had come all this way, that at some point, we would just head on forward onto the track. Then, we heard whistling coming towards us. A man's whistle. But the strangest thing was, it was the same tune that I had been whistling at the gate. Then, it stopped. But as it sounded very human, it wasn't immediately scary, so we stayed put. Then it picked up again, but moving closer, and as it started again, everyone felt an intense fear, like it gripped us. All I could think about was moving away, going home, not being here. It's the foggiest part of the memory, because after that we just headed home and didn't talk about it much. But ever since, when I passed that gate, a shiver runs down my spine, as if something far scarier happened but I can't remember it. I've been scared in places before, but that place, I still feel today. Looking at it on Google Maps, a deep voice inside of my head saying, you should never return here. You should never come back. What I think happened? I think this is a security system that uses sound to disorient the subject so they move away from the secret area. The more and more I read the posts where people don't go missing, the more I realize something, that we are hearing people who are going one direction, and then we're made to turn in the opposite direction. They were turned around, or made to walk away from an area. Imagine if you wanted to keep something secret, but so secret that you can't let anyone know you're trying to keep it a secret. Could there be fences we are crossing out there that are triggering a security system? and then causing us to react with fear so we don't end up where we should be. Maybe if we persist forwards, we never come back. That's the final layer of security. This military base was a testing facility. There are a few caravan sites on that road, so plenty of kids might try to gain access. Maybe they set this up so kids can try to get in that way and then they use their technology to make us turn around. Maybe even test out new ones? kids scare easily and are also much more curious than adults and less likely to want to get in for nefarious reasons. Not sure if this has already been discussed. I just thought I'd add my story and thoughts here. I would love to hear what you think.
This happened around six years ago. We moved to a new town and our neighborhood is set in a wooded area and there's a country park that backs up to it. About a half mile from our house, there is a nature center that has several very easy trails. Many younger school groups come here to learn stuff and go on easy hikes. My son, who at the time was three, and I walked from our house to the nature center to go for a hike. We were there for about what seemed like 30 minutes, but when we got home, we had been gone for over two hours. The trail we were on is like a large bowl. When you're standing up top, you can see almost the whole trail. We had gone down to the bottom of the bowl, and as we were walking, I just started to feel strange. There was no one else around that I could see, but I kept having this feeling like someone was watching or following us. The park is not too far from the main road, and you can hear cars and motorcycles going by all the time. But at that moment, things were completely silent. And also strange was there was no wildlife around. Normally, there are tons of squirrels, deer, and birds. But there was nothing. We get about three quarters of the way around the trail, and my son says he wants to go up a set of stairs, and for me to go on the trail, and he will meet me up. We've been there for over 20 times, and up top is just open fields where they have soccer fields. So I'm like, okay, go for it. Even though to myself, I'm just not feeling normal. I let him go and hustle around to meet him. Probably should have taken less than a minute for us to meet. I get up there and he is nowhere to be found. At first I'm like, oh, he just went back down the stairs playing around, no big deal. But as I start getting closer to the stairs, he is still not anywhere I can see him. So, I go down the stairs again, thinking he followed my path. No. Nothing. So now my heart rate is starting to climb, and I'm calling out for him. This makes no sense. The fields are wide open, and way too big for a three-year-old to make it across without me seeing him. So I'm up top, and like I said, you can basically see the whole bowl where the trail is. But he is nowhere. I go back down and start backtracking still calling out and now i'm just about in full panic mode same thought just keeps going through my head which was this doesn't make any sense there was nowhere for him to go that quick i'm now running up and down calling out for him and i get back to the top of the bowl and i scream out his name and all the way across the field at the very entrance of the trail a lady yells out to me and says he's over here what how no fucking way it isn't a large area but from that point to where we were takes 10 to 15 minutes to hike and he had only been gone for five minutes felt longer but it wasn't i ran to him and he seemed fine and when i asked how he got over there he said he had heard me calling to him which totally freaked him out to this day none of this makes sense to me it's a small area but i still have no idea how we got to that spot we do go there still to this day, but to say the least, I've never let him out of my sight again. New to this subreddit, but not new to Missing411. I've been a fan since hearing David Politis on a podcast years ago and going down this whole rabbit hole. It's a passive but fun hobby and interest. Reading these accounts and trying to have some fun with an open mind and venturing into the mysteries and unknowns of life and the universe, I would like to share some of my experiences with the Missing411 phenomenon. I grew up in the rural mid-Atlantic area, but not far outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Our house and our neighbors stood on a hill, both built in the early 19th century, but added much later to the county tax records. We were the two tenant houses for an old plantation. Across the street was cornfield and a rolling valley. The original plantation house was on the other side of the cornfield. Behind us was the woods. A small patch of maybe 10 to 15 acres surrounded by farming fields and rolling hills. There were two neighbors who told me stories of the wild men and the forest folks. The wild men were somewhat like us in description, 
bipedal mammals. They travel through heavy fog days, larger than us, covered in hair, and had a distinct horrible odor, an unnatural sounding howl. The fog and the odor were their two giveaways. They were dangerous, but also very scared of us. The way a black bear might be. None of those in the area, I say a fox being the largest wild predator, and could run away from us with loud stomping big feet. Although the wild men were never referred to as a Bigfoot, the forest folk were always talked about by another neighbor who was a sweet old lady and gardener. She spent more time outside enjoying the nature than anyone I've ever known. Her yard was a wonderland of flowers and trellises and gardens. The forest folk were the spirits of the woods, she would tell me. She was a devout Christian woman, but she left offerings out for their forest folks. She would show me what and where she would leave them so I wouldn't disturb them. They were a way of life for her, and were mostly invisible. But if they wanted to, they could appear to us as animals, and sometimes they would just show us their shape in their woods. Kind of like the predator. If you ever saw the forest folk as an animal, you were in their good graces. If you saw the shape moving through the woods, it was time to leave. She told me it was all right to run straight home, and most likely I would because there would be an overwhelming sense of fear to run far and fast. My whole life growing up, the woods were my playground. There was a natural spring that fed a creek. There were fairy rings and mushrooms and hills and rocks, but nothing high or dangerous. Just a small hill and valley of open woods. The first time I remember seeing the forest folk, for lack of better term, was when I was young, around eight years old. It was a human shape running through the woods at the top of the hill, madly fast but obviously bipedal. Its frantic running, the sudden sounds of leaves and tree branches crunching and moving was terrifying. It wasn't running towards me, more like side to side, about a hundred feet away. It hit the edge of the woods where the cornfield was, and the corn stalks got pushed aside as it disappeared from my vision. Then, I ran. It happened so fast, and I was so frozen with shock, I simply couldn't move during the event. But the terror, the emotion was intense and the first time my backyard playground scared me. Then, the dreams started. I would have regular dreams where the shape was at the edge of the woods near our house. It would then solidify into either a human or an animal. Sometimes there were groups of them, sometimes just one. They would guide me into the woods in my dreams, but they were pleasant and friendly. These were not nightmares, quite the opposite. When there were foggy mornings, my whole family would sometimes hear horrible howls from the woods. We all heard them. The dog would get very attentive and stand guard in the back porch during these episodes. They were not foxes. We knew that sound. They were more of a bellow. Talking to my younger sister a few days ago about them and she was like, I totally forgot about those. Like, I want to forget them. They unsettled us every time and nothing like being told to go out in the fog and wait for the bus in the morning like that. The farm kids on the bus always thought our woods was haunted because we would get fog and they wouldn't a couple miles away. Over the years growing up, I would always venture into the woods until my parents sold the house and moved after high school. There were times when I would get so scared as to be overwhelming and the older I got, the more curious I became. I went from running out of the woods in a panic to slowly walking home with a sharp eye, calling out to the woods to show itself. Sometimes I would see the shape with the fear and book it. Sometimes I wouldn't see anything, which generally was honestly worse, and the fear would always disappear as soon as I crossed the tree line. The last day before we moved, I stood at the tree line and said goodbye. Why not? I was raised by neighbors to talk to the woods and respect it, and I enjoyed the hell out of them growing up but I knew to listen to the delays when it had other business. Saying goodbye, I saw a rabbit sprint to the wood edge and sit and stare at me. I thanked the rabbit and looked up and saw a few of the shapes about 30 feet in. The last time I ever saw them, and I never felt an ounce of fear there. I waved and smiled and hopped in my car and moved away. Back in 2007, 
I was taking a walk with my boyfriend down to my neighborhood park. I can't remember exactly how late in the evening it was, but it was dark out, probably around 8 or 9 p.m. The park is at the end of a cul-de-sac, and it backs up into a small wooded area and creek. As we were getting closer to the park, we started to hear very unusual and loud sounds that were like a snarling, screeching ape. We figured it was a fox or coyote or something, and continued towards the swing set area at the park. We sat down at a bench, facing the wooded area, when we started to hear the noises again and branches snapping. In the direction of the noises, we saw a treetop violently shaking, as if a huge animal was in it, but we couldn't see the figure of anything at all. It was as if what we were looking at was an invisible force. I wanted to take a closer look, but my boyfriend pulled me away, and we started walking back towards the street. We stopped under the street light and listened some more. Then we watched the tree motion jump from the trees behind the swing set to a completely different side of the park. A different treetop was shaking, and we could hear the branches snapping, and the weird animal noises coming from it. Never thought I would share that experience, and I'll always wonder what that was. Hello everybody, I'm not an avid reddit poster, but I feel most compelled to share these stories on this subreddit. They pertain to a terrifying experience I had camping in the North Woods, as well as similarities between David Politis' movie and a story that I heard on a podcast. To begin, I spent two and a half years in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where I attended and finished my degree at North Michigan University. The area is spectacular, and includes miles and miles of sprawling, mixed, deciduous, and evergreen forests. It is truly the ideal wilderness compared to many areas of the Midwest. During my time there, I had hiked alone many, many times, usually never feeling anything strange. The only instance I can account is when I sat on a log to take a break while hiking a trail about 13 miles out of town, and the forest fell to a dead quiet. I mean, it has to be one of the most unnatural feelings ever. Very odd, but that is not what I am here to explain. My girlfriend and I decided to go camping at a nearby state park, Van Riper State Park. If you look this place up, you can see that it's very heavily forested for many miles around the park. It's not likely that some people would come down there and play pranks or make noises in the middle of the night. I just wanted to make that clear. So at 3 a.m., while we are asleep in our tent, the most unearthly, ape-like, even demonic sound came from what sounded like 20 yards from around the tent. I am an incredibly light sleeper. Always have been. I shot up in absolute fear. The sound was unlike anything I have ever heard from an animal, or human for that matter. It was so loud. I could not believe my girlfriend didn't wake up, or other people at nearby campsites. The strangest thing about it was, whatever it was, it did not appear to make footstep sounds. Nothing. It was that demonic growl slash howl. And then there was nothing. I laid there, frozen in my sleeping bag. I beat myself up over not jumping out of the tent to finally see what could be pursuing people in the wild. But, when something like that happens to you, you are frozen. I'm an individual that has been trained to think scientifically not to jump to conclusions before doing proper research. I tell you this, no moose, no bear, no large mammal that is native to those woods would emit such a sound. The sound still haunts me to this day. I mentioned in the title that I wanted to make a connection. If you guys watched Missing 411 The Hunted, I am sure that you are aware of the audio tapes from the Sierra Camp, which was recorded back in the 70s. If you listen closely at the end of the clip, there is what appears to be a metallic clanking sound, which I don't believe came from the gentleman recording. A couple months back, I listened to a podcast on Spotify titled Almost Missing in the Wilderness. It is done by Paranormal Mysteries. There was a story about a girl who was hiking with her dog and explained how she became startled by this metallic sound after feeling like they were being pursued. The narrator states that she described it as 
a hammer hitting a tin wall. When I heard this, my stomach dropped. In the audio clip, in the latest Missing 411 movie, you can clearly hear this sound. I am beginning to think more and more dots can be connected. I apologize for the link of this post, but I urge you guys to check out the recording, as well as listen to the podcast and draw your own picture. As always, be safe out there. Always bring a hiking buddy. Tell people where you're going. But remember, to have fun and enjoy the natural beauty that we are blessed to have. My name is Luke, and I am now 20 years old. This story happened to me when I was 17. This experience still gives me chills to this day. In May 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was getting bored of cruising around the streets, so I wanted to go for a trail slash woodland bike ride. I've never been to Lee Woods before then, and personally, I don't think I'll ever be going alone again. After some research into a few different areas, Lee Woods seemed to be my best bet. Living only a couple miles away, it was a nice bike ride. Upon arriving, it looked very peaceful, and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look of the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colors at the start of each trail signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers don't take my word on that bit. I still have no clue what they mean. So I decided to go down a colored, I can't remember very well, I think it was blue, trail to see how it was there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail. And now here is where it starts to get weird. I began having this weird sort of vision looking around as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and further away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I actually lost track of time. I got lost on the trail. Now bear in mind, I'm very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. I then came to a strange opening. I could go left in the rough direction of the way, or right deeper into the woods. Me being me, I decided to go deeper into the woods. I came to a weird little trail that just had a dodgy written all over it. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point which the trail continued, but it was getting dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I then turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, but I was just stood still staring down the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be near impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me in that area. I got nervous and began walking back up the hill, as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind, my bike tires are completely solid. No punctures, slow punctures, or anything wrong at all. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing happened again. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by half a mile, as if the woodland was moving. I began walking up the path feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time it felt more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time since I went down that first trail. I'll explain the scenery before continuing. It's a long path, a slight steep hill to my feet, a very narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep and maybe four feet wide. Bushes are on either side of the river and the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting about a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across the river just to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if the person's okay. Also, because many people go to Lee Woods to commit suicide, so I was hoping to maybe help this person. 
but you guessed it. There is no one there, and the crying stopped. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turn away and start walking again. A bit quicker, as I was unnerved at that time. I've had paranormal experiences before, but not usually in a place like the woods. Usually it's in a house or some sort of building, so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking, and maybe a minute or so later, only a couple meters away from where I heard the crying, it started again. But this time, it was on the opposite side of me across the river. I didn't bother looking. I started to go into a bit of a jog, and as I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling as if they or it was following me. Upon hearing this, I sped up, and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I've thought to myself, fuck this, I'm gone. I've went to hop on my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, and I came to almost a sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat, so I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip up or end up having to throw it to run faster. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I'm running faster and faster, praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling that I wanted to cry because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster. And after what I felt like an hour, but in reality was probably only five or ten minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer and started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out of the car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing as multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and ran towards it. And while doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother on approaching the car park exit. I couldn't believe that my bike tire had suddenly regained all its air. It was solid again, as it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped on my bike and got away from Lee Woods as fast as I could, and have never gone back since. As every person I tell this story to becomes reluctant to go there with me or any extra people. The thing that makes this scary is that I have Irish heritage. In Irish folklore, there is a demon woman called the Banshee. She's seen in the woodlands next to rivers and lakes, washing blood off of clothes. It is said that if you see her washing blood off of clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death. I can't remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die. Since 2017, I've lost my auntie, two of my best friends, and a dog. Lee Woods is no joke. There are many stories that have come out of there too. You can read online about them. Search up Lee Woods Bristol Haunting. It is rated the 87th most haunted place in the UK according to Higgy Pop. It's a popular spot for Bristol suicides, or it was at least. Even the ghost of Isambrod Kingdom, Bruno, has been spotted there looking over the suspension bridge in which he designed. I may submit more stories soon, as I have a couple more stories of experiences that I've had over the years. I've been tempted to share this story for a while now. The following occurred on an island off of Washington State about seven years ago. My sister and her family moved from Oregon to Washington. I tagged along to check it out. It was different there. The woods in Oregon had a welcoming fantasy forest feeling, whereas the woods of Washington felt ominous, foreboding, especially at night. You could really feel the woods out there if that makes sense. It was late afternoon. I was just chilling on my sofa at my sister's new place when she says she found out about a trail on this island. It was already late afternoon, but we said, what the hell, let's go check it out. Her husband wasn't up for it, but he agreed to drop us off and pick us up after. My oldest niece also decided to go with us. 
It's about 15 minutes away. So we grab a handful of things and off we went. We were walking and talking, enjoying the quiet. It was a simple trail, nothing special so far. We get to this enormous tree that must have been six feet around. It's in the middle of where the trail splits off in two directions. One that leads towards the seashore and one that leads further into the woods. So we head towards the sea. We hang there for a bit, taking in the view and shooting the breeze before we start to head back. We get to the big tree and we decide to check out what the other trail is leading off into the woods. We're having a nice time. We have the trail entirely to ourselves and we're laughing and joking around, enjoying each other's company in this nice day. I don't remember who brought it up, but somehow Bigfoot comes up. Jokingly, I pick up a stick and start whacking it against a random tree on the side of the trail. Instantly, about 20 yards off the trail, before I'm even done with my second tap, a very loud wood rapping sound begins hammering a tree. Fast. When I say fast, I mean death metal blast beat fast, and incredibly loud. We can't see anything there though, and suddenly it stops. We stand there startled. I think my niece said something about a woodpecker, and we just agreed and move on. From here, you might say I'm making too much out of nothing, or that we're idiots. You had to be there. You know the whole, the woods went silent thing? Well, they were already quiet, but something had shifted. The atmosphere had changed. We weren't laughing now. We were uneasy, but we kept going and slowly started relaxing and chatting again. Then, from somewhere up above us, between the treetops and the sky, a monkey started screaming. We froze. Everyone knows that sound. The sound of the monkey, it's unmistakable. It was rising higher and higher, like laughter moving closer and closer, and as it passes above us, it seamlessly morphs into a crow cawing. But though we followed the sound as it passed overhead, we didn't see anything. We keep moving. No one says anything. But we silently agree to move back towards the exit. We finish the loop we're on and head back in the direction of the big tree. Instead, we end up on a part that we don't recognize. You know where this is going. We spend the next hour or so backtracking and pretending there isn't a seed of panic in our guts. It's getting darker and the temperature is dropping. We focus on the situation and keep our cool. Finally, up ahead I see the big tree and we are all relieved. As we're headed towards it, we hear the children. You know the sound of a big group of kids bursting out of the school doors laughing? Like that, headed towards the seashore. I was relieved to hear people. We round the big tree and start heading towards the main trail towards the exit. My sister calls her husband and tells him to go ahead and come get us. Up ahead of us is a bend and from around that bin comes two dogs. One big guy, one little guy, dragging leashes. They stand there just looking at us, and as we approach the bin, they both turn around and go back. About 20 seconds later, we round that bin expecting to greet the owners, and there is nothing there. No dogs, no people. It's a straight shot up to the exit from there. The sides of the trail are about eight feet high and steep. There is nowhere that anyone could have gone. That's when I remember the kids. It's getting dark soon. Where are they? Why would a crowd of kids be going to a random isolated seashore at this time of day? Then it occurs to me that we didn't hear any footsteps. A crowd of kids would have made so much more noise, especially moving at that speed. Also, there were no footprints of anyone but us. Her husband has by then shown up and is waiting with the engine running. Almost there, right before we exit the gate, a powerful stench of something dead and rotting hits me. I glance up to my left in the direction it's coming from, and I feel a force of pure malevolence shoot right past me, like nothing that I have ever felt in my entire life. Absolute and passionate hatred aimed directly at me. My nose and eyes are glued to the spot, but there is nothing there. We get in the car and pull away. And that was it. And that is the part that bothers me the most. Because none of us said a thing. As soon as we shut the doors, it was like it never happened. 
We started talking about dinner and watching a movie. Like nothing had ever happened. It wasn't till later that night, alone, looking at some snapshots that I took of the hike that I started to piece it all together. On a whim, I messaged my friend Joe, who was into weird stuff, and I tell him a short version of the events. He never replied and I forgot about it. Over a few years and several phones, I never deleted that message. It was like a blank spot sat where my memory of it should be. I could only remember it clearly when I reread it. Another strange thing is that both my sister and I are into Bigfoot and 411, yet we never once discussed it. I brought it up once with her a couple years ago, like, remember that weird trail we went on? Her only reply was, I'll never go on that trail again. And that was that. It never came up again. Hearing a monkey scream in that forest was the most scared that I've ever been in my entire adult life. What sticks with me the most was, however, at the end, it was a hatred I can't describe, just emanating like that stench accompanying it. Just absolute and total hatred, directed at me, not my sister, not my niece. Whatever it was, wanted me to know that it was me, that it despised me completely, that it would have been there at the finish line no matter what. So don't go stirring things up. You aren't and won't be in control. And scariest of all, is that it hates you. I have experienced something this week truly phenomenal that I cannot explain. Something so earth-shattering and reality-breaking that I am still in shock. Adrenaline is still pumping through my system, even now writing this four days later. Last Monday, August 17th, I went camping alone in Uwari National Forest. My goal was to de-stress and simply enjoy nature. I brought along a knife, some MREs, which are packs of freeze-dried food, essentially, a tarp, and rope to construct a shelter. I arrive at the campground around two. I begin my hike. It is deathly quiet. The only wildlife I encounter are two deer at the beginning of the trail. They squeal and run away. As I'm hiking, I notice a large amount of quartz deposits strewn about, enough to raise an eyebrow. I reach a valley clearing about a mile in and in between two streams. I constructed my shelter in the center. Old campfires littered about told me this place must be a good place to camp. After finishing my tarp tent, I began to walk around and explore the area. I hear thunder and decide to head back to my shelter. Here is where things start to get strange. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it still. I lay on my stomach in the tent. As the storm rolls in, I feel a strange pressure change. Low brace frequency and temperature drop. Not that odd considering I'm in a valley. As it approaches, however, I feel a sensation that I have never felt before. I can feel the storm above me in a way that I can't fully describe. The best I can do to detail this feeling is that my consciousness was aware and expanded enough to feel this mass above me. I'm thinking, this is very weird, but don't entertain any thoughts of this possibly being paranormal. That is until I hear the first sound. I hear a loud whoop, I guess probably a quarter mile away. My hair stand up all over, and then it begins to pour rain, very hard. At this point, I have no earthly idea what could have made that sound, other than a very large animal that I'm unfamiliar with. Time passes. I'm still laying in my tent. Not quite dark, but it's raining so I have nothing to do but scan the trees and listen. That's when I see the light. A very small, what looked like a coin reflected in the sun. Only there was no sun, and it was moving. It blinked on, then off quickly, and reappeared a few feet to the side, and then off again. I never saw it again. Not soon after, I began to hear what, in my mind, were bipedal footsteps. They didn't seem like they came from a large animal, but I never saw what made them. 
They begin in the exact same spot I witnessed the light a few moments prior. I'm staring intently at this spot, frozen in fear, clutching my knife, unable to move. It's silent until dusk. It's still raining. And then, I hear the second whoop. Much closer, and much louder, on the other side of my shelter. Whatever made this noise was maybe 50 feet away. Night falls and adrenaline is pumping through me. I lay on my back. It's so dark it did not matter if my eyes were open or closed. There was no noise for a few hours, and I began to relax slightly. That is, until I heard the babbling. I set up in between two streams, so my rational brain was making me think it was just the water. However, it was not. If I had allowed myself to believe that I was actually hearing some sort of inhuman speech that far into the woods all alone, I would have panicked, or blacked out with fear perhaps. I hear this intermittently throughout the night in two places. It's soft as if they're whispering to each other, about me, not wanting to wake me up. I lose consciousness at some point, but I awaken to something being thrown at my tent. A small rock. Nothing more of note happens that I'm aware of until morning when I get the hell out of there. I arrive home and immediately begin researching what could have possibly been making those noises. I look at deer, mountain lions, bears, even raccoons and squirrel noises. Nothing comes close. That is, until I decide to entertain the Sasquatch theory. And then I found it. What I came across was the Sierra Sounds. It is exactly the same. I cannot tell you how frightened I was when I heard the video. It is the exact noise. I can't even begin to process this, even still. I'm shaking typing all of this out for you. The murmuring. That's the worst part. They were talking to each other. Please, please let me know what your thoughts are, or if you know anybody who has had similar experiences. Let me assure you, that everything I have written is the truth, and I feel completely healthy. I know what I heard. Hey all, I'm not going to provide exact locations for this, as this happened on the trail that my mom and I walk the dog on every day for 10 years, as it was pretty close to our house. I live in a rural part of the PNW, and so there were a lot of trails just outside of town that bordered on a lot of forest. This was one of those, but it was probably the biggest trail in my town. It was actually an access road to some stuff so it was like 10 feet wide and gravel. At the time, I briefly went missing. I was about 10 years old and had been walking that trail every day for three to four years. My mom was with me, as was our dog. I'd been warned not to go off the trail, and normally I wouldn't have, but there was a small sub-trail that had a rope swing over a creek. I loved to play there as a kid, and that day I crossed the creek to hang out on the other side while my mom talked to a friend that she'd ran into. I was within sight of my mom. It was a clear view across the creek, when all of a sudden it was like things swirled. My surroundings were completely unfamiliar, and there were plants that shouldn't have been there. The wrong kind of trees with the leaves at slightly the wrong point for the season. Of course, I know what to do if I get lost. I hugged a tree and shouted for mom. I was probably 300 yards away at most, probably under 100 yards. She should have heard me, but she didn't. I wasn't there for very long before our dog came and got me. He wasn't a very smart dog. With all love, saying he was as dumb as a box of rocks would have been an insult to rocks. He also didn't like me nearly as much as he liked my mom. He was a total mama's boy, and he normally would have stayed near her. But he calmly walked up to me nuzzled my hand so it was on his head, and walked me back out the creek where I could see my mom. I thought I'd only been gone for 15 minutes or so. Apparently, it was over an hour, 
and multiple people were looking for me, including walking directly on the path that I had never left. I'm not sure if this counts, but we were on holiday in Japan and walking near Mount Fuji. My son was two and a half and running off a little bit in front of us, as kids do, when he turned a corner and went out of sight. I hurried up to check the bend he went around and reached it just a few seconds after him, and he had vanished, just absolutely vanished into nowhere. I couldn't hear him, and I couldn't see him, so I panicked. I dropped my backpack and set off at a dead sprint traveling way more ground than he possibly could have ran. Worried that he'd been kidnapped or wandered off the trail, but I couldn't find any sign of him, so I sent my wife to go get help while I went to search. Back in Russia, I was search and rescue, and I was good at tracking lost people, but there was nothing to show any direction that he'd gone in. The authorities came and searched, but they couldn't find him either. Then, two hours later, he reappeared in basically the same spot that we'd lost him in, giggling and happy and clean, like he hadn't gone anywhere and had just taken his previous step. To this day, we have no explanation as to where he went, and he was too little to describe it to us. Besides, two hours with no dirt on his pants or needing a diaper change was basically impossible for him. It freaked me out, and now I've found this subreddit. I think that I may have found a solution as to where he went. Thanks, and please forgive my English. It's not my first language. This happened in early November of 2016. I was moving to Philly from Chicago, and my boyfriend had flown in to help me drive across the country. My parents live in Ohio, so after making a pit stop there, we were on our way. Being broke at the time and wanting to save on tolls, we decided to take the toll-free route, which would land us in Philly in about 10 hours. Originally, we were going to leave my parents' place early, but we got distracted and didn't leave until about 4 p.m., not a big deal. I've driven from Chicago to California, hiked parts of PCT and AT by myself. I was mostly bummed because the sun will be down by the time we'd get to all the pretty foliage in the Smokies. Now, the route we picked essentially had you dipping in and out between West Virginia and Pennsylvania. The parts of West Virginia we would be driving through were home to the Mothman appearances. I was pretty excited about it as those stories really fascinate me. Living in the city, I don't often get to see a clear night sky. Having road tripped a lot, I knew sometimes more scenic highways would have viewpoint pullovers. So when we were in West Virginia, I told my boyfriend to Google one and see if anything popped up. Sure enough, he found one. Being busy driving, I didn't bother to look at what his GPS showed and just followed his directions. I thought it was weird that the GPS told us to get off the highway, since normally these vistas are located right on the highway, kind of similar to a rest stop whatever. We take the exit and turn down this dimly lit road, and it leads us up a smaller mountain base. I find it really strange that there aren't any other cars around. I did see a rusty sign for a scenic lookout, and it pointed us down what looked like a service road. The road itself wasn't paved, and the only other road leading off of it was gated off. Both of us got a really weird feeling. I turned off the music because it was so creepy quiet and my radio now sounded like it was blasting from concert speakers. We could hear every leaf my car was crunching under its tires. After going maybe half a mile down this road, we got way too spook and said screw it, and I went to make a three-point turn to get us out of there. At this point, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. We drove maybe 50 feet before we saw a tree laying across the road we just drove on. Me turning around maybe took two minutes, and as I mentioned earlier, Things were so quiet that we both knew we would have heard a tree fall down behind us. Panic started to take over, and something told me that we can't just sit there and think long and hard about what to do. 
So my boyfriend said that he would see if he could lift one side of the tree and move it over. I had my brights on and was scanning the surrounding woods for any signs of movement. I felt eyes on us, but I couldn't see anything. The tree didn't appear to be old. It literally was as if someone knocked it over just in front of us. As soon as my boyfriend was out of the car, the first thing I did was tell him that I loved him and then locked the doors. I know. I'm an asshole. Thankfully, he was able to move the tree just enough for my car to squeeze through. And as soon as he was back in the car, we gunned it out of there. I'm a very spiritual person and believe that there are things in the woods that we don't always see. My boyfriend, on the other hand, is an atheist. That night, we both agreed that there was something sinister out in those woods. I live on the North Carolina side of the Great Smoky Mountains. I've lived here my entire life. All of us here know what's in these woods and mountains. Since the 30s or 40s, there have been feral wild men living in these mountains. They are fast. They will snatch livestock and snatch children. The FBI knows. It's why I do not get involved. I've heard other stories that there was some attempt to kill these feral wild men, but they still exist even today. And I'm not talking about some end of days extremist who took down the woods. I mean feral, completely wild men, their own language, living underground. We do not go into the woods at night. During the day, we make sure that we stay on the trails. Sometimes you will smell it, that putrid smell. At night, you'll hear them hollering, supposed inbreds. The locals around here know what happened to Dennis Martin. He was snatched by one of the feral wild men. It's not uncommon for people to go missing here. They're normally found. But you'd also be surprised on the number of children that simply just disappear. The FBI has covered it up for years. Where do you think the movie The Hills Have Eyes came from? It's a true story. I hear them from time to time. Disturbing sounds. They live all up and down the mountains here, in national parks and forests. The stories that we all heard growing up about the feral wild men were told to us due to the fact that so many people would go missing in the mountains. Of course, it was a way for our parents to scare us so that we wouldn't wander too far off from them or venture into the woods alone. And Dennis Martin was used as an example. My grandfather recalls the newspapers blowing the story up in 1969, I believe. The newspapers said one thing, while Tennessee and North Carolina locals said another. The locals said this then, and they say this now. There are feral, wild men living in these mountains. The government does know they are here, and they have made attempts to kill them off. But they have not been able to kill them all. Yet, the population now is thought to be minimal. One of these feral, wild men abducted Dennis Martin and ate him. This particular feral was spotted by a family in the woods who were in the same vicinity and stated that they saw the feral trying to hide from them behind a bush and was hanging a small child from his back like a backpack. The feral was described as being very hairy and tall, wearing a very worn, dirty shirt. The military came and stayed for a week in the mountains, killing a handful of the feral wild men, including the one who abducted Dennis. Dennis's bones were found by the military, but this was hidden from the family in the papers. One of the agents that worked on this and was ordered into the woods to kill the feral men ended up committing suicide some years later, not being able to cope with what he had seen in those mountains and after other assignments into similar incidents. My grandfather claimed to have seen two of them in his life. He told me that his first encounter was when he was a child, years before the Martin case, when he and his dad were on a trail in the woods on the Tennessee-North Carolina line 
when they both approached a dead-end area that bordered a very heavy tree line. Just inside the tree line, they saw a wild hillbilly leaning over a deer eating its insides. Wild hillbilly is what my grandfather said the locals used to call them long before any media named them anything else. The wild hillbilly was manlike, long hair that was very oily and dirty. Body hair was excessive. The man was bloody, having obviously just killed a deer. My grandfather said that his dad would later say that the hillbilly had a string of the deer guts in his deformed hand. My grandfather has always mentioned the smell being of pure garbage and vomit. They both stopped and walked backwards until they were out of the hillbilly's sight that said the hillbilly was obviously startled and screamed as if saying, stay back, this is my deer. The hillbilly was dragging the deer back farther into the tree line as my grandfather and his dad backed away. The second sighting is when my grandfather was hunting in 97 and him and his buddies saw a female. They said they were taken aback at the obvious sign of breasts, but this one looked more like Bigfoot. She was running and then suddenly jumped into some hole in the ground and disappeared. They did not go look into it. This is where the underground cave systems come into play. Inside the mountains and in caves is where all of our wild men, Bigfoot, creatures, etc. are at. And that's why they cannot be found. It's worldwide. Governments know of them. They do not get involved with these creatures unless there's a disappearance and they have to go in and kill as they did with Dennis Martin. Our governments admitting to creatures and UFOs would break down our religious systems. Dealing with the public about these creatures is something that has been avoided for years at all costs. Our caves and mountains cannot be controlled. The underground cave systems are massive, and what's in them is beyond basic human comprehension. To answer some of your other questions in my previous post, yes, the feral wild men are cannibals. They are inbreds. They will often snatch children to eat. Some are raised to reproduce. The geriatric population and the disabled are easy targets for food because it's not expected that they will fight back. They also have trap doors in the woods and doors in the mountains. They will often steal clothing, dig in trash, take pets and farm animals. Though I personally have never seen a feral wild man, I do see evidence of them. The smell also. I have tons of stories of other things that I've seen out in these mountains more demonic but so far I have yet to see the feral wild men I believe though not only because of the other things I've experienced out there but everything throughout my life I believe that a lot of the missing 411 cases will not be solved kids hunters tourists all missing in the blink of an eye Everyone always expects reasonable explanations for things because we are still so primitive. Our eyes are just not open to what's really out there. And I do not believe much of the population could mentally handle and cope with it if they did know the truth. I believe a feral wild man in the Panamanian jungle was also responsible for the Froon slash Kremers case. I saw something in 2003 that forever changed my life here in these woods. It affects me today. It wasn't a feral wild man, though, and this sub is not the place to discuss it. The point is, however, is that I'm a believer. Yet, I still live here in these woods. If you're a hiker, a hunter, or you grew up around the mountains, then you know the hold that the mountains and forests can have over you. Such beauty, yet such fright. I'm an experienced outdoorsman. I live in the mountains of Northwest Colorado. I've worked as a fishing guide and have spent many nights camping in the backcountry. The area where I live is surrounded by national forest. Having lived in several cities, I've always been more comfortable in the woods than anywhere. I've spent weeks fishing, hiking, and camping in remote areas of Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. I've encountered many black bears and a few grizzlies. Lions are elusive, so I've only seen one. Occasionally, I see fresh tracks, 
and have the feeling of being watched. Only been scared a few times in the woods. Only twice have I been terrified and have no good explanation for either event. One day I decided to go on an afternoon hike. I like a particular trail where I park about six miles from home. I parked and saw one other truck. I drank water and ate a sandwich before locking everything, including my phone and gun in the truck, intentionally traveling light so I could move fast. Only planned about 30 minutes in and 30 back. I'm wearing running shoes, shorts, a t-shirt, and a bright yellow baseball hat. Notable that hat is so obnoxiously bright that friends say it probably scares fish. I began running around 2 p.m. as the first few miles are relatively flat. The trail follows a creek that flows off a mountain through a canyon. There are several trails that branch off heading up into the mountains. I prefer a particular trail that follows the edge of the canyon, with creek flowing below. It's absolutely gorgeous. Before the trail gets steep, it takes you through a large aspen grove. There's a point about 30 minutes in where I plan to turn around. The trail becomes increasingly less worn and more difficult beyond this point. I've hiked the area many times, but something felt off this time. I didn't feel normal. I moved through the Aspen Grove before taking the steep trail up a mountain where I got a strange feeling. I stopped and noticed it was quiet. Something made me look up the mountain to the right, to a point several hundred yards above. I noticed a large granite rock formation. The area is off trail, so I'd never looked there before. I thought I saw movement. Probably a black bear, as they are common. I was curious, so I pressed on. Definitely not scared at this point, but I noticed the silence. I continued hiking and reached the point where I planned to turn around. I decided to hike further, hoping to see what caught my eye earlier. The trail becomes overgrown and harder to follow at this point. I had been further than this before, but never off trail. I noticed an aspen tree bent over the trail. It had been uprooted and broke off. The tree was green, so it was odd. It could have been a lightning strike, but that wasn't clear. I walked maybe another eighth mile, then took right off the trail, heading in the direction of the granite rocks. I wasn't concerned about getting lost since it was easy to orient myself with the canyon and the creek. I hiked off the trail towards the large meadow with many granite boulders. Reflecting on it, something was compelling me to go to the meadow. Climbing, scrambling uphill to get where I could set, I got to the meadow and noticed the rocks. Looked like a granite fortress. I sat down on a log enjoying the scenery, looking down into the canyon at the creek below. The meadow and rocks were behind me. I looked around and didn't see any animals, but suddenly I noticed that it was dead quiet. It had been a sunny warm day with birds and bugs everywhere. I wasn't scared yet, but I did notice the extreme silence. I could hear the creek before, so it wasn't as startling as now. I began taking off my running shoes. Notable as this isn't something that I would normally do. Since I have permanent nerve damage to my right ankle, I walk and run with a limp, and sometimes I wear a brace. I remember it feeling like my feet were burning. It wasn't particularly hot and definitely not over 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I was becoming unnerved by dead silence and started tying my shoes. This is where things turn weird. I clearly heard my father call me by my first name. The voice was loud and came from behind. I talked to my father earlier in the day. He was at his home in Georgia. There was no way that he was calling from the rocks behind me. Immediately. I became overcome with fear. It was difficult to describe how overwhelming it was. I became sweating and shaking. It was like knowing a lion is stalking without seeing it, but even more terrifying than that. Definitely not messing around at this point. I stood up and turned to look behind me, and I saw nothing but the large granite rocks. I started running down the hill towards the canyon and trail below absolutely terrified and feeling something was chasing me. I literally stumbled and fell and rolled down the mountain. I stood up and couldn't recognize anything. It all looked completely different. No canyon, creek, or trail. It was cloudy, and I wasn't in the same place anymore. 
At this point, I started hauling ass in what I thought was the right direction. Eventually, I found the trail and recognized my location. I sprinted through the Aspen Grove back to my truck. I didn't look at my watch. I'm not sure how long I was gone. I was so terrified I could hardly drive home. I wasn't even sure what happened, but I've never been so afraid in my entire life. I know something was stalking and chasing me. Yes, I have gone back to that area. I'm too afraid to go to the same meadow with granite boulders. I considered going back well armed, but my instincts tell me it's a bad place. I'll never hike again without my 357 Magnum, and I haven't since. Something scared the hell out of me, and I feel I was close to being a victim. I trust that my flight instinct kicked in, for good reason. Hello everyone, as a Muslim, I am very interested in this subreddit and overall paranormal stuff. I hope you didn't already lose interest due to my religion, and I hope that you don't have any prejudices, so please hear me out. Maybe it's interesting to you. So anyway, this whole topic is very interesting to me because we Muslims believe in entities living in a parallel universe. We call these things the Jinn. Now, you may think of Aladdin and his genie when you hear this name. And although it is true that the evil ones can grant you wishes in exchange for your soul, it's not the only thing they do. Islam teaches that the jinn have been created before men. They can be good or bad. The good ones will never bother you, but the bad ones can harm or even kill you. Emphasis on can. There's a tradition of an event that happened in the time of the beginning of Islam, meaning around 1400 years ago. During this time, a man disappeared out of nowhere. His wife waited for him to come back, but several years passed. She thought he died, so she even married another man. And after a few years, he came back and told her a few evil jinn kidnapped him. He could only escape because a group of good jinn helped him. Stories like these are well known amongst Muslims. Jinn can't be seen in their true shape. Never. However, they can take the shape of animals like dogs, birds, snakes, and so on or even creepy and unknown humanoid creatures. And of course, also the shape of a normal human or shadow-like entities. Especially shadow-like entities. So, whenever we Muslims read about folklores of skinwalkers, wendigos, ghosts, fairies, Huldu folk, or anything else, we know that those are jinn. And the descriptions of all those creatures fit very well within those jinn. Jinn live in places such as mountains, caves, lakes, ruins, abandoned houses, deserts, and of course, the woods. Basically, places with less humans. And they do have many different types amongst them. Whether you're religious or not, there's a good reason why Satanists often do their rituals in the woods at night. It's basically a place where you're surrounded by them. In my country, to the people, this is as normal as the sunrise. Now, some people have mentioned in their stories that their relatives called them out out of nowhere in the woods. Islam says that every human being has a jinn with them since birth. This one is called a kareen. It is basically a kind of jinn who tries to make you commit sins, whispering bad thoughts and ideas into your mind, like the bad demon above the left shoulder in cartoons. This one knows all about you. It's been with you since birth. So... If an entity imitates the voice of your mother, father, or anyone else and calls you by your name, it's not an omniscient being that knows it all. No. What happened was that was your Kareen, the jinn that's been with you since birth, told the other jinn your name. If any of you has ever visited a clairvoyant and was overwhelmed because they knew your name or about the death of a family member, it was simply because of their Kareen asked yours about those personal things. Everything else, of course, is just a bunch of lies, so don't ever pay those people. I guess that's all I can think of right now, so thank you very much if you made it this far. Feel free to ask if you have any questions. I just 
wanted to give my thoughts and beliefs on some of the things that I've read in this subreddit. I used to live in the southwest corner of Missouri, in an old railroad town that had quite a few missing people here and there, mostly due to a high tweaker population. I lived in what we called a holler, at the bottom of the tops of two enormous hills. A creek ran through the holler, but was mostly dry throughout the year. Despite it being dry, living in what was basically a ravine makes the land and hills damp and misty. The woods surrounding our trailer were perpetually green year-round and thick. You could walk in one direction for ten minutes and get lost. Generally, we kids used the creek bed for a path, as there were flat rocks along it that were easier to navigate than the viney, lush forest floor. One day, in the middle of the summer, I decided to go for a walk in the woods. As usual, our red-nosed pit bull, Fatty, came along. The sun would be setting soon, but I was home alone a lot at that time so there was no one around to tell me not to go. I figured I had enough time before sunset to walk to a certain point and back. It was 7.30, and the sun set around 9 at that point in the summer. The minute I started trekking it down the creek bed, my pit bull started whining. He didn't leave my side once, but was reluctant, stopping here and there to smell the air, looking behind us. I figured maybe there was an animal in the area, so I didn't worry too much. There was a point in the creek bed where I had to duck under the two fallen trees. It made sort of a bridge in the middle of the creek, and acted as a turnaround point for most of my walks. My dog was still whining, and I began to wonder if there was a cougar or even a bear in the area, but for some reason, I wanted to keep walking. I ducked under the trees, shushed Fatty, and stopped to listen to the woods surrounding us. I heard nothing. Literally nothing. No wind, no snapping twigs, not even any birds. Even on calm days, with little wind, those woods were usually teeming with sounds of life. Nothing was ever still, but now it was. It made my stomach feel like it was dropping down into a pit. Then, I began to feel really weird. I can't describe it really as a gut feeling, but suddenly my body felt very queasy and oversensitive. And worse, I had the distinct feeling that I was being watched. I felt similar feelings when being watched by a bear. It's weird, but something tells you to get the fuck out of Dodge when there's just a huge animal nearby. Humans are animals. We have instincts. Every time I had experienced an animal that could potentially hurt me in the woods, I had immediately turned around and gone home. My dog had always alerted me by barking or growling, but not this time. Fatty was scared and trembling. I'd seen this dog get hit by a truck before and get up like nothing happened, and he was terrified. All signs pointed to leaving, right? But no, another weird thing happened. Call it being an edgy teenager or anything else, but I felt this strange pull into the woods. There was no sound, but I felt like something was calling me, luring me deeper into the woods. It was the creepiest thing I had ever felt in my life, but I was so curious. I wanted to know what the hell wanted me to wander further ahead. I walked forward, aware that my dog had firmly planted himself at the fallen trees. He was shaking all over and yelped at me as I walked away, but he didn't come with me. He also didn't leave which I believe potentially saved my butt that day. I left Fatty behind, and eventually got to the part of the creek that I had never been to. It was a clearing with a ring of trees around it, with the creek stretching far ahead and going around an unforeseen corner. The sun hadn't moved, and it was still silent. I stood in place for a minute and considered turning around. The clearing was creepy and felt devoid of everything. I can't explain it well enough. It felt as if I walked around that corner, which was just about a hundred feet away, that something terrible would happen. I felt like something was just waiting for me to walk into it, unsuspecting. I brushed it off as paranoia, 
I had plenty of sunlight left, and I could explore alone for once. Besides, if something was drawing me farther in, I might find something amazing. I took a couple more steps, and suddenly, I heard my dog yelping frantically behind me. Startled, I turned around quickly, my dog looking like a little white speck far back into the trees. He was pacing back and forth at his spot, barking like it would kill him if he didn't take off running. He kept lunging forward, but wouldn't move any distance towards me. I suddenly realized that something was very wrong. I turned around again, and to look back at the clearing. It was pitch black outside. I shit you not. Seconds ago, the sun wasn't even close to going down below the horizon. And now the stars were out. No sun, no light. I stared hard at the trees around the corner, seeing nothing but elongated shadows. I heard a twig snap. All of a sudden, my ears started to ring and panic flooded my entire body. I whipped around and shot back towards the fallen trees, sprinting towards my dog. He was snarling and barking like mad. And when I ducked under the trees, both of us sprinted back to the house. The entire time, I felt like I had death on my heels and Fatty never once ran ahead of me, staying right at my side the entire way back. When I made it home, I checked the clock. During a walk that usually takes 10 minutes, I had been gone for three hours. I'd left my house at 7.30 and arrived home at 10.30. My parents were due home in an hour. The next day, I walked only part way back to where I could see the clearing. The very farthest I could have walked was about two miles, and it took three hours. To this day, I have never felt so proud upon in the woods. These woods weren't part of a national park, but if you walk 10 miles or so, you could reach Mark Twain National Park. People go missing there often, seeing as the woods can be impossible to navigate after dark, and has large hollows in the middle of the woods that people can roll into and get stuck. I don't know what wanted me in the woods that day. I didn't see what it was, and it said nothing to me. But I ignored every natural instinct I had to run until it was almost too late. My dog being there may have been the reason that I didn't wander deeper into the woods of Missouri and succumb to someone or something in the dark. I've never told anyone in my waking life about this. What do you guys think? Have you heard of any 411 cases involving Missouri woods and hollers? Do any of you have similar experiences if you're from the area? Joshua Maddox went missing and was found seven years later in an abandoned house in the chimney. He was positioned in a way that defies logic. His clothes were neatly folded inside the house. Very bizarre circumstances. Joshua Vernon Maddox disappeared May 8, 2008, Woodland Park, Colorado. Body found August 7, 2015. On May 8, 2008, Joshua, Josh Maddox, 18, left his house to take a walk. He was a nature lover, so this was nothing unusual. He was never seen alive again. Seven years later, in August of 2015, less than a mile away from Josh's home, property developer Chuck Murphy was demolishing an old wood cabin to make way for 32 new family homes. The cabin hadn't been used in years, and the inside was damp and rotten. Work to demolish the chimney inside the cabin started, and to the surprise of the demolition team, Crammed inside the brickwork was a mummified body, which later was confirmed as Joshua. His body was naked, apart from a thin shirt, and his clothes were neatly stacked inside the cabin. What happened to Josh? Did he climb in? Was he forced in? The story of Josh Maddox continues to stir debate amongst armchair detectives. Who was Josh Maddox? Joshua Maddox was born on March 9, 1990, and lived in Woodland Park, a town of seven to 9,000 people, in the Pike National Forest in Teller County, Colorado. His parents were divorced, and Josh lived with his father, Mike, and two sisters, Kate and Ruth. He was long-haired, six feet tall, blonde, and weighed 150 pounds. He had a carefree attitude to life. 
loved music, spending much of his free time writing music or playing the guitar. At school, he was a bright student and was seemingly well-liked. Two years before Josh's disappearance, on June 1st, 2006, a week before his high school graduation, his older brother, Zachary, 18 years old, unalived himself after suffering from severe depression. Mike Maddox said, I buried his older brother two years before, and it was so difficult on Josh. When his brother died, it pushed him over the edge. It was a big shock for the whole family, and a big shock for Josh. He thought highly of his older brother. Despite this, Josh has been doing well and happy in the period around 2008. The disappearance of Josh Maddox. On May 8, 2008, Josh left his house, telling his sister Kate that he was going out for a walk. He often went out hiking alone. So, when his sister saw him at the house before he left, she thought little of it. But when he failed to return later that evening, the family became worried. On May 13th, five days after he disappeared, his father, Mike, called the police to report Josh missing. Mike said, I got up one morning and Josh was there. Then he just never came home. The next day, he still didn't come home. I called his friends. Nobody had seen him. Nobody knows where he is. The search for Josh. The authorities, friends, and family scoured the neighborhood and nearby Parkland area where Josh may have decided to go walking. After months of searching, nothing had been uncovered and hopes faded. Josh's sister Kate hoped that he had simply left town to go and play music or start a different life. She wrote of her brother's disappearance. Since Josh was 18, it was, has been reasonable to assume that he may have decided to leave town and start a new life. As one of his two older sisters, I have always chosen to believe that this was the case. I've expected Josh to return home to my father's house at any time with a wife and small children so that they can meet their grandparents and two aunts. Josh has always been known for his musical and literary talent, so maybe he would find him playing music with a band on tour or catch him writing successful novels under a pen name so that he could keep his preferred lifestyle of solitude in the woods. The police had no reason to suspect any foul play, and so listed him as a missing person. The body in the chimney. Chuck Murphy's cabin where Josh Maddox's corpse was discovered in August of 2015. In 2015, Chuck Murphy, 80 years old, a builder from Colorado Springs, was demolishing his old wood cabin. On Meadowlark Lane, which was in a large area of land surrounded by tall pines. Chuck had originally purchased the cabin in the 1950s. It had formerly been the homestead of Thunderhead Ranch on Rampart Range Road on Woodland Park's north side. It was an infamous dining, drinking, and gambling complex owned by Big Burt Bergstrom in the 1930s to 1950s. He had come to America from Sweden in 1912 and ran the Thunderhead Inn as a dining and drinking establishment after the end of Prohibition. He also used the ranch as an illegal gambling and prostitution den, and he was arrested by the FBI. In the subsequent trial, the jury found him not guilty. The cabin hadn't been used for a decade and had fallen into a state of disrepair. Chuck had made the decision to demolish the cabin to make way for property development, and in August of 2015, demolition work started. Chuck's brother had lived in the cabin until 2005, but since moving out, it had become a storage facility, and it had been rarely visited. Animals had been a problem, and there was a noticeable stench when Chuck came home to the cabin on August 7th. As the workers dismantled the chimney, one of the two in the cabin, using an excavator, and reached the interior, Chuck made the horrific discovery of the body of a young man, cramped into a fetal position with his legs above his head. He called the police who arrived with the county coroner, who later, with the help of dental records, positively identified the body to be that of the missing man, Joshua Maddox. The Maddox family was shocked by the news of the discovery of Josh's body. His sister Kate said, The situation doesn't make any sense at all. We were really expecting him to be anywhere else in the world, and he was actually very close. The only thing we can figure is he was being an 18-year-old kid checking out a cabin. It had already been abandoned for a long time, and a horrible accident happened. The cabin was only two blocks from the Maddox family home. Yet, the searches for Josh had overlooked the building. There had not been any sign of life 
and there was no reason to check a chimney there. Chuck Murphy, the cabin owner himself, had rarely visited. However, on the occasions that he had to check in, he himself had not noticed anything unusual about the property. Since the cabin itself stood centrally in a large plot of land, surrounded by tall pines, around 50 feet from the road, police suggested that with no adjacent homes, if Josh had cried for help, no one would have been able to hear him regardless. Further investigation into Josh's death. The Teller County Coroner, Al Bourne, did an autopsy and found no evidence of any drugs in Josh's remains. He said the hard tissue showed no signs of trauma. There were no broken bones, no knife marks, there were no bullet holes. There is so far no answers to a number of things. It's very confusing. It was not instant death. How he died is only a matter of speculation, but we know he did not starve to death because that takes many weeks. So when you go down the chain and you have dehydration, which can take just a few days, and the other thing would be hypothermia, which could take a day or two, we have no evidence to say which one came first. On September 28, 2015, Bourne made a ruling of accidental death. He speculated that Josh had climbed into the chimney and become stuck in the brickwork. Bourne stated that Josh's position in the chimney appeared to have been a voluntary act in order to gain access. He concluded the most likely cause of death was hypothermia, as the temperature around the time of his disappearance, between May 8th and 10th, 2008, had dropped to the high 20s. Discrepancies in the coroner's report. Many disagreed with the coroner's report. Chuck questioned the coroner's conclusion of accidental death as the chimney had been built 20 years before and during its construction. It had been fitted with a thick wire mesh hung from steel hooks, used to keep animals and debris from becoming lodged inside the chimney or from entering the cabin itself. Murphy said, It was a heavy wire grate, a wire mesh. I installed it across the chimney about one row of bricks from the top. We didn't want any trouble with raccoons and things getting in the chimney. Bourne was of the opinion that the grate could have been rusted or corroded and further stated, Nobody saw the metal mesh. We didn't see it in any of our photos. It may have disappeared. Murphy responded that during the demolition, all metalwork had been collected and taken for scrap, which would explain why the mesh was not clearly identified by the coroner, as it wasn't anywhere near the chimney. They were just gathering up all the steel, angle iron, and things as part of the demolition, Murphy said. They had no idea the mesh had any significance. Conceding to Murphy, Bourne reopened the case three days after his initial conclusion. It was not only the rebar that caused doubt. For example... A large wooden breakfast bar that had been torn from a wall in the kitchen and dragged over to block the chimney from inside the cabin. If the breakfast bar had been torn from the wall, then who had done it and why? Josh's body had also been found in a fetal position, with his legs above his head and disjointed from his torso. In order to have gotten into such a position, it would have had to have entered the chimney head first. This was a fairly unusual position and Bourne had earlier commented that he thought it would have taken two people to position him in such a fashion. What was even stranger was that when Josh's body had been found, he was wearing only a thin thermal shirt, and his clothes had actually been found inside the cabin, folded up next to the fireplace. Bourne said of this evidence, This one really taxed our brains. We found his clothing just outside the firebox. He only had on a thermal t-shirt. We don't know why he took his clothes off took his shoes and socks off, and then went outside, climbed on the roof and went down the chimney. It was not linear thinking. The revised autopsy report said that the cause of death was an accidental death, murder, or undetermined causes. Bourne said, We've come up with the most plausible explanation, and it will remain an accident. He did come down the chimney. That's our conclusion. Murphy said, there's no way that guy crawled inside the chimney with that steel webbing. He didn't come down the chimney, and he remained convinced that Josh's death had been no accident, adding, he was only wearing his thermal shirt, no pants, no shoes or socks. Murphy said it was ridiculous to think that the teen stripped down to just his shirt, climbed up on the roof and then the chimney and slid down, knowing that he'd be trapped. Theories on the Josh Maddox death and Andy Newman link 
The police received several anonymous tip-offs, suggesting leads and naming suspects that had bragged of killing Josh. One such suspect is now incarcerated in a Texas jail and had previous time in Seattle and Portland prisons with a long history of violent crime. One tip-off had informed police that this man had been seen with Josh. When speaking of the man, Alborn said, They can't give me times and specifics, and we can't generate stuff that goes back seven years. Bourne also doubted that the man would have been able to have put Josh in the chimney alone. In 2015, a post on Reddit gave a name to the suspect just mentioned. The post said, I went to high school with this skinny, dorky hippie named Andy, who played guitar in a band. I was never good friends with him or anything, but a year or so after I graduated, one of my good friends, Josh, started hanging out with him, and then he went missing. Turns out that, in addition to becoming a lot scarier looking, Andy had indeed headed down to New Mexico, where he found himself shooting the shit with the caretaker of a disabled guy, and got invited over to their apartment. The caretaker gets in the shower, and when he comes back out, the disabled guy is stabbed to death and Andy's gone. When Andy got arrested, he also claimed to have killed a woman in Taos and stuffed her body in a barrel. The cops had indeed found a woman stuffed in a barrel in Taos, but already had someone in custody for it and decided to stick with that guy instead. Years later, I found out that the caretaker had died in a bar fight, and without him, the cops didn't have much in the way of evidence somehow, so that case against Andy was dropped too. Several of us went to the cops saying, Yo, Josh who went missing was last seen with Andy who's a murderer. Maybe you should check that out. Despite a fair amount of pestering, nothing ever really came of it. And by nothing, I mean that the police honestly didn't even return our calls. And once accidentally canceled the bulletin on Josh because he's alive and well and living in the next town over. He wasn't. He was actually in the chimney of an abandoned cabin, like two blocks from his parents' house. The coroner said the body had been there for about seven years, and ruled the death accidental, concluding that Josh had probably climbed down the chimney in an attempt to break into the house and gotten stuck, which, given the age of the corpse, doesn't seem overly ridiculous. Except for the fact that, in addition to Josh having been last seen with Andy immediately before his stabbing spree, People called in to report having heard rumors that Andy was bragging about having put Josh in a hole. Somebody had ripped a heavy bar off the wall in the kitchen and propped it against the fireplace. Or the fact that Josh's stuff was already inside the cabin, meaning A, he'd already broken in and would have had to have locked himself out to go for the chimney, or B, he might have noticed that either the flu or the big bar have prevented him from getting through the fireplace. Or the fact that when he was found, Josh's knees were above his head, which sounds to me like he would have had to have went in head first. Disclaimer, I'm definitely not an expert in this. Or maybe the fact that Josh was barefoot and naked from the waist down. This is just my opinion, but I don't care who you are. You don't try to climb head first into a chimney via a rusted hole through a metal grate with your junk hanging out. As far as I can tell, nobody even bothered to call Andy to ask if he knew anything. By the way, from what I hear, Andy's still out and about doing his thing when he's not in the mental hospital. All I'm saying is, I wish they had done some police stuff, open an investigation, try to track down some leads, interview some of the folks who have been calling in tips for the last seven years. Maybe check for some semen or something. I don't know. Don't just say accidental, dust off your hands and call it a day. Andy's full name was Andrew Richard Newman. He was arrested on suspicion of a fatal stabbing in New Mexico and is currently serving time. Conclusions on the case Chuck Murphy, the owner of the cabin, said it's a real conundrum, a tragic, terrible story. All I know is he did not go down that chimney. He got in the fireplace and went up. But why? I think it'll remain a mystery. One of those sad stories. The case is bizarre and perplexing. The rebar in the chimney would have prevented the entry of anyone, unless it really was removed prior to the demolition, or rusted away as suggested by the coroner. Why would Josh remove his clothes and leave them by the fireplace, as well as his boots? Why was the breakfast bar, 
dragged to cover the entrance of the fireplace inside the cabin. These are things that we might not never know. But I don't think that he climbed in himself. So I just recently found out about Missing 411, and reading a few of the experiences here kind of made me feel better about mine. Like, I'm not the only one who experienced something bizarre like this. I guess I can also count myself lucky. This all occurred when I was six years old, in Managua, Nicaragua. My grandmother in Nicaragua lives in a finca, which is basically like a huge farm. She grows coffee and other plants, has cattle, etc. If you don't have a jeep or some sort of off-road vehicle, it's really tough, if not impossible, to make it up to her place, as it's surrounded by thick rainforest. Most people use horses or motorcycles on the trail up to her finca. Typically, we had a jeep that we would be able to drive all the way up there, but it was getting repaired, and we had to take a cab there to visit. It was around midday, and the cab dropped us off where the paved road ended. It was about a mile and a half walk to my grandma's finca from there that we'd walked plenty of times in the past. There were homes along the trail, but they were very few and far between. I was with my parents and my little sister, who was two years younger than me. Nothing eventful really happened. It was a bright summer Nicaraguan day. Pretty hot, but the forest shade helped. I remember playing with one of my favorite toys. It was the Green Ranger that you could push a button on its head and he would switch from his normal head to his helmet. Anyway, I was playing with it as we walked the trail. We then arrived to a small stream. My parents are easily able to jump over it and keep walking. They look behind them, and I can see them watch me try to make the jump smiling at me. I do make the jump, but I drop my toy in the process, and it gets picked up by the stream, so I immediately start following after it. I can hear my parents yelling for me, but I'm too focused on catching my toy. This next bit, I still remember vividly to this day. All of a sudden, I'm in like a field with very tall grass. It's surrounded by trees. The one thing I notice is that it's eerily quiet. I have to reiterate that this is in a Central American forest. It's never quiet. There are always hundreds of birds, monkeys, and other animals everywhere. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. Then I hear something weird, like chirping, and I see tiny orbs in the tall grass. I'm not afraid of them, more like intrigued. They're amongst the grass like the way you would see an animal's eyes, but they're weightless and floating. I would start walking towards them, but then I got scared and run away towards the forest. I remember getting sleepy as I fell against a tree trunk. The next bit, I won't go into much to tell on, as it's just things my parents have told me, but also I don't want to be doxxed. In Nicaragua, my dad's side of the family is pretty important, with big ties to the government. You know, think senators, judges, military, etc. So my dad reached out to his brother, who was the chief of police, and his brother-in-law, who was a general. They had a massive search out for me, using police and military assets. About a thousand people total combing the jungle. Dogs, helicopters, the works. They actually found a few different bodies in the process that had had stab or gunshot wounds, most likely gang members. I was missing for two days, and the next thing I remember is waking up in the back of a bus. The bus driver waking me up and asking if I was okay. I immediately start crying and asking for my mom. My mom had me memorize our home number. So they call and I get picked up. Police investigate thinking it might have been a kidnapping attempt. They think that once the perpetrators found out who they kidnapped, they put me in a bus. I tell them my story, and a few of them think Duendes took me. Duendes is something a lot of people in Nicaragua believe in, especially people out in the fields. It's less believed in the major cities. They're basically described like a small people who kidnap children, kill livestock or ruin crops. 
basically just mischievous little beings. A telltale sign of them being present is seeing small floating lights in trees or amongst tall grass. People say it's their lanterns that they carry. Some of my older cousins kid around that it was La Llorona who took me, but then got tired of me and dumped me on a bus. Anyway, that's my story. Sorry for its length. I am fascinated with Alaska. Since authorities began keeping records in 1988, 60,700 people have been reported missing in Alaska. That's five people reported missing every year per 1,000 residents. Each year, an average of 2,250 people disappear in Alaska, twice the national average. Some of these people are found alive and well, and the remains of others are found, but many disappear without a trace. Now listen before people jump down my throat. I'm fully aware how vast, extreme, and potentially dangerous the Alaskan wilderness, weather, and animals are. What I'm looking for are strange cases involving missing persons in Alaska that may be due to something other than the extremity of the conditions there. Below are some interesting ones. 1. Richard Lyman Griffiths from Spokane, Washington invented a wilderness survival cocoon and in the summer of 2006, he headed into the wilderness of southeast Alaska to test his invention. He wasn't reported missing for a year. When authorities began searching for him, they learned a bus had dropped off Griffiths along the Alaskan Highway. He stopped at a lodge near the White River, where he left some of his gear and told people he planned to hike upriver to McCarthy, a small town in Wrangell St. Elias National Park. He was never seen again. Since Griffiths had told his friends he might spend the winter in Alaska, no one worried about him for several months. But finally, a friend called the Canadian Mounties and reported him missing. His friend had no idea where he was planning to go to test his wilderness cocoon. No trace has ever been found of Griffiths, nor his bright orange cocoon. 2. It might be easy to understand how an individual could vanish when he heads off into the wilderness by himself but 66-year-old Michael Lemaitre from Anchorage, Alaska, disappeared from a mountain in the middle of a race with a hundred runners and thousands of spectators nearby. The 4th of July race up Rugged Mountain Marathon near Stewart, Alaska, is one of the most popular sporting events in the state. It's not uncommon for runners to suffer cuts and scrapes from the rocky terrain or even sprained ankles from the steep slopes. But until the 2012 race, no runner had ever vanished mid-race. Seward, Alaska, located 125 miles south of Anchorage, is a popular getaway for Anchorage residents, and the 4th of July Mount Marathon race draws a crowd of spectators. During the Mount Marathon race, runners climb from sea level to race point, 3,022 feet above the city, and then they run back downhill and race past the cheering crowds along 4th Avenue in Seward. July 4, 2012 was rainy and chilly in Seward, but the weather did not dampen the spirits of racers and spectators. People lined the race route up and down the mountain. The majority of the Mount Marathon runners finished the race in about two hours. Michael Lemaitre was in good shape, but he was slower than most of the runners in the 2012 race. Race officials saw him still heading towards race point, the turnaround point, three hours after the race began. They estimated he was approximately 200 feet below race point when they talked to him. They said he was moving slowly but seemed fine, and they told him to go to race point, turn around, and then follow them down the mountain. Michael Lemaitre was never seen again. At 6.30 that evening, Lemaitre's wife began to get worried, but race officials told her to wait until 8 p.m., and if he still wasn't down the mountain by then, they would begin looking for him. They began searching at 9 p.m., and then notified the Alaskan State Troopers. The Alaskan Air National Guard joined the search with its Pave Hawk helicopter, equipped with heat-sensing technology, but no warm bodies were detected on the mountain. For three days, people combed the mountain searching for Lemaitre, but not even a scrape of his clothing was found. The search officially ended after three days, but friends and relatives continued to search for another month with no luck. 
Some runners speculate LeMaitre might not have seen the rock that marks Race Point and continued up the trail towards the summit of Mount Marathon. Race Point is often referred to as the top of Mount Marathon, but it's actually 1,800 feet below the summit. If LeMaitre didn't realize where he was supposed to turn around and start back down the mountain, he might have continued up the trail and fallen off a cliff. Race Point Rock was in the clouds that rainy day, and since most of the racers had already completed the race, no spectators or race officials would have been at the turnaround point when LeMaitre reached it. With this scenario in mind, searchers have combed gullies and areas where LeMaitre could have fallen to his death, but so far, no trace has been found. Does anyone have any other mysteries surrounding Alaska? I grew up in Vietnam. My family is very affluent, so we had 10 acres of land all to ourselves. No one else really lived there except a house here and there. Our closest neighbors were three miles away. Our territory wasn't gated except for a smallish brick wall, and we had a ton of street dogs that we adopted that kind of just roamed around. I was under strict instructions to never go anywhere past these certain trees that were marked. And once the sunset started, I couldn't go past the West Territory. Now, I want to say that in Vietnam, people are very superstitious. It's not so much whether you believe in ghosts, spirits, the paranormal, or not, but it's whether they can harm you. Whenever I walked past these trees, the dogs would furiously bark, and a few would drag me back by my shirt, or even go bark at my family's workers and kind of tell on me. I always assumed that it was because I was very young so they didn't want me to wander off and get lost. When I was 13, I became more and more interested. My family went to a funeral while the workers still worked, and my grandmother watched me. My grandmother was a very old woman, and I was a very sneaky child. I obviously snuck off, and while I was wandering through the woods, I explored, saw pythons, lizards, water monitors, and monkeys. Here's the weird thing. I felt like the whole time these animals were, like, kind of leading me to something, if that makes sense. I distinctly remember the first animal that I saw was a huge dragonfly. It led me past the marked trees on the east side of my territory, and then I saw a frog that had a really weird texture to it. Very rough, kind of like a lizard. I feel like I was in a trance-like state. An animal transformed into another animal, and I began to come to the realization that these weren't different animals, but the same one transforming. I didn't actually see it transform, but it could be a monitor lizard, and then it would go past a rock and the next animal would be a huge python. I should also mention that all of my dogs, we had about 20 of them at the time, were fiercely protective of me and trailed me like shadows. All the workers always said that wherever I walked, a horde of dogs would follow, and when I slept around night, they all slept directly outside my window. However, less and less dogs followed me as I got deeper into the woods. By the time I saw the lizard monitor, I'm pretty sure only a handful were still with me. Most stayed back after the first few trees. I realized it was getting really dark, but the sky looked weird for some reason. I stopped following the animal, which was a monkey at this point, and just turned back. Getting back was a lot more difficult than getting there. When I was following the creature, I feel like the woods were just kind of opening up a trail for me. Like, I didn't trip on any shrubs or vines or anything really blocked my way. The way going back, I was convinced the woods had completely changed. I wasn't really scared, just a little cold since I believed I didn't wander off that far. Eventually I heard some dogs barking and followed, and I could see my house. Everyone was frantic when I came back. They had about a hundred people searching for me, family and our workers and a few more like extended family of workers that owed favors to my family. Apparently, I had been missing for three days, and the husband of one of my aunt's workers went in after me, and he's been missing since then. I got really scared and told my family what happened, and they went white in the face. We drove to a very popular Buddhist temple, and we got blessed, and the monks told my family what they believe happened while I stood outside eavesdropping with my older cousin. Our family has a problem with people going missing, 
my grandmother's brother, said that he felt like he was being guided with a hand on his back and he was stuck between two rocks. His old black dog found him, which is a common belief in Vietnam that all black dogs are very powerful and can scare spirits away, which explains why my uncle always picked all black dogs. My grandma's first son was playing in a creek while she traveled a little more downstream to do laundry, and she said it seemed like someone pushed him in and held his head down, and as she tried to run to him, something in the water wrapped around her foot. A villager nearby ran down to save him. The monks gave me a Buddha necklace that they blessed, and I still wear that necklace today. The man that went missing who was looking for me was never found, although my mom told me they did. I believe my aunt paid the wife a large sum of money and bought them a house far away and still sends money regularly. A few days after this, the workers started chopping down trees and a fence was built around the east side of our territory and we started a karaoke bar that now resides there. What do I believe happened? I have many theories, but I think the spirits are upset that my grandmother came into their land and built over it. Before my family cut down trees and built our house there, no one lived there. I think they were upset we were disturbing their peace and quiet. I still don't like going hiking to this day. When I do, it's never a very far hike, and I don't let my dog off leash, because I am terrified. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently stumbling on this sub, I finally felt that this was a place that I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon, and I felt comfortable in the woods and have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs who need the privacy since they are intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It was not an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off a USFS road that had flat ground full of trees and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from me and my wife's tent. We made the male German shepherd sleep with her in the tent. The whole first night, neither my wife nor I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy, not like typical forest critters scampering around the night. I was well armed, because I was paranoid from reading recently, before departing, about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and a rifle. The dogs are great at detection. And that is why I felt my daughter could sleep alone, because the dog is completely fearless, and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided was a deer or maybe an elk. Day 2, morning. We go for a walk down the road, and maybe 300 feet away see the circle area in the photo. I see an abandoned road where a rusted gate post the gate was missing, was covered in vegetation. Something of blue collar caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think it's another family camping, just like us, and he is going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name, but I have covered just enough distance to see that there is nobody there and something is off about the site. I yell, hello, is anyone there? I'm sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the site conditions were. As I get closer, I know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed and torn from what appears to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, 
puzzled why anyone would leave all their camping gear behind, including an expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry, and animals got the rest as the only logical explanation. Still, a propane tank and cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snow packed with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, me and my daughter are playing bocce ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I do not have direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight towards her. Guts is the name of my dog, by the way. Normally, he would always be with me, unless he has called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me, and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stopped. My other dog, Leah, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I have had her now for seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was hair, full raised, and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is always up front bossing everything in her path and pauses to look and see where we are and then continues. I asked my wife what happened and she said, I was, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hairs rise. I know someone was watching me and then I saw guts running towards me and I just got up to move towards you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, broken branches, nothing to point out what or where someone might have went. We decide that we're spending one night more, since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we will all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so anything hitting the rope would give a jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing I have done, with a rope that was so old and brown that I didn't see it at first. It was broken, and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, around 8 to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt someone has stayed here before, and put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am maybe 10 to 15 years ago, based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure the girls felt we were safe. And at the same time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came around, I made them set in the truck, and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we are armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that now knows that we have two wolves and are armed, and we are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night, we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today, and I was watching the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary, and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and smashed cooler and cooktop. We have been camping since, and have enjoyed the beauty of the Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. And we all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. A few years ago, I had an experience that I don't know how to describe other than as missing 411 I was in the mountains of western North Carolina, doing field work for a geology class I was taking in college, mostly getting a first-hand look at geological formations, rocks, and minerals, but also taking some samples to process in the lab back at school. A lot of our work was centered around the Blue Ridge Parkway, and as we were primarily making observations, we did a lot of hiking in national and state parks in the area. 
One of the days, we went hiking on the trail that literally started on the side of the highway with the parking lot across the road from the trailhead. So you had to play a real life game of Frogger to get to the hiking because most of the cars were going around 60 and the road curved off in both directions. If I'm remembering right, it was about a 40 to 50 minute hike from the highway to the summit of that particular hill slash mountain. On the way back, with about 20 to 25 minutes left of walking, so about halfway, I had to stop to retie my boot so I wouldn't trip. It's important to note that we were a group of about 30, and I was at the end of the group with three other guys. The trail was only wide enough for two people to walk side by side for about 90% of the hike, so I wasn't necessarily in the middle of a crowd. The point where I stopped to tie my boot was at the bottom of a switchback that ran about 20 feet, vertically, up the slope getting narrower as you approach the top of the section of the trail. I was facing the direction the group was heading and had direct visibility for about 200 feet, while the trail behind me was just off to the right of my vision, about five feet up the slope. I had stopped right at the corner of the last turn coming down and stepped to the inside of the turn to keep the trail clear for people I could see coming up the trail, the direction of my group, and down the trail, the direction we were headed. When I knelt down, I told the guys I was with that I'd catch up after tying my boot. The people coming up the slope were about 200 feet ahead of me, walking in my direction but still coming around the turn at the end of the straightaway, up the hill and off to my side but technically behind me on the trail, about 10 linear feet away was another two or three people coming down the trail as well, about two turns up the switchback. I did my business and then stood up. I'm going to make a little note here and emphasize it. I did not change the direction that I was facing at any point until I stood up. When I stood up, I noticed a couple of things. The very obvious trail was gone and replaced with grass, fallen branches, and brush. And more eerily, there were no people ahead of me nor beside me. There was no switchback going uphill. It was all vaguely level though and even. And there was no sound. No birds. No wind. No squirrels no forest noises. This was very odd, but I, at first, chalked it up to possibly turning around when I stood up without realizing it. And then it happened, the sensation, that I was being watched, that something was coming towards me. I started panicking and looking around more fervently to get my bearings, but nothing looked familiar. The feeling of being watched grew into a feeling that whatever was watching me wished to cause me harm and was radiating extreme feelings of hate, violence, and general evil towards me. And the sensation that it was approaching grew, as if it had gone from creeping along, to slowly walking, to full-on running at me. Not knowing what else to do, I took off at the fastest sprint my terrified body could muster in the direction, all while racking my brain to figure out what had happened. Eventually, I busted out of the tree line and onto the trail light in the middle of my group of classmates. Of particular note was that they are now within 30 feet of the trailhead, and you could clearly see the highway and the parking lot on the opposite side of it. Like I said, this was another 20 to 25 minutes down the trail from where I stopped to tie my shoes, but the whole experience seemed to take no more than 5 minutes in total. Everyone asked what happened, and I merely stated that I lost the trail after tripping and thought I was lost. I didn't know how else to explain or describe what happened, and I still don't know what it was. To this day, I won't go into the woods by myself, not even past the tree line on my parents' land, despite being in view of the house and the neighbors' houses, which aren't too far away from my parents. I also want to take a moment to clear up a couple of things that I might not have done that great job of portraying. 1. The missing time. My experience lasted what felt like, to me, 5 minutes. There was still a 20-30 to 30 minute hike from the point that I stopped to tie my bootlaces. Yes. I ran after the wave of negativity washed over me, but not accounting for missing time would have meant I got to the trailhead at least 20 minutes before my group. They got there before I did. I didn't freak out over losing sight of my group. The back end still should have been clearly in sight when I finished tying my laces and stood up, and the trail was very clearly defined, and there were others not too much farther up the trail behind me, coming down. There was no trail, no people, no animals, and no natural sounds when I stood back up. Trust me, I want to be skeptical about what happened too. It fits better with my mind, but what I experienced and the memories of it deny any rational explanation.
this next story is a comment under the previous post that I just read. I was camping in Allegheny National Forest. I was walking along the trail when suddenly a dog ran up on me. I started petting it and asking where the hell he had come from. Then, about 20 seconds later, the owners came up and were laughing about how he had made a new friend. Now to give you an idea, the trail zigzagged and was thick. There were thick bushes everywhere around us, and I couldn't see their bright jackets through it, so it scared me when I saw them. I could hear them walking, but couldn't see them. My feet were still facing the direction I was walking, and as they passed by me, with the dog, I was looking over my shoulder to say goodbye. I never moved the direction of my feet. Then, once I turned forward, the trail had turned perpendicular on me, and was completely clear of bushes. It was wide open, very straight to stretch from nothing but grass and small rocks. I was confused by the fact that it seemed like I was in another part of the forest. I pulled out my map and compass, and the compass was telling me that I wasn't facing the direction of the trail, and by the looks of the terrain, it wasn't even on the map. It was like I was in a whole other world for a second. I was very confused at this point, and just started walking forward off the straight path. Once I got off, I walked through a small area of trees and I was met by a group of four people that were talking and cooking. Now, I definitely should have heard them talking and laughing like I had the other two that I had previously just met, which is why I was concerned. Now the whole thing lasted about 30 to 45 seconds, but a whole hour had passed and the campers told me that I could set up camp with them and hang out with them for the night. I don't know what happened or anything, but reading what you said, made me realize that I'm not the only one who has experienced this. Stumbling on this site? My god. It's like an enormous weight has been lifted off my chest. So many years of feeling as if I was crazy, if I had imagined the entire thing, and now, so much relief. To this day, I don't know what it was exactly that I saw that night camping in the land between the lakes in western Kentucky, and I don't even know if it applies to anything here on this site. I just know I've found a place where I can perhaps share my experience of that weekend. I'm sorry to be using a throwaway, but several friends know my main account. And I've known that sidelong glance. I can recognize it a mile away. When you open up to certain people about something that you know happened, but you can't explain it. It might be cowardice, but I can't bear to have one of them giving to me that look of, are you okay? Instead of, I can't understand what you experienced, but I'm here for you. It's the main reason I'm no longer able to talk about it. Anyway, this happened a bit over two decades ago. As I said, at Land Before the Lakes. My dad hunted, mainly bow hunted there regularly, and while I was never a hunter, I loved camping in the woods. We never used any formal campsite back then. We'd just drive along the trace, turn off onto one of the numerous side roads, and then near a creek bed. Usually dry or just a small trickle from a spring unless it had rained, we had our usual campsite. We pulled the car off the road, set up the tent, tarp it all over angled, and dad would do his thing while I would do mine. Typically, if I went with him, that meant he'd trek off to his stand and would be gone most of the day. While he was off, I'd hike a bit. LBL, while big, is not a place that one could easily get lost in if you have basic survival skills. Or I would read or just relax. For me, it was a place to go get away from it all. Get lost in nature or maybe even in a good sci-fi book. This time, this early morning, we had left after a quick breakfast. A chill and dampness in the air. The smell of fall coming in. Any of the outdoor types will understand that smell of wet leaves during fall. I mention this only as it will be relevant later. Anyway, my dad had left and I whittled some on the hickory staff that I had made before heading out for an early morning hike. I set off in the usual direction, opposite from the road we were nearby mostly following near the creek, but not along it directly. I had a compass if I needed it, but I never did. I had grown up in the Jackson Purchase and it was home. I loved nature and never felt uncomfortable out in the woods. 
Before long, however, cresting a small hill, I heard rustling among the trees. While the leaves were starting to fall, most were still up, fall at its prettiest. I slowed only for a moment. I'm used to those sounds, squirrels typically, bounding from tree to tree. But then, it got louder, heavy. Unlike any sound that I've ever heard trees make, outside of them breaking under ice or age, it was hard to focus on the sound, like it was coming from all around me, but not. In every direction I turned, I saw trees in the distance shaking, as if something large just jumped from them, but I saw nothing else. Then, I was probably 15, and despite years of being in the woods for many of them, I felt something that I had never really had before. Fear. Not terror, that would come later, but actual fear. Almost as soon as it had started, the rattling, violent shaking of the trees focused, not in a ring around me, to one before me. Opposite the direction of the camp, and then nothing, no sound at all. Not quiet, but an absence almost. I had been exposed to that stillness before, and while the violent rustling of multiple trees felt alien, this was familiar. I thought about going back, until I saw in the distance, near the last tree that shook, a slim, dark figure. I couldn't make it out. Somehow, I felt it was a her, though. And she was up near the ridge, ahead, and I felt compelled to head to her, and I did. I know it sounds crazy, and typing it down now, I still do. But then, I rationalized it as, I wonder if she heard all that, too. Perhaps she saw what it was. But as I walked towards her, she slid away, staying just barely visible among the trees. The sky was just starting to really lighten up, that transition from dawn to morning. She moved what appeared to be normally, but the distance she seemed to cover was unnatural. I'm tall at over six feet, but my strides covered half the distance hers did, and she seemed to be normal-sized, as normal as a dark, featureless shape could be. I mean, I could see a head, arms legs and what appeared to be a dark but normal clothing, but I couldn't track her. Focusing on her was hard, and outside of knowing it was a her, I could tell nothing else as she disappeared and then reappeared among the trees, a couple of hundred yards ahead of me, walking slowly, yet somehow covering distances at running speeds. Again, I don't know why I followed her, but I did, down a hill, through some fog, until I neared a clearing. I lost sight of her as I neared it, and things got darker, like when the sun crawls behind a dense cloud, except there were none that I could see, though the sun was still too low for me to catch. The stillness, familiarness, was there, but that didn't bother me. It was the smell that did. Every step closer to the clearing, I noticed it more and more, and though I couldn't find her, and I desperately wanted to find her. This sent alarm bells ringing through me. I've been both before and since, in the woods hundreds of times. One thing I have never experienced since that weekend was the complete absence of smell. Nature has a smell, not a stink, but one that is distinct. One of decay and life, of plants and trees and creeks and stagnant ponds. And while depending on where you were at, you may or may not smell the same smells. There always are smells, though. Except for there. There was nothing. That lack slowed me. Stopped me. And only then did I see her, across the clearing looking at me. I wish I could say she was giant and hairy, or alien gray. But no. She looked normal. Indistinct and unmemorable. Except for her smile. When she smiled, I ran. I had been scared before with the trees out in the middle of LBL. But that, the lack of any smell, the lack of any sound, and that smile, it terrified me and I ran. I was crying and terrified and I had no idea why I should be. I stopped about halfway back and everything was brighter. And despite my terror, I still wanted to turn back. I did look back. And though she was just a shape again, she was there, closer, freezing as I spotted her, a smile again, but one I felt and did not see, and I ran, all the way back to the tent, 
I got in it and cried, shaking in terror. I did not and could not understand. I stayed in the tent until my dad got back, and I didn't tell him about it. By then, the terror had faded, and while I couldn't explain it, I knew something horrible would have happened had I gone into the dark clearing that had no smells or sound. By night, I had almost convinced myself that I half imagined it all, when, stepping away from the tent to pee, that stillness came over me again and I froze. I looked among the trees, but saw nothing until I saw two reddish lights moving in the distance. I knew the terrain, and knew it had to be uphill from me, but the eyes were descending. I felt her, in the sense that I had felt it when it was a woman earlier, coming my way, and I felt a smile that was not a smile, even though I could not see it. I ran back to the tent and my dad was there, staring into the fire, and when I yelled at him, he just sat there not responding. I shook him, feeling those eyes that, her, behind, and then, even the fire had no smell to it. It was just nothing. I shook my dad harder, screaming at him, and then suddenly, the fire was crackling. I could smell the smoke, and the stillness was gone. My dad asked me what the hell I was yelling about, and when I told him, he gave me that look that I mentioned, that sideways glance that said, are you okay? After much pressuring, we left, and while I barely held it together, as soon as I got in my room at our house, I cried, not because I had embarrassed myself, but because of relief. I knew for a fact, had I not reached my dad, had not shook him, that I would have wandered off into the dark just like I would have wandered off in the morning following her. She wanted me in that clearing, which felt wrong, smelled of nothing, and I wonder, and have wondered so many nights what would have happened. I probably and hopefully will never find an answer. I just pray that I never see or feel her ever again. I've been in the woods since then, both near there and other woods, and never have I felt that way again, but still, Every time the woods get quiet, I get scared. I don't know if this applies to anything here, but I hope some of you might understand. And thank you for letting me post here and get this off my chest. It's followed me for over two decades, and I don't know how you can feel a smile. But that was the most terrifying experience in my life, and I had to get it out. Thank you. I had a very strange experience 12 years ago in Starved Rock State Park, Illinois. It was so bizarre that, at the time, I never discussed it. I began reading the Missing 411 stories a few weeks ago and realized what I encountered fits into the Missing 411 profile. Additionally, since many of the Missing 411 stories border on the unexplainable and bizarre, I feel what I encountered was not unique, that it was part of an actual phenomena. Now here's my story. I was visiting my girlfriend in Chicago. On a sunny and calm winter day, we decided to go for a hike at Starved Rock State Park, Illinois. I'm an avid hiker, and being on leave from Iraq, I wanted to take in some cool fresh air. We hiked the park for several hours. In late afternoon, we started heading back to the car. About a half mile away from the parking lot, we came into an area where tree branches were broken and pulled towards or over the trail. Most of the branches were broken high up. I'd say eight feet, and more off the ground. I lived in Washington before going to Iraq, and knew something of Sasquatch areas. So I told the girlfriend that it looked like a Squatch area, due to the branches broken off high up and pulled over the trail. That's about the time things started to get strange. Soon after mentioning this, I felt like someone was staring at me. It's like if you go into a room with a lot of people and someone is focused on you. You get an uneasy feeling and can tell that you're being watched. It was like this, but stronger. I started to look around to see who was watching me. It was winter and the forest was visible hundreds of feet in all directions. There was a group of walkers several hundred feet behind us, and no one in front of us, but I saw no one staring at me. As we pressed through the Squatch area, I began to have the feeling someone was behind me, following us. I looked around and listened 
but saw and heard nothing. There was just the people, 400 feet or so back on the trail, and they were talking amongst themselves. They weren't looking our way. The sense of someone being behind me was persistent, so I kept looking behind me, I'd say at least twice a minute, but there was just the group way back. The feeling of being watched is one thing, but feeling like someone is close behind you is something else. It's more disturbing. I told my girlfriend to go further in front of me and just let her go about 20 feet in front because I had a strong sensation of a nearby presence just behind us. So I turned around not more than 30 seconds since the last time that I looked back, and there was this woman there. She was walking, but coming up on me fast. There was something way off about her speed. She was walking when I spotted her, but her speed was much faster than her gait. It was almost she was on like a moving sidewalk like in an airport. She was coming up fast and was, I'd say, no more than 15 or 20 feet behind me when I saw her. I was rather alarmed and glared at her. She stopped when our eyes met. I gave her a look like, what are you doing coming up on me like that? We stood there staring at each other. Neither of us moved. She had her head cocked back to her left and looked at me from the corner of her eyes in a slightly alarmed you caught me type of look. She was completely normal looking, like a local Chicago lady, late fifties wearing a bright red winter coat, gloves, slacks, etc. In hindsight, there are a few other things besides her speed which stood out. The first thing is there was no sound, no footsteps, no rustling in the woods, nothing to tell me to turn around other than the strong sense of something being behind me which I'd had for a bit. At the speed she was moving, she would have had to have been running hard, but I heard no footsteps. She was not breathing hard and her mouth was closed. Her gait was a walking gait. She was not running. However, she was moving towards me at running speed. I mean fast. When she stopped, I'd say she was less than 20 feet from me. At the speed she was moving, in one or two seconds she would have been on me. The next thing that stands out is her features. She had no distinguishing features, none in her hair, skin, or clothing, no shadowing or skin hues, dimples, etc. As a former army criminal investigator, I know to look for distinctive markings on people in clothing. There were none. I'd estimate her height at about 5'10". Her clothes were of uniform coloring and indistinct. It was like she just stepped out of a department store. Her bright red coat was pristine with a uniform hue to it. There wasn't even shading, which there should have been given the clear sky and low sun. After staring at her for, I'd say, five to ten seconds, I felt like I got my point across, so I turned around and continued walking. The girlfriend had not noticed anything and continued walking herself. I took about three steps and realized there was no way she could have come up from that group in the thirty or seconds so since I looked back. There was also nowhere to come from on either side. Visibility at that point was hundreds of feet all around. I said to myself, no way, and spun back around. She was gone. Simply vanished. I checked the group behind us, and no one had a red coat on or was looking at us. There was no one else around, and there had been no sounds other than my footfalls. The woman just vanished. From that point, it took us about ten minutes to reach the car. For the remainder of the walk, I did not feel like I was being stared at or followed. I have never been back to Starved Rock State Park, and have no intention of ever going back. This whole thing was bizarre. How was I supposed to tell anyone about that? So I never have. My mental state was fine. I have a high IQ and a 20-year career in a STEM field following Army service. At the time, I was working on a Department of Defense IT contract in Iraq. I was well rested and relaxing, being on vacation with the girlfriend. There were no drugs or alcohol involved. These are strictly prohibited in my line of work, and were grounds for immediate termination under MNFI's GO-1, which I was subject to at the time. I've carried this experience around for 12 plus years, being unable to talk about it because it's so exceptional and unexplainable. It's a relief to read similar stories of unusual encounters and disappearances. After reading many missing 411 accounts and the profile of disappearances, I believe I narrowly averted being snatched by whatever that thing was. 
I do not think it was the woman that I saw. I think it was something different, which I could not see. I came across this sub and these stories through one of those popular creepy experience threads in Ask Reddit. I don't want to give too much away about myself, but back in 2006 I was training with a spec ops unit, and it's not hard to figure out if you look at my username. At this time, I was completely mentally sound, extremely physically fit, and probably more adept to the wilderness than most of the experienced hikers detailed in these cases, not to mention armed to the teeth. Just a week before my final exam, we were running a drill of which I cannot tell you the specifics. My duty was to stand at the perimeter on the back side of the assault in case the opposition tried to circle behind us. It was like the third time we had run this drill, and I knew I was in a hurry up and wait mode today. Bored out of my mind, I started scanning the tree lines, and I noticed what I can only call a path. It wasn't a path in tr the traditional sense, but... The trees on either side of it formed a straight line, and one of the things they taught us when learning to surveil from an elevated range was nature doesn't build in straight lines. To this day, I cannot explain what came over me. I laid my gun down and just started walking. Walking turned to a jog. Jog turned to a sprint. I can remember thinking that I really wanted to know where this thing led, and how many people before me had run down a straight path like this in nature. During PT, I survived long distance runs on tracks by looking down at my feet. So out of habit, I looked down at my feet and snapped out of it. I immediately thought, you know, what the fuck am I doing? And I turned around and hightailed it back to my post. The path was less straight than I remembered and much further back to my post. I had no loss of time. I saw no scary women beckoning me into the woods and I felt no sense of great dread. I returned to my post and the drill concluded. All of our drills were monitored with cameras at each of our positions, so I had to answer for my actions. I thought I was done for. They questioned me and I told them straight up that I did not know what came over me. Just a massive urge to follow that path and keep going. My superior simply told me to resist that urge should I ever feel it again and sent me on my way. I graduated a week later and never thought anything of it. Now here's the real kicker. There was a troubled teen school nearby. We used to run into them all the time, and they'd come out and watch our final physical test. I heard rumors for people that it shut down in 2010 because a kid went missing. They covered it up and filed bankruptcy after telling the kid's family that he unalived himself, but they couldn't produce a body. His last known location was my exact post during that day that I temporarily lost my senses. I am very new to this type of subject, and was talking to some friends who told me about this subreddit, and told me that I should come over here and share my experience. I live in Colorado, and the RMNP is pretty close to me. I'm pretty outdoorsy, and so I tend to walk and hike all over my beautiful state. Usually I do day trips or 24 hour stay outdoors. Quick campfires and small meals, me and my dog mostly. I was hiking, just last fall in Grand Lake a trail called Tonahatu Creek. It was about 1.45 p.m. My dog wasn't with me at the time because they're not allowed on trails, so it was just me and myself. I was walking southeast when suddenly the area went completely silent. No wind, no animals, not even the smell of the outdoors. It's like I walked into a bubble where nothing existed or where everything was muted. I took out my phone to check the time and it was just after 3.45, though it seemed there was a weird fog around me. I kept walking, the silence still there, the odd feeling too. I walked for another good 10 to 15 minutes when I turned my attention to the sky. 
the clouds seemed to be moving rapidly, as if a storm was coming. The forecast did not call for any rain or snow that day. It was odd to see how low-hanging clouds were moving so rapidly, almost as if I was viewing a time-lapse video. I heard a rumble that came from the ground. It was emanating from what I assumed was deep below. A large crack that sounded like thunder ended the rumble. The clouds stopped moving quickly, but had a very light pink slash purple tinge to them. At this point, I was speed walking, trying to get out. My fight or flight response seemed to kick in, and my adrenaline was pumping. The odd feeling in my gut turned to complete terror. Yet there was nothing around me that would evoke such a feeling. No wildlife, no bears, no mountain lions. Another crack and a flash of light later, everything seemed to be completely normal. The wind returned. The birds that filled the air with sound was now replaced with the sound of crickets. The only strange thing was the time. It was 6.30 p.m. I was already on my way to the truck before this all happened, but it should not have taken me that long to get back to the trailhead. It only seemed like 15 minutes had passed, and yet more than four hours had elapsed. I have no recollection of what happened in that time, besides what I have written here today. I've only told a few people this. Some said I was abducted. Others said I entered a time slip. Either way, I wanted to share. Tennessee college student Matthew Pendergrast inexplicably leaves town two weeks before graduating. His car is later found at a remote swamp in Arkansas. His clothes are found neatly folded in the woods nearby. His journal, found in the car, mentions silver elves and becoming one with nature again. Matthew Pendergrast was a student at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee in 2000. He was within two weeks of graduation. His family resided in Atlanta, Georgia where his father worked as a plastic surgeon. Pendergrast was last seen leaving his residence in Memphis between 7.30 and 8 a.m. on December 1st, 2000. He was driving his Navy 1998 Toyota 4Runner SUV with the Georgia license plate number 934PT at the time. Pendergrast was scheduled to attend a Spanish class four blocks from his home that morning. He never arrived and has not been seen again. He apparently called a friend at Atlanta that morning. It was the last time anyone has heard from him. Pendergrass's SUV was discovered abandoned in Lone Oak County, Arkansas, at approximately 2 p.m. that day. The vehicle was located on a private dirt road off of South Kerr Road near Interstate 40, parked near the edge of Bayou Meta, a swamp often used by area hunters. It was unlocked and his keys were in the ignition. About 100 yards away were his clothes, blue jeans, a t-shirt, shoes and socks, his wallet containing his driver's license and other identification, as well as credit cards and $46 in cash, was still in the jeans pocket. There was no signs of Pendergrass near his vehicle. Extensive searches of the surrounding area produced no clues as to his whereabouts. The police found Pendergrass's journal inside his abandoned vehicle. In it, he wrote about silver elves and seeking immortality and about walking into water and becoming one with nature again. It's unclear what he meant in these writings and whether his journal has any bearing on the case. His family doesn't believe he would have taken his own life, and there's no evidence that he was involved with drugs or any other illegal activity. Authorities have classified Pendergrass's disappearance as suspicious. At least one investigator believes the scene with his clothes was staged. It's uncharacteristic of him to leave without warning, his case remains unsolved. I just finished the Missing 411 The Hunted documentary. And it got me thinking about some strange things that I have witnessed and experienced in the mountains. I grew up on a remote ranch, 60 miles from the nearest town. It is located in one of the larger cluster areas in the Rockies, 
near the Walru Range and Poudre Canyon. A case of a missing boy was highlighted in the first documentary. It's also not too far from Rocky Mountain National Park. As we were so remote, I was homeschooled, meaning I spent most days of the year there and extensive time in the forest and hiking the mountains. Unexplainable and incredible things absolutely do happen in the wilderness. My life experience has made me very attuned to it, and I have a keen sense of when something isn't quite right. It is very common for people in that region that are ranchers and outdoorsmen and women. Most understand and have many stories, if you can find them willing to share. The most common occurrence that I've witnessed and other have are the lights. As a child, this was so common that I assumed it was normal and didn't realize that it wasn't until I got older. There are two types that I have commonly seen. The first are purplish floating orb types. These tend to be smaller, basketball-sized, and float along ridge lines, creeks, and sometimes can be seen dancing through a tree on mountainside. I've witnessed this quite a few times on the family ranch, and as an adult, I've seen them in Grand Teton National Park. Nowhere else. I'll note this phenomenon seems harmless, even beautiful. The second type are the orange fireball lights. These seem to be different and can be quite alarming. I have witnessed these twice in the area of Wyoming that is well known for amazing granite boulders. One night, my boyfriend and I were watching the Lenoid meteor shower. We had parked by the side of a dirt forest service road with a mountainside behind us and a nice vista in front. We started seeing what looked like orange headlights in front of us. Assumed it was a car driving up, even though it made no sound. The headlights turned off, so we assumed a car had stopped and didn't feel any alarm. Shortly after, we started seeing more orange lights kind of pop on and off throughout the area, long distances from each other. Then we noticed the same thing on the mountainside behind us. We were puzzled. Were they flashlights? Was someone lost? They intensified in the number of lights, the frequency of them going on and off, and they were getting closer and closer surrounding us from all sides. My boyfriend started panicking and yelled at me to get in the truck, and he tore off out of there terrified. It was actually really scary, but I was more in awe of his reaction because he was the biggest, most stubborn skeptic I have ever met. My second experience. I was home alone at the house. I was living near the same area, just outside of town, so pretty dark. I stepped outside for a cigarette and, as usual, was stargazing and looking around. I noticed a somewhat large orange light just above the tree line at what looked like maybe half a mile away. I always try to logically figure something out, so I thought maybe a new light pole went up. As I was looking at it and thinking this, it started moving, rather swiftly and silently towards me. When it was getting closer, it almost looked plasma-like. It's very hard to describe. Just as it got to the properly line, it flashed white and morphed into a white diamond, then morphed again into what looked like three orange balls connected, with the middle one slightly larger. I was frozen. Then utter panic and fear took over me. My inner voice was telling me, this thing's going to fry you. I'm typically pretty stoic in the face of weird stuff. Trust me, I've seen a lot. But this thing was menacing. I ran inside and hid in my closet, like a chicken. This one experience is the main reason that I no longer camp alone. I don't know if these were related to the missing cases or not. It's my opinion after reading the book about the Western US cases and watching the documentaries that some type of supernatural phenomenon could very well have something to do with them. I've spent a lot of time camping in the crazy mountains on Montana, which did resort in leaving the campsite in the middle of the night. I went to the bathroom and my headlights reflected back two amber eyes facing forward. I thought it was a grizzly, and I do not want to mess with the grizz. However, nothing out of the ordinary occurred. I'll only note that the place does indeed have a strange and uneasy feeling about it. I also used to live in Estes Park, Colorado. Worked at the famous haunted Stantley Hotel, no less. And there was one of the missing cases where a boy disappeared from the Boy Scout camp there. Another strange area indeed. I won't try to tell all my stories, but I'll share one last one. One evening, back on the family ranch, I was about seven, with my parents, my three brothers, and me were sitting down for dinner. Lightning and thunderstorms can move in very quickly at high altitude. My parents had an old 70s stereo receiver in the dining room, 
It wasn't unusual for the house to get staticky when thunderstorms rolled in, so perhaps that explained what happened. As we're eating, the stereo suddenly flipped on, the switch physically flipped, and on the radio, an almost robotic sounding voice counted down from 10, and when it got to 1, lightning hit the weather vane on the roof. A huge flash and crash. My parents' explanation was that the static called the radio to turn on, and it just so happened that on the radio station there was a countdown. I mean, it's not impossible, I suppose. That is probably the single most bizarre thing that has ever happened to me. All my other stories are probably better suited for a different sub. I'd love to hear if anyone else has witnessed lights or had similar experiences. Thank you so much for listening to this true Missing 411 story compilation. I appreciate it. I also want to thank all of our channel members. Thank you so much to Emily Tippins, Adam Wagner, Miss Janet 64, Derek Slank, Helga Andreas, Michael Smith, Burberry's Fables, Samantha Scotton, Glinda's voiceover projects, Maxine Gentile, Sad Fish, Inner Scare Wifey Simp, Pilot, Vanita Tillman, Sarah Rodriguez, Shane Wilson, Sarah Wood, Jacob Ryumi, Claire, Sherry Uchel, Zane Loggins, Martha APS, Hail Mary, Gingerbread, Carrie Morris, Crystal, Brown Doe, Jado, Chili MC, Snowing Wine Drops, Tina Mead, Taylor Ruist, Casey Brown, Caroline Hawksworth, Eric Donter, The Grim Reaper's Nightmare, Simply Complicated, Tangela Young, Miss Cannabis, Anon Q, Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Skin Crawler, Ruby Wilson, Jennifer Moyer, Classic Sonic the Hedgehog, Cappy Karma, and Paul Reese. I appreciate each and every one of you, and thank you guys so much for watching to the end of this video. Please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you so much. Please enjoy the extra rain at the end of this video. Good night, everybody.